Good morning, everyone. My name is Deirdre Roach, and I serve as a program director in the treatment, health services, and recovery branch at the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism. On behalf of the organizing committee, the Interagency Workgroup on Drinking and Drug Use in Women and Girls, welcome to the 2022 National Conference on Alcohol and Other Substance Use in Women and Girls. Next slide, please. Since every great day begins on a note of gratitude, we'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and all of our organizational partners, the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, the NIH Office of AIDS Research, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the National Institute on Mental Health, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, and Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders United for making this exciting two-day conference possible. Most of all, we thank you, the members of our audience, for joining us and hope that you will find much to enrich your day-to-day -day efforts to become better advocates and service providers for women at, and girls at risk and living with mental health challenges and harmful substance use. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping details to optimize your conference experience. Next slide, please. All sessions are being recorded. By joining these sessions, you automatically consent to such recordings. Recordings will be made available on the NIAAA website after the conference. Please use the Q&A box in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions, comments, or feedback you may have during the presentations. For those needing closed captioning, you may enable this feature by clicking the Show Captions button, lowercase cc, in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. You may access the conference materials, such as the program book and resources, on the conference page under Conference Materials. Next slide, please. At the end of each day and during the plenary, panel, and breakout sessions, we'll share a survey link with you via the Q&A and chat boxes. We would appreciate your feedback on individual sessions that you've attended, as well as the overall conference. Next slide, please. And now to open today's program, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Patricia Powell. Dr. Powell was appointed Deputy Director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, or NIAAA, in 2017, having served as Acting Deputy Director since 2015. She chairs the Interagency Coordinating Committee on Fetal Alcohol Spectrum Disorders, which fosters improved communication, cooperation, and collaboration among disciplines and federal agencies that address issues related to prenatal alcohol exposure. Previously, Dr. Powell served as NIAAA Associate Director for Scientific Initiatives, as well as Chief of NIAAA's Science Policy Branch, and was a scientific editor for the Surgeon General's Call to Action to Prevent and Reduce Underage Drinking. She is a stalwart champion of women's health research at NIAAA and across NIH. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Patricia Powell. Good morning, everyone. As Deputy Director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, I am delighted to welcome you to day one of the 2022 National Conference on Alcohol and Other Substance Use in Women and Girls, Advances in Prevention, Treatment, and Recovery. And as Dr. Roach mentioned, we'd very much like to thank our agency partners who are shown on this slide, whose invaluable contributions have made this one-of-a-kind event possible. A lot of work goes into this, and we're so appreciative. I'd also like to thank the conference organizing committee, who are members of the Interagency Workgroup on Drinking and Drug Use in Women and Girls, for their hard work, dedication, and assistance in coordinating this conference. No easy task. Most of all, we thank you, the members of our audience, for joining us today. We know there are many places you could be, and we trust that your time with us will be rewarded with much news you can use to enrich your day-to-day -day efforts to make life better for women, girls, and their families. 
Over the next two days, some of the nations, indeed some of the world's leading experts on mental health disorders and harmful substance use in women and girls, will share key findings from research on the causes, consequences, prevention, and treatment of harmful alcohol, opioid, and other substance use in women and girls, and on best approaches to sustaining recovery. These topics could not be more timely, as rates of harmful alcohol, opioid, and other substance use among women and girls have continued to increase since our last national conference in 2017 reaching crisis proportions with alarming implications for the overall health of the nation's families and communities. For example, recent studies have found, whoop, here we go, I think, sorry, my uh, finger is a little trigger happy this morning. Recent studies have found significant increases in the number of adolescents with past year major depressive episodes, driven largely by an increase in major depression among girls, increasing rates of attempted and completed suicides among adolescent girls and young women are also seen. And between 1999 and 2017, there's been about a 260% increase in the rate of deaths from drug overdose among women aged 30 to 64 years of age. And there's rapidly escalating rates of alcohol-related emergency department visits with the rates among women outpacing the rate among men in every age group. And new data gathered during the pandemic suggests that while drinking has increased both among women and men, drinking rates and mental health symptoms have increased more among women than men. In addition, there's a growing evidence of complex connections between mental health and substance use disorders and physical disease including mounting evidence of significant connection between major depressive disorder and cardiopulmonary disease. We know, for example, that depression is an important risk factor for cardiovascular disease, that treating depression early lowers the risk for heart attacks and stroke, and that women are two times greater risk for co-occurring depression and cardiometabolic disorders than men. Women with a longer history or more severe major depressive disorder show a threefold greater risk for cardiovascular related clinical events and death than men. And the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation Study, known as WISE, also found that between 2013 and 2018, there was a 25% increase in heart disease related deaths among US women ages 18 to 44 years of age. So in terms of our two days together, we have a very exciting program lined up for you today, including welcoming remarks from Dr. Sarah Temkin, who is the Associate Director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health. We have plenary presentations by two NIH Institute Directors, uh, my own director, Dr. George Koo, Director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, and Dr. Nora Volkoff, Director of the National Institute on Drug Ab Abuse. Today, we'll also feature three panels. The first will provide an overview of harmful alcohol and other substance use in women. And the second, an overview of harmful alcohol and other substance use in adolescent girls. Our third panel presentation will offer perspectives on model programs for mothers with alcohol use disorder and other substance use disorders and children with prenatal substance exposure. Other standalone presentations today include one from Kathy Mitchell of FASD United discussing sustainable models that prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders known as FASD by supporting women living with substance use disorders. And another presentation by CJ Lutke, one of the International Adult Leadership Collaborative FASD change makers sharing her own experiences and those of her peers as a young person living with FASD and committed to advocating for the FASD community. At the end of today's program, we plan 10 breakout sessions focused on certain high priority populations, including black, indigenous, and other women and girls of color, senior women, sexual and gender minority women, women at risk and living with HIV AIDS, 
women and girls involved with a criminal justice system, and women and girls living with co-occurring mental health and substance use disorders. Although it makes for a long day, we really encourage you to attend one or more of these breakout sessions, as this will be our opportunity to listen and learn from you, the people who are working on the front lines, delivering critical services to women and girls, and thus in the best position to help guide our future research efforts. These discussions will also set the stage for three day two panels focused on these same high priority populations. Day two will also feature opening remarks. Oops, and I didn't move my slide, I'm sorry. Day two will also feature opening remarks by Dr. Monica Webb Hooper, Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and an overview of HIV and substance use research by Dr. Maureen Goodnow, Director of the NIH Office of AIDS Research. There will also be a plenary presentation by Dr. Joshua Gordon, Director of the National Institute of Mental Health, and a keynote address by Dr. Valerie Earnshaw, who will present an overview of research findings and intervention approaches to address stigma, which historically has been one of the most challenging barriers to women and girls' access to mental health and substance use treatment. Day two will also feature three panels, the first, Panel 4, providing an overview of prevention and treatment for African-American women and girls, women and girls living in Indigenous communities, and Latinas. The second, Panel 5, will offer an overview of prevention and treatment for senior women, sexual and gender minority women, women at risk and living with HIV AIDS, and women involved with the criminal justice system. Our sixth and final panel will focus on women living with co-occurring substance use disorders and mental health conditions. And other standalone panels on day two will include Dr. Laura Quaco of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism presenting on NIAAA's resources to help find treatment. And that includes the NIAAA Treatment Navigator and the recently released Healthcare Professionals Core Resource on Alcohol followed by Dr. Kathleen Brady, wrapping up with a summary of the practice implications of current research on mental health and substance use disorders in women and girls. So in closing, we freely admit we had a little bit of an ulterior motive for organizing this conference. And that is we aim to use it as a stepping stone towards strengthening our ties with our all participating stakeholder communities and promoting more community engaged research to protect and improve the health of women and girls. You'll hear more about this at the end of tomorrow's program, but for now, we thank you again for joining us to continue what we hope will be a very empowering conversation for many years to come. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Sarah Temkin. Dr. Temkin is the Associate Director for Clinical Research at the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health she is a gynecologic oncologist who earned her medical doctorate from Georgetown University, completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology with the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, and completed a fellowship in gynecologic oncology at the SUNY Downstate Medical Center. She's been active in clinical research throughout her career with recognized expertise in clinical trials, cancer prevention and equity in both cancer care and the clinician workforce. Within ORWH, which coordinates research on women's health across the NIH's institutes, centers, and offices, Dr. Temkin and her team provide clinical expertise, overseeing the office's interprofessional development program and the U3 administrative supplement program. So please join me now in a warm welcome for Dr. Sarah Temkin. Thank you so much for the introduction and for inviting me to speak today. I am i going to share my slides. There we go. Um, and thank you again for having me uh, here today to talk at this very important conference um, regarding alcohol and other substance use in women and girls. 
The Office of Research on Women's Health was established in the 1990s in response to concerns about the inclusion of appropriate numbers of women into clinical research um, and within a broader social context uh, and recognition that the health of women had been understudied. The 1993 NIH Revitalization Act um, required inclusion of women and minorities into NIH funded clinical research and statutorily established the office. Today, the Office of Research on Women's Health collaboratively works with all 27 of the NIH's institutes and centers to align research priorities with those of the NIH vision on women's health research. Our mission is to enhance and expand women's health research to support the inclusion of women and underrepresented groups into clinical research and to promote the career advancement of women in biomedical uh, careers. The ORWH mission is aligned with the NIH vision for, uh, for women's health, which is a world in which the influence of sex and gender are integrated into the health research enterprise. Every woman receives evidence-based disease prevention and treatment that is tailored to her own needs, circumstances, and goals, and that women in science careers reach their full potential. I'm gonna to begin today by talking a little bit about chronic conditions in women. Um, last year, uh, the US Congress again asked the NIH to evaluate its women's health research activities. Um, and in response to uh, requests from both the House and Senate in their FY21 appropriations bills, ORWH did review NIH's women's health portfolios as well as the portfolios on three specific topics that were specified. Um, these were maternal morbidity and mortality, stagnant, stagnant cervical cancer survival rates, and rising rates of chronic conditions in women. As a first step towards um, reviewing the um, NIH portfolio on chronic conditions, uh, we first uh, wanted to properly define chronic conditions. Um, several definitions uh, exist uh, for how to define chronic diseases or conditions. However, none of them are specific to women's health. Uh, we decided to use a 2010 HHS de uh, definition of chronic conditions um, that is that that chronic illnesses are conditions that last a year or more and require ongoing medical attention and or limit activities of daily living. And indeed we did, um, when we looked, there has been a dramatic rise in chronic conditions amongst women over the last several decades. Um, and we also wanted to decide how we were gonna measure this. And we decided upon uh, disability adjusted life years, um, which are defined by the World Health Organization as potential life loss due to premature mortality and years of life loss due to disability. In this way, we can see that there has, um, there has been a, a steep rise in chronic conditions amongst women causing disability. And this is in part due to our aging population as well as longer life expectancy amongst women compared to men. We also looked for differences um, in chronic conditions between men and women. Uh, CMS actually captures sex disaggregated prevalence of the 21 conditions that the agency defines as chronic. As you can see, um, these specific conditions, which include hypertension, arthritis, depression, dementia, osteoporosis, and asthma, occur more frequently in female beneficiaries compared to male. This data is limited in that Medicare beneficiaries are older than the US population um, and the average age in this cohort was 72. The causes of morbidity and mortality are different in women compared to men. Uh, female specific conditions such as abnormal menses, endometriosis or pelvic organ prolapse are common causes of disability amongst women. And there are additionally causes of morbidity that, um, that are, affect both men and women, such as heart disease and stroke that, um, that affect women as well as men. For the purpose of the NIH portfolio review, we constructed a framework to consider how chronic conditions uh, affect women. We labeled conditions as female specific, more common in women, 
potentially understudied in women or causing high morbidity in women. And the associated conditions were categorized by our metric of disability adjusted life years from left to right. And as you can see, drug use disorders cause a substantial amount of disability amongst women. Another concept of importance when thinking about chronic conditions in women is multimorbidity, which is defined as the co-occurrence of two or more chronic diseases in one individual. The Office of Disease Prevention has published this conceptual model and research framework of multimorbidity. The patient with multimorbidity sits at the center of this framework, um, represented by the large circle. And within, each, within the circle are smaller colored circles, which represent the patient's multiple chronic conditions. The uh, increasing risk um, for uh, may exacerbate a condition um, based upon environmental, biological, psychological, behavioral, and social factors. And understanding the effect, the influence of these factors on disease and interactions with chronic comorbid conditions may inform prevention strategies um, that affect disease outcomes. Multimorbidity is substantially more common in women compared to men. Um, women not only live longer than men um, and so have more time to accumulate morbidity, but women's symptoms of disease are often categorized as atypical, um, which has been demonstrated to lead to delays in diagnosis and probably contributes to poor responses to first line treatments um, in, uh, when once diagnoses are made. Interactions between conditions and the development of multimorbidity are poorly understood um, in all patients, but additionally um, uh, more so in women than in men. For women, the accumulation of morbidity starts early. Women of reproductive age in the United States and Canada are more likely to have multimorbidity than women in peer nations. In the United States, women of reproductive age are more likely to delay or skip care due to cost, which potentially delays diagnosis, delays the initiation of treatment, and may overall worsen, out, uh, worsen out health outcomes. The organ systems that are simultaneously involved in multimorbidity are different in female patients as well. Using electronic medical record data, investigators um, who perform this uh, analysis mapped organ systems involvement in multimorbidity by sex. There are several multimorbidities present in the female network that are not present in, in male patients. And the organ system involvement differs by sex with female patients more likely to have overlapping morbidity that links to mental health compared to men. The incidence of multimorbidity also differs by race. Um, although data disaggregated by sex and race or ethnicity are rarely reported. As shown in this slide, black women have significantly higher rates of carrying a diagnosis of three or more chronic conditions than women or men of any other racial or ethnic group. So both sex and gender influence the incidence and types of disorders um, that develop. And sex and gender are often conflated in the medical biomedical literature. Um, and so I'm just gonna really quickly provide some definitions. Sex is a multidimensional biological construct that's based upon anatomy, physiology, uh, and that, uh, secondary sex characteristics, chromosomes and hormones. Pregnant, uh, gender is a multidimensional, is another multidimensional construct that links, um, that is a social, behavioral, and structural concept that, and variable that links gender identity, expression, um, gender norms and roles, gender power relations, and equality and equity. Related to alcohol and substance abuse, we know that both sex and gender influence um, disease development and outcomes. Um, the male and female metabolisms process alcohol differently um, due to differences in total body water. We also know that gender influences drug use for women. Most women who inject heroin point to social pressure and sexual partner encouragement as factors for initiation of use. Pregnancy is a female-specific condition um, that leads 
most people who are pregnant to cut back um, or stop using drugs or alcohol as a result of gender roles and norms. Although we um, don't socially and culturally typically associate women with drug use disorders um, and alcohol use, one third of the population of folks who have substance use disorders are women. Women are less likely to be screened for substance use um, disorders than men. Um, following drug-related visits to the hospital, um, the emergency department, women are less likely to be referred to treatment, whereas men are more likely to be referred to treatment or to, um, to the uh, criminal justice system. Women are less likely than men to utilize substance use treatment services. And the barriers to receipt of treatment for women are multiple. They include parenting responsibilities, child care, uh, lack of child care access, disadvantages in economic resources, less social partner support, and greater social stigma. Drug-related overdose death rates in the United States have been rising amongst women in parallel to those seen amongst men. The number of women drinking alcohol uh, in dangerous amounts has also risen sharply um, in the United States. Um, and this has really been uh, exposed by the COVID pandemic. Alcohol use is more common amongst men. However, the largest annual increase in alcohol related mortality has occurred in non-Hispanic white women. Uh, COVID related psychological stress um, is associated with increased drinking amongst women, but doesn't affect, hasn't been shown to affect drinking behavior amongst men. And this data on alcohol use in women during the pandemic adds to um, our already existing data that alcohol related mortality has been increasing more rapidly amongst women than men over the last several decades. As with multimorbidity in general, multimorbidity is, is common amongst women who use drugs and is, uh, is, likely to be, is, is likely to be linked to mental health disorders. As this figure shows, the co-occurrence of drug use with any mental illness um, is common um, and uh, the, the, per, this, the percentage of um, women who have serious mental illness and use drugs um, is shown in, in red here and, and, uh, and the co-occurrence of mental health and substance use disorders is common. Thinking about multimorbidity and overlapping morbid conditions is important when we think about research on women's health and research on substance and alcohol use in women. Um, the high rates of multimorbidity can affect eligibility criteria for clinical research. Um, women have been historically overlooked in clinical research. And although today women make up roughly half of clinical trial participants in NIH supported research, eligibility criteria may disincentivize partition, participation of patients who have overlapping comorbidities. When we study populations that lack complexity and consist of patients who we already know um, about because they've been well studied before, we may miss important mechanistic information about populations of interest, and this may limit the generalizability of our research findings. So um, the NIH, the Office of Research on, on Women's Health continues to work um, aligned with the uh, NIH-wide strategic plan for uh, women's health research to advance rigorous research that is relevant to the uh, health of women, develop methods and leverage data sources that consider sex and gender, enhance dissemination and implementation of evidence to improve the health of women, promote training and careers to advance science for the health of women and improve evaluation of research that is relevant to the health of women. At the Office of Research on Women's Health, we, uh, we, have, we use this multidimensional uh, research framework to represent the intersection of factors that influence the health of women. Um, and this is across their, the entire women, women's health uh, life course. Uh, this this um, framework includes biological factors um, such as genetic, molecular, cellular, and physiologic factors, um, as well as external factors, including social determinants of health, gender, environment, and, and social policies. 
Uh, we also aim to consider intersectionality um, or, uh, or the overlapping identities uh, that, that women, um, that uh, where women identify. Um, and uh, I'm just presenting the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities Research Framework, which uses a multi-level um, influ a, a multi framework um, to consider uh, multiple influences on, on health, including at the individual, interpersonal, community, and societal levels. The Office of Research on Women's Health also supports research on, intersection, on intersectionality through its U3 or understudied, underrepresented, and underreported um, populations administrative supplement program. And this NOC is open and accepting um, applications for FY23. And so I wanna thank everyone for their attention today and welcome everyone to this uh, amazing conference. Um, and if folks have more questions, um, please connect with the Office of Research on Women's Health uh, for, to sign up for our monthly newsletter um, and other information, including our interprofessional education and courses. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Timken, for those very enlightening remarks. It's now my honor to introduce Dr. George Koob. Dr. Koob is director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, or NIAAA. He is also a senior investigator at the Intramural Research Program of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, where he directs the Neurobiology of Addiction Laboratory in the Integrative Neurosciences Research Branch. As an authority on alcohol use disorder, drug addiction, and stress, he has contributed much to our understanding of the neurocircuitry associated with the acute reinforcing effects of alcohol and drugs and the neural adaptations of the reward and stress circuits associated with the transition to dependence. Dr. Kube received his PhD in behavioral physiology from Johns Hopkins University and completed postdoctoral studies at Walter Reed Army Institute of Research and the University of Cambridge in England. He subsequently held positions at the Salk Institute and the Scripps Research Institute. Dr. Koob is the author of numerous publications and the recipient of many honors, including membership in the National Academy of Medicine and in the Legion of Honor in France. He has consistently championed women's health research at NIAAA and across NIH. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. George Koob. So good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. And I, I really want to thank the organizers for including um, me in, the, uh, in, in this uh, wonderful symposium. And I really think that uh, we're all going to learn a lot. I've already started. So it's a real, um, I'm, I, what I hope to do today is, is basically outline for you where we're at with trying to understand the differences between the male and the female brain. This is a great challenge, and some of the results I'm going to show you are going to be pretty much early uh, results that uh, you know we're going to build upon. So when we look at the numbers and the scope of the problem, I think you know you'll hear this over and over again. You know we're losing about 140,000 people a year to to, uh, to alcohol in, in for various reasons. Um, there's a 14.5 million individuals with an alcohol use disorder in the United States. And, you know, even with overdose deaths, um, as is illustrated in the box on the right, alcohol is listed in, in one out of six drug overdoses. And, and just to remind you that when you combine alcohol with sedative hypnotics or opioids, two plus two equals five. So th those drugs become even more lethal. Um, so you, you know, and we've been seeing increases in, in alcohol during the pandemic, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So one of the things that uh, Sarah Timpton just mentioned is, is the, that, that there is differences in uh, the alcohol consumption and related harms in males and females, but they're narrowing. And we're seeing more and more evidence of 
narrowing of the gap between males and females. And this slide pretty much illustrates the whole point, which is that uh, in the last 20 years, uh, the difference between males and females has completely narrowed. There's a slight decrease in male drinking, but the uh, in past, past month alcohol users, but there's a, a definite trend toward an increase uh, in females that that uh, converges. And one of the things we've picked up in college age populations is that, that women now are, are binge drinking uh, more than men for the first time in history. And you can see this here, if you go all the way back to a hundred years or, or so, you know, it used to be males um, were 3.6 times more likely to experience alcohol related harms than women. Now males and females are almost equally likely to experience harm. And the ratio is, is gone from 3.6 to 1.3. And this has already been uh, discussed a little bit, but you know, just to, to, to emphasize the point, studies suggest that women are more likely than men to experience a variety of alcohol-related harms at comparable doses. Uh, and these include everything from hangovers and blackouts, which is where you don't remember what transpired when you were drinking, um, to liver disease, to even certain cancers. And, uh, and there have been larger increases in alcohol-related emergency department visits, hospitalizations, and deaths for women over, over men over the past 20 years. And, um, and increases in alcohol use among adult women have been increased, uh, accompanied by increases in, in, in as I just said, in, in emergency department visits and hospitalizations and deaths. And some of the specific data to support that are are listed on this slide, but there's a bigger increase in yearly emergency department visits for men than for women than men, bigger increases in hospitalizations. Um, you can see the numbers here, uh, bigger increase in alcohol related deaths for women than men. And, uh, you know, between 1999 and 2017, males accounted for the majority of alcohol related deaths. Uh, but the increase over time for females and it uh, was bigger than for males. And, and this is just consistent with this narrowing of the gap, as I've been pointing out, not only in, in past month drinking, binge drinking, but also in the pathology that comes with excessive um, alcohol use or alcohol misuse, as we like to say. And then uh, we, uh, Aaron White put this together and we published this uh, just recently, but the rate of alcohol re related deaths increased 26% in 2020, the first year of the pandemic. So, uh, and prior to that, the rate of increase in deaths was, was around 2%. And so we've had this dramatic increase as, as has been seen with um, other dr drugs of addiction and uh, Nora, I'm sure we'll talk about that, um, but it's about a 27% for females and 25% for males in this database. And the death, deaths increased faster for women than men over the last two decades, as we've already discussed. So how do we explain some of these differences? And, and it, there appears to be sex differences in the motivation to drink alcohol, the brain changes that occur in alcohol use disorder, and, and the changes in affect during recovery. And there, there is early data, I would say, in the field suggesting some mechanisms to explain this. So I hope I can take you through this uh, and not be too neurobiological and, and, and convey a few important points. So one important point is that we have a conceptual framework that we've developed over the years. Uh, Nora Volkoff and I published this now about 10 years ago in a review article uh, about how we together put this, this conceptual framework into a, a heuristic framework so that it can be used for, for understanding addiction. So there are three stages, the binge intoxication, withdrawal, negative affect, and preoccupation, anticipation, if you will, craving stage. They mediate uh, domains of dysfunction. The binge intoxication is incentive salience and pathological habits during the withdrawal, negative affect stage. There are deficits in reward function, increases in stress, and preoccupation and anticipation or craving stage is characterized by executive function deficits. And while I don't expect you all to be uh, aficionados of the circuitry of the brain, I think you can see here the blue corresponds to the basal ganglia deep in the brain, an, uh, you know, uh, his, uh, 
you know, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, conserved function that you see even in lizards to get on with the world, motivational systems. Uh, the, the red is the, the fear system, the stress system in the, in the extended amygdala. And the green is frontal cortex, the, the part of the brain that is so well developed in humans that we use to uh, move about in the world and make decisions and, and not take drugs when we're, we're tempted to take drugs. And we put this all together um, over the years and, and would argue that there are multiple sources of, of reinforcement, of motivation for drug seeking. Obviously, drugs can make you you feel good, alcohol can make you feel good, it's a social lubricant. You feel, you know, you the, like all your troubles have, have gone away on that rising uh, part of the blood alcohol curve. Um, you know, alcohol is served at, at most social gatherings for that reason. <clears throat> but when you over drink, uh, another source of reinforcement kicks in, which is trying to uh, uh, avoid the negative effects of drinking too much from an emotional perspective. And we call that relief. and and negative reinforcement. And so we would argue that the development of incentive salience and pathological habits for drugs is a key part of, of uh, the reward piece and reward deficits then follow with sensitization of the stress response and ultimately compromised frontal cortex function. And why am I going through this with you? Well, I, I wanna emphasize that there are two sources of reinforcement. We always talk about the pleasurable effects of drugs, but we often forget that drugs um, uh, also uh, derive motivation from negative reinforcement, which is a removal of an aversive event. And what would that be with, with alcohol use disorder? Well, think of a hangover and thinking about drinking the next day to, avoid, to, to reduce the hangover of the, of the night before. That's in some sense negative reinforcement, but in alcohol use disorder, that means drinking because you just feel lousy when you're not drinking. And you know, I'm not gonna keep going on this, but I just wanna point out to you that there are possible sex drink differences in drinking motives in humans. And so one argument um, that, that we've uh, kind of pulled out of, of the literature is that maybe negative reinforcement is, is more important for women, particularly in young women, and positive reinforcement is more important for men, particularly young men and adolescents. So overall, women are more likely to drink for negative reinforcement, to dampen stress and negative affect, and men are more likely to drink for positive reinforcement, you know, stimulation and enhanced mood. This reflects sex differences in the neural biological underpinnings of drinking behavior. However, these populations overlap, and some women may drink primarily for positive reinforcement, and some men may drink primarily for negative reinforcement. You know, probing stress neural pathology and pathophysiology may be an important direction to develop tailored treatments for women. And this is an area of active research at NIAAA. And among adolescents, females may be more motivated to drink alcohol for negative reinforcement than males. Now, this is a quote from a paper in 2015. The results from the largest drinking motive study conducted to date suggest that gender specific prevention should take differences in the motivational pathways toward heavy drinking into account. That is, positive reinforcement seems to be important for boys and negative reinforcement more important for girls. Unfortunately, and we're seeing this as a, as a reflection of the pandemic, the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic has shown the spotlight on this issue. Drinking for negative reinforcement, that is drinking to cope, is more likely to lead to alcohol use disorder. And, and there are differences in the motivation to drink uh, among adolescents, uh, females and males, just drilling down on this point in, in a sample of uh, over 6,000 Norwegian adolescents aged 16 to 18 years, an increase in the severity of anxiety symptoms uh, was primarily associated with alcohol consumption among girls, but not boys. While sensation seeking and impulsivity are known to play roles in substance use during adolescence, these tendencies are stronger in males than females. So now we're on the positive reinforcement side. And it appears that adolescent females are more motivated to drink to cope with negative emotions than adolescent boys, while males are more motivated to drink as a result of impulsivity and sensation seeking. And, you know, I, I think this is a, a novel uh, framework with which to start looking at uh, all the neurobiological data that's beginning to be accumulated. 
And, you know, just to finish this, changes in affect during early recovery follow a different path for, for men and women with alcohol use disorder. Women with alcohol use disorder tended to show an increase in negative affect and decrease in positive affect in early abstinence. So if, if you look at the top panel there, you see women and alcohol use disorder and their emotional responses during abstinence. This is a, in actual in years. And you can see that for the first five years, um, positive affect plummets for women and negative affect goes up. But for males, it, it, uh, it's actually the reverse. So it's possible that the increase in negative affect and decrease in positive affect could increase the risk of relapse in women. And this is a really nice study um, uh, by Thompson and, and John F. Kelly and um, Marlene Oscar Berman that was published in, uh, just a year ago. So what do we know? The title of my talk is Alcohol in the Female Brain. So let, let's get to the brain. What do we know about differences in underlying brain mechanisms related to addiction in males and females? In, in my talk, I'm gonna focus only on alcohol. Well, one of the things that's important is there are a variety of ways that, 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 that sex differences can appear. And in a review paper that I wrote with uh, uh, Jill Becker a number of years ago, you know, we talked about qualitative differences between male and female behavior. They do different things, uh, quantitative differences. Um, females are, uh, are historically likely to be taking care of children more than males, although that certainly is probably changing in, 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 as, as time moves on and, and culture changes. And the population differences, um, male distribution of behavior versus female distribution of behavior. But the ones that we're gonna focus on right now are underlying mechanisms that differ. And you can imagine that there are um, male neural mechanisms and female neural mechanisms to be you know, binary, but there may be intermixing where there are certain circuits that males and females uh, share in the brain and others that they don't share. And even more um, challenging is the fact that sometimes the phenotype, the, what you see in the behavior looks the same, they're drinking more. All right, but they may be drinking more, as I've already um, argued, for different reasons. You know, one of the downsides is that we're still at the beginning of, of understanding and studying, actually, male-female differences. As, 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 as Sarah pointed out, um, Tim can point it out, you know, it, it, it was in the late 1990s that we decided at NIH that we needed to study uh, sex and gender in, in female clinical studies. But take a look at this slide and you see that um, uh, in a recent study that examined the inclusion of women in alcohol-related brain studies between 2010 and 2020, only 13% analyzed the data by sex. So the per percent of women in the sample has, has gone up. You can see the total is about a third if you look at PET versus MRI versus functional MRI. But the percent of studies that actually analyze the sex differences in their study is pretty small. And, and, and this is a paper published again last year. So we have a ways to go. And, and yes, we're getting the data, but now we need to start analyzing the data. This is a, 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 a review article. I'm not gonna go through this in great detail, but. Um, it, it's um, a review article by Flores Bonilla and Heather Richardson um, uh, about a, two years ago, where they broken down what they knew at the time about preclinical work um, in, in using models in the animal model field for the binge intoxication stage. Um, they see differences between males and females. Uh, alcohol in, in rodents increases dopamine levels in the nucleus of Cummins more in females than in male rats. Uh, you're going to see in, in human beings, that's actually the opposite. And binge drinking uh, is associated with reduced frontal cortex volume and frontal cortical thickness um, in adolescent boys versus adolescent girls, which actually tends to, to uh, uh, dovetail a little bit better with, with the human literature. And that, that would be uh, contributing to the craving stage. And, um, and then there's evidence that withdrawal from chronic intermittent alcohol increases glutamatergic signaling in the, in the BNST and the, 
the bud nucleus is stria terminalis and in the basal lateral amygdala, parts of our, of our temporal lobe, um, it, to a greater extent in, in males uh, compared to female rodents. So there is already preliminary results in, in animal studies that are being followed up and, and explored. And what I'd like to illustrate is one particular study that I found um, uh, particularly interesting. The amygdala is a part of the what we call the extended amygdala. It's part of our fear, stress, anxiety, neurocircuitry. It's activated during withdrawal from, from all major drugs of abuse, but in particular alcohol. And in this particular study, they showed that excitatory uh, signaling within the amygdala suppressed, was suppressed more by alcohol in males than in females. And, and suggesting that, that uh, the stress response in, in, in the brain is actually suppressed more in, in males than in females. And this was a, a, an animal study, um, and, and you could, which, is, which is basically illustrates the point I was making about the, the overall review article in the previous slide. And in this particular study in males, alcohol or cort corticosterone reduced excitatory postsynaptic potentials, that's reduced excitation in these cells in, in both um, two areas of the central nucleus of the amygdala. In females, there was less uh, suppression of this uh, excitatory uh, postsynaptic potentials or less activation um, produced by uh, uh, alcohol um, in, in the males um, than in the males. And, and so this just shows you that we, we have the capability now to, to study actual specific circuits that we are hypothesized to be involved in, in specific responses. And just to backtrack a little bit, uh, one of the things we is well established is that there's a hyper, an increased glutamatergic, a hyper excitable state that's associated with alcohol withdrawal. And again, to, to remind you of hangovers, um, the reason you wake up in the middle of the night after you've uh, take, drunk too much alcohol is because uh, first you have to go to the bathroom. And second, when you go to the bathroom, suddenly you find your brain is hot wired. And that's this glutamatergic surge that I'm talking about right here. Moving to the human condition, there's been a number of studies that show that, uh, that alcohol uh, releases dopamine in the human brain and activates the dopamine system. And that contributes to uh, reward and incentive salience that we associate with alcohol and its pleasurable effects. And the pioneer in this work was none other than Dr. Nora Volkov, who will be following me in, in this symposium. And, but this is a, a, a study where they broke it down by males and females. These individuals were um, actually had the equivalent of um, uh, three drinks. And, and you can see that the uh, males show a, a, a much more dramatic effect in releasing do dopamine than uh, females. Um, and that goes with the, the whole hypothesis that uh, males may show more of the rewarding effects of alcohol and females less. Um, and uh, this is using PET imaging, and it, you know, you, it looks like there's a decrease on the alcohol scan there, and that's because you're actually displacing a ligand that binds to, to the dopamine receptor, and that means that when you're displacing that ligand with endogenous dopamine, that alcohol is releasing that endogenous dopamine. So this is a, one example that suggests, again, it, there's a difference in, in motivation that's driving um, alcohol consumption and alcohol misuse in human beings. And, and it has to do possibly with a very specific part of our reward circuitry. There are also thicker funnel areas in binge drinking females, thinner in binge drinking males. This could also control um, this kind of uh, impulsive behavior because that means that maybe the frontal cortex has more control. And, and this is uh, adolescent females who were binge drinking showed 8% thicker cortices in frontal cortex regions than female non-drinkers, which was linked to worse visual uh, spatial inhibition and attention performances. And then again, part of the reward system, the ventral striatum, which is where the dopamine goes um, to the forebrain, where it activates the forebrain, and, and we know this is involved in the rewarding effects of alcohol is larger uh, in females and smaller than in males. Maybe in some sense, um, 
uh, females don't uh, drink as much because they have a, a larger, more active reward system. We don't know at this point. And the explanation is unclear, but further evidence of sex differences in the role of, of this reward system in alcohol misuse. And if you look at the graph at the bottom there, you can see that, that for the males, uh, there's a, uh, a, 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 a larger uh, increase in the ventral striatum, um, in larger, uh, a, a bigger decrease in the ventral striatum in males. That's the red bar in the binge drinkers. And in the females, um, th there's a, 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 a larger uh, uh, decrease in, in the frontal cortex. So there are there are differences um, but between the the groups in in the females. There's a much bigger increase in in the ventral striatum in the binge drinkers, and and um, and th then then the uh, in the, and in the ventral striatum, and then there are. Further changes in brain areas involved in reward for women and men with alcohol use disorder. Um, and analyses revealed a, a significant gender interaction for the association between alcohol use disorder and total reward ne network volumes, including the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and cingulate cortices, and, and, as well as uh, the areas uh, involving the extended amygdala, hippocampus, nucleus accumbens, and, and ventral diencephalon. Men with alcohol use disorder had smaller reward network volumes than controls and women with alcohol use disorder had larger uh, reward network volumes than controls. Again, data that are gonna to have to be integrated with the overall picture, but again, data indicating there's differences in how the reward system is processing alcohol reward in, between men and women. And then there are changes in white matter that are different for women and men. And this talks to, speaks to connectivity of some of the uh, brain uh, systems that are controlling um, these uh, more basic motivational systems. So there are sex differences in the relationship of, of connectivity with uh, alcohol use disorder. They were observed in three clusters, the anterior and middle medial portions of the corpus callosum, the arcuate fasciculus and extreme capsule, and the superior longitudinal fasciculi. So these descending pathways that control uh, basic functions in the brain uh, men with alcohol use disorder had lower functional ana anastropy, which means lower connectivity than controls, while women had higher connectivity um, than controls. So putting this all together, our argument would be, as an as a overall hypothesis, that, that addiction um, is viewed as a maladaptive coping response under conditions of, of chronic stress and that maybe women are more sensitive and they have circuitry in their brains that are more sensitive to this chronic stress. And so we wrote this paper um, in the middle of the pandemic, uh, Aaron White and, and Patricia Powell and I, um, basically arguing that you know, there are allostatic loads on this withdrawal negative affect part of the addiction cycle. But our point was, that these are maybe exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. And a lot of the data suggests that a pretty dramatic increases in drinking to cope with stress during the pandemic, explaining these pretty dramatic increases in, in um, pathology associated with alcohol across the board during the pandemic. And I just wanna remind you that stressors are not new, okay? And, and producing loads on our homeostatic system, which we call allostatic loads, other, uh, you know, uh, stability through change is allostasis. So you don't quite return to normal and you're carrying this load around in your brain circuits. And it, it can be caused by genetics, by epigenetics, um, by childhood trauma, could be caused by structural racism, could be caused by selective uh, uh, pressures that you heard about from Sarah Timken on women at, at all levels from from, uh, from uh, uh, overwork uh, in, in certain contexts, under uh, representation, under diagnosis and under treatment and under uh, 
treatment for, uh, of recovery for, for alcohol use disorder in women. And, and then there is higher psychiatric com uh, comorbidity in women, and you'll hear about that later. And, and that also impacts and interfaces with um, alcohol use disorder and other addictions. So to summarize what I've said, alcohol use and related harms are increasing for females. Females may be more motivated than males to consume alcohol and perhaps other drugs to relieve emotional discomfort leading to negative reinforcement. Alcohol seems to activate the reward system more in males with some exceptions of some of the data I showed you, but that's the general consensus so far leading to positive reinforcement. Chronic alcohol misuse leads to different patterns of changes in white and gray matter volumes and areas involved in reward and cognitive functions, often with increases in volumes for women and decreases for men with alcohol use disorder. Perhaps due to differences in motivations to drink and in brain ch changes over time responsible for those motivations to drink, changes in affect early in recovery appear to follow a different course for women and men. So, my argument is that prevention, treatment, and recovery support strategies should all be informed by our evolving understanding of sex differences in alcohol misuse. And I just want to really end uh, by reminding you that we have a number of websites for some of the information that I provided you today. You want to know what a standard drink is? Go to Rethinking Drinking. You want to know when you're overdoing it? Go to Rethinking Drinking. You want to know where to go to understand what an alcohol use disorder is or seek help? Go to the treatment navigator. And if you want to understand some of the, the data on sex differences and, sex and harms associated with alcohol and many other things, including how to do screening and brief intervention and referral to treatment, everything you want to know about alcohol, um, you can go to the, our health, new healthcare professional core resource on alcohol. Um, and, and that basically, um, that resource has foundational knowledge, explains the clinical impacts of alcohol, provide strategies for prevention and treatment of alcohol problems, and, and then how to put it all together to, to promote practice change. And for those of you who are interested, you can even get CME credit for, for participating in, in the uh, healthcare professional core resource. Um, I, I apologize a little bit for this advertisement, but we really would like to get the world to understand that this resource is out there. So um, I wanna give a special thanks. Thank you all for listening. Um, if I may say, as they say in Alcoholics Anonymous, um, um, I want to especially thank Aaron White for putting many of these slides together and Patricia Powell and Bridget William Simmons for helping me with the organization. So thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing. And it is my real pleasure to introduce my, uh, my good friend, Nora Volkoff, and, and um, for the next talk, if um, that's OK, Deidre. That is perfect, Dr. Koop. Thank you so much. Good morning. I think that I'm officially introduced. And yes, indeed, it is a pleasure to follow Dr. George Koop. Well, I'm supposed to tell how wonderful you are, Nora. No, no, I've been listening. It's wonderful. And I think it's OK to advertise. But, but thanks very much. And it's a pleasure for me, too, also to be given an opportunity to speak in this symposium targeting to our understanding about what is uh, unique and what are the challenges that women and girls uh, address with the various uh, disorder conditions, and specifically with substance use disorders. And certainly, as uh, you heard, my uh, long friend and colleague for many, many years, Dr. Cook, he has given you an insight in terms of our uh, where we are in our understanding regarding differences between men and women. Before I, jump, before I jump into my talk, I do want to also highlight that even though we emphasize differences between women and men in terms of how the brain works, we also need to recognize that there are a lot of similarities. So I don't just want us to get all of the sense that we do have such distinct brains. They are different, but so are differences in the brains between each one of us. What, what is important certainly is to identify the specific factors that may actually uh, are relevant and salient that differentiate the women's brain from men, particularly as it relates to issues that he gives us an understanding of the disease conditions. And in our case, substance use disorders, as well as other mental health challenges. With that, I'm going to share my screen. Let me see if I find it and I'm going to have to, yes, here it is. 
and I'm just going to need to get to someone to tell me if you can see it. Can you see it? Yeah, you're good, Nora. You're good. Yeah, no, excellent. I, I want to start with this slide. So to give you a perspective of what is the prevalence use of uh, drugs by men and women in this country. And you have the licit substances, which are uh, tobacco and alcohol. And you make, men make the argument about marijuana. Certainly marijuana is federally illegal. It's an illegal substance, but the states have legalized it. So it's an in-between. But what jumps at you, and particularly looking tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana, I'm showing you the indicators of passmont use in the United States for individuals that are 12 years or older. Uh, whereas the other drugs, the other illicit drugs that are in the lower part reflect the indicator past year. And it clearly jumps at you that there is a striking difference in terms of prevalence as given by the fact of whether a drug is legal or illegal or is in that uh, intermediate state as is the case of marijuana. And we've known all along drugs, when they become legal, become much more accessible and that favors the utilization and you don't have the norms that are sometimes actually make people not take drugs if they are considered illicit. Um, in the case, if you compare um, men and women, and I think the, uh, George made this very, very clear, the differences that we are observing in, between men and women in terms of drinking patterns are actually that gap that we used to see in the past is narrowing and narrowing and narrowing. And so is the case for all of the legal drugs. Uh, and I'm actually, even though it's really not officially legal uh, government-wise vis-a-vis the states, and uh, many of the states it is, you can see that that gap is narrowing. And that, on the other hand, is very different from what you see in general for the other illicit substances in general. Not all of them follow the same pattern. But uh, certainly, for example, for cocaine, the use of, is much greater in males than in females. And interestingly, on, on methamphetamine, we're starting to see an equalization. Opioid uh, depends on the type of opioid, but certainly for heroin and fentanyl, it's much lower in women than men. But for prescription opioids, they are actually, that is very, very similar. Um, so the differences that were very clear in the past and sort of are disappearing. We do know, as has been pointed um, before, that there are also differences on the way that these, these behaviors occur. And I'll go with that into, into a second. I just want to um, basically reiterate something that now is recognized for many, many years. But for those, those that may be hearing, that are listening, that, do not, that are not familiar with the substance use field, it is now recognized that all of the drugs that produce addiction, that has the capability of producing addiction, the, what we call drugs of abuse or drugs uh, regarding drugs, all of them have a common pharmacological mechanism and that is they increase dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. And the nucleus accumbens, this, this structure here, is uh, one of the main reward centers of the brain. And it connects both multiple sites throughout the cortex and subcortical regions. And the dopamine system is one of the main, main systems that regulates its function. And drugs of abuse um, stimulate this dopaminergic signaling by various different mechanisms, whether it is by activating the cells like nicotine directly on them or indirectly by other cells that either stimulate them or like alcohol or opioids by inhibiting cells that are inhibiting the dopamine cells. Or you see also by, by uh, the stimulant drugs, which actually directly stimulate the release of dopamine from the terminals. And in that respect, stimulant drugs are the ones that produce the largest changes in dopamine in the nucleus accumbens and trigger the faster the escalation of drug taking and the faster transition from initiation of drug taking into addiction. Now, there are significant sex differences that George was pointing out in terms of what we understand regarding the rewarding effects of drugs between males and females. We know that there are sex differences in the dopamine system, and I'll get you an example of some of the most recent findings there that are related to it. But there are other sex differences in some of the targets, for example, that are mediating the effects of the drugs in the dopaminergic system. Nicotine activates dopamine cells via the nicotine receptors, 
Um, alcohol activates the uh, dopaminergic systems by multiple mechanisms, including the mu opioid receptor systems. Uh, also, it uh, basically enhances GABAergic neurotransmission to the GABA receptors. Um, cannabinoid receptors interact with the cannabin, uh, basically with the terminals that then regulate dopamine release. So there are these receptor targets, whether it's this opioid receptor, nicotine receptors, cannabinoid receptors, actually have different levels in males and females. We also, and this is the literature from many, many years, have known all along that gonadal hormones significantly influence uh, the drug responses, and in particularly the uh, drug uh, enhancing effects, uh, dopamine enhancing effects of drugs. And of them, for example, estradiol potentiates those effects, whereas pro progesterone may have some protective effects against those enhancements. There's also, as George pointed out very eloquently, there are striking differences in between the sexes in stress reactivity. And stress itself also stimulates dopaminergic pathways. And that is one of the mechanisms by which you see some, some much of a, an interaction between stress conditions and, and drug taking and why um, stress is one of the most powerful factors that contributes to drug relapse. Thus, it's not surprising uh, that uh, the, the, the reasons why males or females take drugs varies. And as uh, pointed out by George, uh, females take drugs much more for coping than males. They are also much more likely to have comorbid anxiety and depression, and this then drives their drug taking. Uh, what also has been recognized all along is that while drug taking, which is a behavior that usually starts during the teenager years, is much more likely to happen among males, if females are given drugs and they start taking them, they escalate into the fa uh, compulsive drug taking much faster than males. Uh, and then uh, the, the ones they have, the, the syndrome itself of what we call a substance use disorder or addiction, um, it is also recognized that there are differences. Females are much more sensitive to condition responses and th therefore uh, suffer more from, from craving and relapse from craving. Whereas in males, you see much more of a component of impulsivity that leads to, to drug taking. So these are some of the examples I'm going to be giving you in terms of uh, from brain imaging studies that show the differences that we have been observing in males and females uh, and other researchers. This is a study from our group in which we were comparing the response to the stimulant drug methylphenidate between males and females uh, using the technique that uh, George was mentioning. Positron emission tomography, you take a ligand that binds to the striatum raclopride, but this ligand only binds when the receptors are free. So if dopamine goes up, like when you take a drug, then the ligand cannot bind and you see a decrease in binding. So this is, for example, placebo, and this is the average images for the subjects when they are given intravenous methylphenidate or oral methylphenidate. And you can clearly see the significant reduction. In this particular study, we did uh, two different cohorts, cohort one, which is shaded, and cohort two, which is all, all dark, strong colors. And you see oral and IV methylphenidate, where it is oral or IV methylphenidate. You can see um, in the dorsal striatum, this is the placebo, this is the 60 milligrams, this is the um, uh, 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 placebo, and this is the IV methylphenidate 0 0.5 milligrams. Um, and you can see that there is a person, sorry, guys, I apologize, I made that confusing. This is percent change. So this is already computed the difference between the placebo and the methylphenidate. So the magnitude of the change of dopamine is basically plotted here. Oral methylphenidate has less changes in dopamine than intravenous methylphenidate. But overall, you can see that whereas we don't see per se in the dorsal striatum any significant differences between males and females, when you actually go into the nucleus accumbens, which is the reward center of the brain, you see both for oral methylphenidate and for intravenous methylphenidate that females have significantly larger changes in dopamine than males. And this in turn is associated with a more uh, intense subjective perception of um, drug-like in chi. Uh, and, the, and this phenomena may indeed may put uh, be a factor that uh, actually differentiates the risk to, to which someone will take the drug again in subsequent uh, events. This, all of these studies, by the way, are done in healthy controls. 
Studies of positron emission tomography have also been done to measure different types of receptors that are targets of drugs. This is the cannabinoid CB1 receptors. And what you are seeing here is in the uh, brains of the areas of the brain that differ between males and females, cannabinoid 1 receptors, where males have more receptors than females. And these are the color scheme, and it shows that particularly in the posterior visual cortex, uh, uh, as well as in some of the prefrontal cortical areas, males have significantly higher levels of cannabinoid 1 receptors than females. And again, this is likely to influence, not necessarily in this case, because these two regions are not specifically associated with the initial rewarding effects of the drugs, but certainly with the uh, other pharmacological effects of the drugs that then become by themselves, either through condition responses, factors that, um, that again, motivate uh, or affect the, uh, the, the cognitive uh, if, uh, per, uh, cap capabilities of the individual when consuming marijuana. This is another example. This is a study actually uh, different because instead of targeting just what are the levels of changes in dopamine or receptors? What this study shows is the concept that, that George was speaking about, which is the notion that in general, we have been focusing very much that people take drugs because of their positive rewarding effects. But, but we got into a conundrum because in general, all of the studies have shown that indeed, and they documented in an acute situation, you don't have addiction. The, uh, the level of occupancy of the drug of the receptor of the transporter very much predicted the rewarding effects, except for nicotine, because what it was shown is that in nicotine, you had individuals taking nicotine and it's completely blocking all of the receptors, uh, the alpha-4, beta-2, which are the ones that are linked with positive rewarding effects. And yet, despite a full-blown occupancy of those receptors, these individuals still have significant craving which did not really add a uh, two plus two. What then it became clear is that uh, what's happening is when people take chronic, and this is shown in animals too, chronic nicotine, you upregulate these alpha-4, beta-2 receptors. And these alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors basically are desensitized very rapidly. And so what's happening is that uh, the lack of stimulation of these receptors actually is what the desensitization of these receptors is what uh, the smokers appear to be seeking to do. And, and so understanding that the upregulation of the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors has a negative reinforcing effect and that the individuals are smoking in order to desensitize them. That's one of the theories that are actually now is postulated to try to understand this very aberrant finding. But as it relates to sex differences, what studies have shown is that overall, uh, the upregulation of the alpha-4, beta-2 nicotine receptors, this is for striatum, this is for cerebellum, this is males, this is females, was only significantly observed in males and not females, suggesting that these uh, long-term effects of drugs in these particular target receptors may differ across the sexes. The mechanism of this, of course, needs to be further investigated, and what it does point is that we cannot assume that neuro that the neuro adaptations are similar in males and females. I'm going to now go over to show you some of the epidemiology and challenges and unique things that are clinically relevant for three of the main drugs, tobacco, uh, cannabis, and opioids. I'm skipping alcohol because George did such an excellent job and I was expecting him to do that. So let me jump into tobacco. Um, just as I was mentioning before, we are seeing the narrowing of the gap that basically, whereas at the beginning, you, you start to see these are the active smokers, the, the, the basically these, these lines, the, the continuous lines, as opposed to the, the, these disrupted lines, which are the former smokers. So let's just concentrate it on the, the, the current smokers. You see the large gap differences, how they start to narrow, and they continue to narrow. And I think that this is an example of that. One of the most successful prevention campaigns, that one that has led to a very dramatic reduction in smoking in the United States. Now, uh, this is great news. Uh, the, and and uh, the bad news, of course, right now, the concern that exists is that there has been a significant rise in nicotine vaping. And so this is the nicotine vaping prevalence 
for 12 in the, uh, for year, individuals that are 12 years or old, older in the United States, male and female lifetime year past month. And again, you see that basically for all practical purposes, we're not seeing very much of a difference between males and females. And in fact, among teenagers, we see that there are no differences in vaping of nicotine between girls and boys. Um, I, I take this particular effect of nicotine because it uh, brings forward also an, a, 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 and sort of an example of how we're starting to understand some of these sex differences, not just in what drives you to take the, the nicotine, but also in terms of its clinical consequences. This is a fascinating, fascinating study that actually was first reported by our laboratory at Bukhebe National Lab, Lab that showed that nicotine itself has an effect presumably through the uh, nicotine receptors, though it's unclear which are that subtype that is responsible for that, that actually inhibit the enzyme that is responsible, one of the main enzymes responsible for synthesizing estrogen. And this enzyme is aromatase. It basically transforms androgens like the testosterone into estrogen. Extraordinary important enzyme, and it is uh, for synthesis of estrogen, uh, not just in the brain, but in multiple organs, including the ovaries. So these are images of the um, this uh, aromatase enzyme in the non-human primate brain. Here is the amygdala, very high content, very high content in the hypothalamus, very high content thalamus, very high content hippocampus. And these are the images in these animals when they were given a low dose of nicotine and an intermediate dose of nicotine, equivalent to those of cigarette smoking. And currently, as we speak, uh, the European Congress of Nuclear Medicine has a study that shows that just like we had reported in non-human primates, in humans, one single cigarette significantly inhibits this aromatase enzyme. And because this aromatase enzyme, as I say, is crucial for production of estrogen, this gives us an insight of some of the clinical findings that we have observed. So it is well recognized that women that more have hypoestrogenic uh, conditions. They have early menopause, this menorrhea, menstrual irregularity, which is likely to reflect in part this inhibition and the lack of production of estrogen. They have lower bone, bone mineral density, also very much linked probably to that reduction in, in nicotine. I'm not saying it's the only one, but it's likely to be a major contributor. It's also likely to go under to help us understand the conception delay that they have, the infertility. And also, uh, we know that, uh, I mean, the rates of smoking among pregnant women are still non negligible. 20 to 30% of women smoke. And this has been uh, documented to be associated with low birth weight and many other complications stillborn, neonatal day, uh, uh, death, and actually with an increased risk for childhood ob obesity. And as pointed out already by George, just like for alcohol, the consequences of smoking in women are worse than in men. So for example, lung cancer is twice the rate of in females than males. Similarly, the relative risk for heart, attack, heart uh, attacks are much higher for women than they are for men. And, in the, and, and there are many cancer, not just uh, lung cancer, but breast cancer, for example, in women is associated with uh, dosing, how, how, what is the exposure of cigarettes. So we know that all of these factors have negative effects, uh, both for the mother, the infant, and um, they also affect their, their likelihood of responding to treatment. But I'm not, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that at the end. Now, what about cannabis? In the situation of cannabis, just like uh, we have been hearing the prior two talks, there has been with COVID, COVID has not really helped at all in terms of the patterns of drug taking, which is not surprising because one of the ways that we cope with stressors is uh, drug taking is one of the behaviors. So drug taking in general has been going up, not, not, not across all of the drugs, but so, some of them. So this is the uh, marijuana use in past bond among women age 12 plus. And the patterns are actually not very different from those that we see in men. And these are 12 or older. And what's interesting, and this we've been recovering all along, is despite all of the legalization patterns and during the COVID pandemic itself, we have not seen an increase of marijuana consumption among teenagers. If anything, the marijuana consumption has significantly reduced during te in teenagers, particularly during the first year of the pandemic, which we basically, one of the factors we believe played a role is that uh, kids were not 
at school, but were at home where their parents could observe them and had less likelihood of interaction. On the other hand, look at 18 to 25, significant rises. And this is the group that has the highest rate of marijuana smoking and 26 and older, even though the rates are not as high as those uh, the prevalence rates that you see in the 18 to 25. This is the largest in terms of absolute population number. And this accounts why we're seeing such a, a significant rise. So women and men are the gap. Again, I emphasize like others have is narrowing in their differences. Well, what, what is uh, the consequences of those increases in marijuana consumption that we are observing in our country, driven by legalization and then exacerbated by COVID? Is that not surprising? We're seeing a significant rise in women that are pregnant that are consuming marijuana. And this is the uh, percent of those using marijuana in the past year in pregnant, comparing pregnant and non-pregnant women. Uh, definitively, there are more non-pregnant women that use marijuana than pregnant ones. But what it is notable is see the rise. And, and this, this uh, 2017 since as actually is an outlier number, but otherwise we're seeing this significant rise. And when you look at it uh, from that perspective and you sort of ask the question, well, what are the consequences of smoke, uh, smoking marijuana or vaping marijuana or consuming edibles? Well, one of the characteristics for drugs to be rewarding is they have to cross the blood-brain barrier. Characteristic number one, which basically means that they are crossing the placenta and the placenta, and then they are delivering into the fetus. And therefore, whenever there is a drug of abuse, we need to always ask the question, what are going to be the consequences to the developing fetus? There's a lot of work going on. And we know that the consumption of marijuana during pregnancy is not benign. And uh, but where is the data most solid? And it's more solid because it has been studied for a longer period of time. And this is data that is not being questioned. There is um, neonates that are born of mothers that, that smoke marijuana or consume it in other ways, are um, have decreased gestational age, have decreased birth weight and length, have decreased head circumferences, had re uh, decreased reactivity to life, an uh, increased start of responses, and in, a more likelihood to having tremors. And there's ongoing work, of course, to try to see are these effects long lasting, consequential in terms of emotions and behavior. And there is some data to suggest they are, but it is through prospective data like the ABCD study that we aim to try to identify is we can document causality in these effects. It's definitely something that is worrisome. Now, let me uh, jump into the uh, opioids. In the case of the opioids, this is the opioid crisis, and this is the number of deaths per 100,000 population starting in 1991 between males and females, and you can see these differences. Now look at how large the gap has. Uh, this is uh, has grown between males and females. Many more males are dying than females from opioids, whereas that was not the case at the beginning of the ep uh, epidemic. And the reason why that, that has changed so dramatically is the first 10 years of the epidemic when we see similar patterns of death between men and women. This was driven by prescription opioids. And women have much more frequency of, of chronic pain conditions than males. So these are men, these are women, and this is basically the rate of uh, different types of chronic pain, pain, back, uh, pain, severe headache or migraine, low back pain, neck pain. And those women were more likely, are more likely to be prescribed opiates for their pain conditions than men. And that accounted for the fact that we had, were seeing from the beginning high rates of overdose mortality. That changed in 2011 when um, basically the main cause of death became heroin. And then in 2015, when the main cause of overdose deaths became fentanyl. So what is uh, within that pattern, what is the prevalence of opioid misuse in past year among women age 12 or older? And we see basically a relatively stable rates. Perhaps there is uh, between 2019, 20, in, in, in this, this year, uh, uh, what appears to be a slight increase, a 10% increase. We, on the other hand, we're seeing significant reductions in 18 to 25. 26 and older is uh, go, it basically it has gone up, and we are waiting to see if these trends remain or not. So the the prevalence rates on the past four years per se in women have been overall varied by by ages, decreasing in the teenagers, 
whereas there appears to be perhaps an increase in old, uh, older groups. But it hasn't been anything dramat as dramatic as we have seen with men. Uh, what we have also seen, and this was noted uh, in, a, uh, in a study that brought a lot of attention in 20, 20, 20, 2020, that brought attention to this issue, a significant rise in neonatal abstinence syndrome, as more women uh, were uh, basically consuming opioids like heroin or fentanyl, those neonates were being born uh, with abstinence syndrome, and that has risen enormously with all of the associated negative consequences. But I want to ponder on this slide, and this is a slide that has not been published. It was actually, we were finally able to run the analysis and they were sent to me two days ago, so I'm sharing them for the first time. It's not published data, but it is, I think, nonetheless, extremely important to start to speak about it because it, it documents the burden of the contribution of mortality associated with overdoses in pregnant women. So you have the, the in red drug overdoses. This is all of the mortality for women that are pregnant in the United States. So you have the obstetric mortality, you have the homicide mortality, you have the suicide mortality, transportation and other mortality. And this is data up to December 2021, to say that the, the most recent data ever. Other mortality ratio, ratio includes other mortality that could be COVID infections that you die, that could be cancer that you die from. But I want you to see how uh, consequential are overdose mortality among pregnant women. Uh, or, uh, this, this is a category that has multiple medical conditions. This is overdose mortality. Uh, much higher than transportation mortality, much higher than homicide, much higher than suicide. Um, whereas in the past, there has been a lot of attention about how important uh, homicide and, um, and actually even suicide is in mortality for pregnant women. Um, and I'm not in any way undermining their importance, but I'm highlighting that the main driver here is uh, much higher rates from overdose mortality than any of the other conditions. And it is crucial because this is something that we should be tackling. Why do I say that? Well, look at this data that actually shows the overdoses. The in pregnant women is not overdose mortality, it's overdoses. It's, or if they were, these are not women that die. But these were actually comparing the number of overdoses that they suffer on the basis of whether they were medication or not, and on the basis of how long they were on medication during their pregnancy. In that, and this is the percent reduction in overdoses. And what you can see, if, if you can provide medications for an opioid use disorder for a woman while pregnant during, during the pregnancy, you're basically protecting him, her from overdosing. So evidently, these women that they died did not get that protection. So the question is, why are we not treating them? And when you look at overall, and this is the only slide that I'm going to be showing for treatment, this is treatment for multiple substance use disorder conditions for males, and this is females. Whether it is not an issue that is just for opioids, it's an issue that pertains to all of the substance use disorder. Women are much less likely to be treated than males. Now, what is driving this? And I think that there are multiple factors that are driving this gap in treatment, but an important one is stigma. We've known all along that substance use disorders are the most stigmatized of that all disorders. Addicted individuals are stigmatized by the healthcare system, by society, by their families, by themselves. They actually uh, internalize that stigma. That stigma in turn is associated with much greater reluctance to seek treatment. And if they seek treatment with uh, negative conditions and negative outcomes, um, now states actually regulate, for example, very differently the way that they will be addressing a woman that is present, uh, pregnant and taking drugs. In some instances, that may mean that they are going to be removing the custody of that child from that pregnant woman that is taking drugs. In other uh, states, it may mean that they get incarcerated. So in those conditions, certainly women are not going to be seeking uh, ultimately help. Women that take drugs are also much more vulnerable to violence and to homelessness. And that is an aspect that we don't speak very much about, but that actually affects all individuals with a substance use disorder, but is particularly severe and, and challenging for those women that have a substance use disorder. 
And with that, I want to thank you all for the opportunity to um, give this presentation. Thanks very much. And I'm going to stop sharing my script. Thanks. Thank you so very much, Dr. Volkov and uh, Dr. Ku for those very thought provoking uh, presentations. So much to, to think about, very informative. Um, so, and now we're pleased to begin our first panel uh, moderated by Dr. Gitanjali Chander. Good morning. Uh, my name is Gitanjali Chander, and I'm going to be moderating the panel on overview of harmful substance use among women. Um, I'm pleased to introduce our panelists. These include Dr. Deborah Hassan, Dr. Joe Frodenheim, Dr. Rajatha Sinha, Dr. Sujaya Part Parthasarathy, and Reverend Dr. Q English. Following their presentations, we'll have a 15-minute Q&A with our panelists. Um, our first presentation will be by Dr. Hassan, um, which will be a recording. Well, hi, thank you very much for inviting me to present at this conference. I think it is a really worthwhile conference. And I, over the two days, um, a lot of very interesting and useful information will be presented by people who are really experts in all the various areas um, of the conference. I'm gonna start my talk on the epidemiology of alcohol and drug use um, that focuses on sex differences in adolescents and in adults by mentioning some terminology first. So in terms of measuring alcohol consumption, there's a, a huge benefit to the field in the, by the fact that there is what's called a standard drink. So we can quantify that. We, we know how much um, approximately how much alcohol is in, a, is in a standard can of beer or glass of wine. Of course, there's some variability, but we at least have a standard to refer to. And the uh, definition of high risk or binge drinking differs for men and women partly because of differences in uh, gender or sex differences in body composition. So th there's a bit higher level of standard drink consumption that defines high risk drinking for men than there is for women. For most illicit drugs, we don't have this at all. For example, for marijuana, it's, it's next to impossible to quantify it at this point, aside from just frequency. But for alcohol, we do have this benefit. Hopefully in the future, we'll have something like that for marijuana as well. The World Health Organization also defines um, risk drinking. They do it a little bit differently. So they uh, they have what are cons what they call very high risk and high risk levels of drinking. And those are clinically relevant categories. And you can see once again that the, uh, the definitions of these categories differ for men and women. Um, so for men uh, to be in the very high risk category, that's approximately seven or more drinks in a day. Whereas for women, it's about four, a little more than four drinks in a day. Um, about uh, two years ago, in my group, we published a paper that looked at changes over time uh, between the very beginning of the century, 2001, 2002, and a large national survey conducted on um, American adults, and a survey that was conducted about 10 years later. And we looked at whether there was change over time in um, the prevalence of who risk drinking levels by sex. And what we found was that while there was a slight increase in the men, it wasn't a very big difference and it wasn't statistically significant. But what we see here is that there was a much more pronounced increase in women. It was almost a doubling of the prevalence of um, very high risk levels of drinking. And that was a highly significant change between the two surveys. So I'm going to pick up with that more recent survey and talk a little bit about uh, sex differences in um, alcohol use disorder. This is a nationally representative survey that was conducted with about 36,000 um, American adults um, with oversampling for minorities. And here we see the rates of any alcohol use disorder present in the past 12 months. This shows the rates overall in the, in the whole sample and then broken down by whether the alcohol disorder was mild, moderate, or severe. When we look across uh, sex differences, we see that uh, males predominated with higher rates than women, and that's the case for mild, moderate, and for severe disorders. However, we have some more recent information 
on um, binge drinking and alcohol use disorders from another national survey that was conducted in 2019. Actually, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health is conducted yearly, um, but I'm going to show you information that's from the 2019 survey. The NISDU survey uh, includes about a quarter of the participants in age range 12 to 17 youth, young adults 18 to 25 another quarter, and then about half the participants age 26 and older. So here we see the overall rates of um, uh, binge drinking, um, and um, this is by age 12 to 17, 18 to 25, and 26 and older. Here we see the rates for broken out by men, males and females. So when we look at the total, we see that males uh, have higher rates than females. But when we break this down by uh, the age groups, we see something different. Um, and we're gonna be coming back to that difference over and over again in this talk. So here, looking at the youngest age group, the, the, um, the youth, uh, we see that uh, the girls actually had higher rates of binge drinking than the boys did. This was not the case in the, the uh, young adult group and in the older adult group, not so much older in all of them necessarily, just those age 26 and older. Here is where the, um, the rates were higher in, in, the, um, in the men than in the women. When we look at this for alcohol use disorder also, here are the overall rates. And when we break this out by, um, gender, once again, we see that overall, more males than females have alcohol use disorder in 2019 in the NISDU data. But once again, we see a predominance in the youngest group um, in, the young, in the females compared to the males. We see a slight um, a hint of this effect in the, in the young adults, although it's not as strong as it is in the youth. It, and it's only in those that are age 26 and older that we see that the men are still predominating in their rates compared to women. So it suggests that something different is going on in the youth than what has been going on in the older adults. And there may be some birth cohort effects that are leading to changes in girls and boys that may in the future translate into differences in rates in adults as they, as they age. So I'm gonna go on now and talk about time trends, those based on repeated annual national surveys, first talking about adolescence. And much of the data for this comes from a study that's called the Monitoring the Future Study of Youth. This is a study that's been ongoing since 1976, collecting yearly data on um, students in schools, eighth, 10th, and 12th graders, um, sampled in a way that provides nationally representative rates. Uh, the, the 12th graders were um, first surveyed in 1976, and then 8th and 10th graders began to be surveyed in 1991. So when we look across time in the adolescence in terms of just alcohol use um, by sex, we see that overall, first of all, there's been a really noticeable decline from 1991 in the 8th graders to the most recent year, 2021. And we see that at the beginning of that period, the boys had higher rates than the girls did. They have the blue line that's on top. But by the end of the period in 2021, those rates had not only converged, but crossed over. So the girls had higher rates than boys did in the eighth graders. And then we see something pretty similar in the 10th graders. The boys started out with higher rates. There were a number of years where the rates basically were similar. And then in the most recent years, there were slightly higher rates in the girls than in the boys. And we see something again, somewhat similar for the 12th graders. Uh, the 12th graders started out with much higher rates in the boys than in the girls. Both groups went down over time in a quite pronounced way. But by the most recent years of the survey, um, the girls had higher rates than the boys. And you see something similar when you look at uh, trends in binge drinking and monitoring the future. This was, called, this was defined as five or more drinks in a row for both girls and boys. We see once again a decline over time, higher rates in the boys at the beginning, higher rates in girls at the end, uh, higher rates in the boys in the 10th grader with convergence by the end of the period, and um, a quite pronounced difference between girls and boys at uh, the beginning of the data collection period back in 1976, and a clear convergence over time in um, 
uh, the rates of girls and boys, mainly because the boys decreased at a much sharper rate than the girls did. What about past year marijuana use? Well, we see slightly different trends here. We don't see the same pronounced uh, and consistent uh, decrease over time. This is for eighth graders, but once again, we see some convergence and then crossing over in terms of rates in girls and boys. This is what we have for 10th graders. And this is what we have for uh, 12th graders. Uh, once again, higher in the boys at the beginning of the time period and um, by the end of the time period, convergence and um, even some crossover. Uh, time trends in daily marijuana use is a particular concern because uh, many studies have shown prospectively that this pattern of marijuana use in adolescents predicts a lot of adult problems. Um, in the eighth graders, we don't see we don't see a consistent decline over time, although there's some it, it, there's a bit of evidence that this is going down in the boys, maybe not in the girls with convergence by the end of the period. This is 10th graders. We see a lot of uh, male female differences throughout most of the study period, but some convergence towards the end. And uh, here we see that the boys outnumber the girls throughout the time period, but their rates are going down, whereas the girls are going up. And if this pattern continues across years, um, they're going to converge um, maybe in a few years. We just have to wait and see how the data come out. What about opioid use, non medical or prescription opioids? This is a big concern, too given um, the risk for overdoses and many other health problems related to misuse of, um, misuse of opi prescription opioids. So in the 10th graders, we see some declines over time with some evidence that the girls are starting to use more than the boys in the most recent years. In the 10th graders, we don't have that crossover, but we see that there's convergence over time in the more recent years. And we see, uh, once again, in the 12th graders, both groups declined, males and females, but the boys decreased more sharply than the females, and so their rates are approaching um, convergence. This is non-medical use of Vicodan, um, which also has opioids in it. We see similar patterns here to what we see we saw for oxycodone, uh, more in the boys than in the girls, but convergence. And once again, a much sharper decline in the 12th graders and the boys and the girls leading to conversions by the end of the period. So to summarize, there's been a clear downward trend in drinking and also in prescription opioid use over time with less clear cut time trends for marijuana use. But gender differences have largely converged, mainly because rates in the boys decreased much more sharply than girls. What about in adults? Well, I'm gonna turn now to adult data. In um, the two national surveys in 2001, 2002, and 2012, 2013 that I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, uh, it was shown that binge drinking increased overall in the sample pretty considerably, and that that increase was uh, sharper in women than it was in men. And this slide shows uh, similar results for DSM-4 alcohol use disorder in the last 12 months. Once again, we see an overall increase in the time between the two surveys, but we see a much sharper increase relative to where they started among the women than we see among the men. Now, this slide shows information from monitoring the future data. Um, this is not uh, data from students. This is data from 12th graders who agreed to be followed up longitudinally over time. And the monitoring the future study um, has done actually an amazing job of following up participants that first were evaluated in 12th grade and then um, kept in the study, some of them through the, the time in their 50s. So this slide is the two-week prevalence of binge drinking um, among participants whose modal age was between 19 and 30, so they were young adults by sex over time. And we see um, some evidence of decrease over time in the, the younger men, and we, we don't see that decrease in the women, so we have a, a somewhat convergence of rates over time in monitoring the future adults who were followed up in the panel study. And here's the, here's the same information for adults whose modal age at the time of their interviews were 35 to 50. So here we see sort of flatter lines, and we don't see this same evidence of convergence in the older adults. What about for marijuana use? 
Well, this slide shows marijuana use in the last 30 days uh, among people whose modal age at the time of their interview was 19 to 30. Here, unlike the alcohol, we see a clear trend upwards, and that's consistent with many other studies. So we see that uh, rates were going up in the younger men and in the younger women, and the rates of increase were somewhat sharper in the younger women, and it looks like they are starting to converge in the last couple of years. This is what we see um, in the uh, panel study of those whose modal age was 35 to 50. So we see increases again across time in both men and in women, and um, not, such, not such a pronounced trend towards convergence, but in the last couple of years, it's looked that way. And if these trends continue over time, then they will eventually uh, converge and that will, will, that will require some thought and evaluation as to what to do about it. I'm gonna talk just a little bit about time trends in older adults. Um, this is this shows past month binge drinking across five years of data in adults age 65 and older. This is from the NISDU survey, the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. And here you see what looks like uh, different trends in men and women, um, with men increasing and women decreasing. This is just over the last three years, however. Um, but what what is the meaning of this actually? Well, what we what we need to think about is not just the rates of those who were drinking by by sex, but also the actual count of them in the population. And we know that the older age group is increasing over time in the proportion, the representation in the overall population because the baby boomers are aging into this age group. So we see uh, across time, if we look at rates, for example, the percentage of people per 100, or per 1,000, so you have a, a rate of people who drank in the last 30 days, about half of men um, engaged in this drinking over time between 2002 and 2019. <clears throat> and among women, the rates increased from about 30% to about 40%. So there's a bit of a convergence there, but how does that translate into actual counts of people who are, are drinking? Um, well, what, was shown in that paper is that if you look at the overall numbers and thousands, there's quite a bit of an increase in males and in females. Um, and that's a concern, that's an issue because in older people, uh, drinking can interact with medication use or interfere with medication use. It can lead to other health problems, for example, falls and other types of um, issues that are really more of a concern and an issue among older individuals. Um, so to summarize the data and the findings from adults, uh, the rates of binge drinking and substance use are increasing over time, and the rates among men and women are converging largely in the case of adults because women are increasing at faster rates than men. So what are the implications of this? Well, we see some convergence uh, between men and women or girls and boys, both in the teens and in the adults. Um, and uh, although these patterns are getting played out somewhat differently, mapped across declines over time in adolescents and increases over time in adults, it's some concern because we see that while traditionally we've thought about um, substance use as maybe even largely a problem for boys and for men, that is really no longer the case. The, one can't make those assumptions and if these trends continue over time, we're gonna really have in this country much more substance use problems in girls and in women than we've had in the past. And the data are showing that that's already happening to some extent. So that suggests that we really need to think about what can be done to uh, prevent this type of increase in substance use among girls and among women. And then what types of interventions, either at the policy level, public education or in terms of individual interventions may be effective um, to uh, stem the convergence in rates between um, males and females and try to do good prevention in both genders. So I will end uh, by uh, showing you my contact information and uh, my support. Please contact me if you have any um, questions about this presentation. Great, thank you. And now please welcome uh, Dr. Freudenheim.
I'm sorry. Okay, um, I want to talk today about um, a somewhat different um, focus on alcohol. And it's, so we're not talking about substance use disorder, but rather alcohol intake in amounts that are much more, um, uh, might, might be considered light drinking. I'm gonna focus on alcohol and cancer and particularly on breast cancer. So um, as the previous speakers mentioned, um, what we think of as one drink is about 14 grams of pure alcohol, and that's the amount in 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of wine, or about one shot of distilled alcohol, still, um, hard liquor. Uh, and for women, heavy drinking is um, defined as four drinks in one day or eight drinks in a week. So there is consensus that among, from a large number of different organizations, the National Cancer Institute, the American Cancer Society, as well as these um, international organizations, IARC is the, um, the cancer focused research group for um, the World Health Organization. And there's consensus that alcohol is a carcinogen. That is a substance that is, causes cancer and that the evidence is that the more a person drinks, the higher the risk of cancer. This is a table showing for women, the number of um, cancer cases that can be attributed to alcohol. And what you see here is that the largest number of cases are for the lighter amounts of drinking. And that's not because the risk is greater, but because there are far more women in those categories. So for, um, women who drink on the order of about 10 um, uh, grams per day, so that's like two-thirds of a drink per day. There are about tw um, uh, 24,000 cases globally um, of alcohol-related uh, cancers. For those drinking 20 grams per day, the amount is about 30,000 additional deaths, or 18% of cancer cases. So overall, about a third of cancer cases in women can be attributed to alcohol, at least in part. So not all um, cancers are related to um, alcohol, but these are the ones that are um, most, uh, where there's the strongest evidence. There's other kinds of cancer where there's some evidence, but it's less consistent. Um, the increase in risk is on the order of about 20% um, to five times greater risk for moderate drinking, and that depends on the cancer site. For a head and neck and esophageal cancer, there's an interaction of smoking and alcohol. So that's, for, as um, was previous mentioned, it's two plus two is not equal to, is equal to five, or right? so a larger risk than the sum of the two. Um, for uh, so, and, and my focus here is gonna be on breast cancer. So as you see from this table, breast cancer accounts for 57% of alcohol-related um, cancers in among women. The, uh, uh, the pink here is, um, is breast cancer, red is esophageal cancer, and the yellow is uh, colon cancer. So those are the other cancers with a strong component coming from cancer, from alcohol. So globally, there are um, 2.26 million new cases of invasive breast cancer annually. So it's a large problem. 26% um, of all new cases among women can be attributed to alcohol. Um, and globally, 685,000 uh, deaths from breast cancer each year. 15% uh, of those cancer deaths um, among women can be attributed to alcohol. In the US, there are 268,000 new cases annually. 31% um, of those cases um, are attributed to alcohol. 42,000 approximately deaths annually and about 15% of cancer deaths among women in the US can be attributed to alcohol. So what we see here is a different percentage in the, um, the deaths attributed to alcohol for in the US compared to um, globally. And that has to do with differences in drinking uh, in the 
U.S. compared to globally, and also it has to do in, with differences in other risk factors, um, how important the other risk factors are in different parts of the world. But still we see, sorry, um, we see a, oh my goodness, why is that doing that? Sorry, we see a, um, a large percentage of, of both cancer cases and cancer deaths being attributed to alcohol. So alcohol, uh, sorry, breast cancer is a major problem. There's a one in eight chance in the lifetime of, um, for women in the US to develop breast cancer. And this is just looking at some of the differences in breast cancer um, by race ethnicity. What we see is that um, the rate of cancer, the incidence rate is highest among non-Hispanic white women, closely followed by non-Hispanic black women, lower rates for American Indian Alaska Natives, Hispanic Latinas and Asian Pacific Islanders. Um, but what we see is that the mortality rate is higher for non-Hispanic black women than non-Hispanic white women. Um, so this is a concern. It's an area, this kind of disparity in mortality in relation to incidence is an area for considerable research. So we know a fair amount about what causes breast cancer. Um, and many of those risk factors are things that can that women are unable to change. Um, so things like age or family history, um, their height, their endogenous, their, um, their own, own hormone levels are things that they are not able to change. There are modifiable risk factors. Some of them are listed here. And alcohol is an important one in as a modifiable risk factor for breast cancer. So, Overall, alcohol accounts for more than 39,000 breast cancer cases in the U.S. E each year. That's about 16% of all U.S. breast cancer cases. Um, it accounts for 98,000 cases per year uh, globally of um, breast cancer, and that's about 4% of 4.4% of the total cases, um, the total breast cancer cases around the world. So there's evidence that alcohol, there's a dose response that for even lighter drinkers, that alcohol increases the risk of breast cancer. And overall, what we see is about, sorry. Overall, what we see is about an increase of about 15% for each drink per day of consumption. And that for those who are in the category of moderate alcohol consumption, there's about a 30 to 50% increase in risk of breast cancer. This is a um, what's called a forest plot. It's showing overall what the um, various studies have shown. What you see here is this is more than a million women who've been followed, um, their alcohol intake was measured, and then whether or not they got breast cancer was followed. This is postmenopausal women in this particular slide. Um, what you see is that while there's some differences in the results that in general, you see an increase in risk of breast cancer among um, drinkers. This is the amount of increase in risk for 10 grams of alcohol. So that's about two thirds of a drink per day. And the um, overall here is, um, the, the in this red square, and there's about a 9% additional risk compared to non-drinkers in this study. So alcohol for al overall, alcohol has been categorized as a po probable risk of premenopausal breast cancer that has more to do with the, uh, not that the, the um, evidence is weaker, but has to do with the fact that the um, numbers of women who, or premenopausal who get breast cancer is smaller, um, but it's also categorized as a convincing cause of postmenopausal breast cancer. Um, and that's again, following more than a million women. Um, there's a risk increases, there's a dose um, response. The risk is increased even among lighter drinkers. Um, and overall, there's about a 15% increase in risk for each drink per day of consumption. 
So the next question is among women who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, does it impact their, their prognosis, whether or not they get alcohol, um, breast cancer again, whether or not they die from, alcohol, um, from breast cancer, whether they continue to drink? So alcohol consumption among breast cancer survivors is common. In the National Health In Information Survey, 55% of women who, it's, who reported having had breast cancer diagnosed reported that they were drinking, and 12.7% reported binge drinking. So there are a large number of women who are former breast, are breast cancer survivors who have been diagnosed with breast cancer. The, 10-year survival for breast cancer is at very strong at this point. 84% of women um, survive at least 10 years, and the mortality rate from breast cancer has decreased by 1.3% per year over the last um, 10 years or so. So in the U.S. at this point, there are 3.8 million women alive who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, and there are more than 7.9 um, women globally who are breast cancer survivors. So it's important to understand in this very large group whether additional alcohol, what impact alcohol has on their, um, their prognosis. Unfortunately, at this point, this is a new er newer area of research. The results are not consistent. Um, and that has to do with the number, for a number of reasons, there are differences in the different studies in terms of what time period was assessed for the alcohol. In some cases, the studies looked at alcohol um, consumption before diagnosis and then followed the women to see how they, um, they did. In other cases, they looked at um, at alcohol consumption after diagnosis. And it's important to understand that there could be lots of things that would affect alcohol drinking before, during, and after diagnosis. And that we don't really know in some of these studies whether the diagnosis affected the drinking rather than the drinking affecting the diagnosis. So if a woman has more severe cancer, perhaps she's more likely to um, reduce her alcohol consumption because both of her symptoms and also her concerns about her health overall. Um, so these are observational studies. It's difficult to impossible to do an intervention study. You could do an intervention study um, looking at reduction of alcohol. That's not been done. So these are the overall findings. Um, what we see is that like, and again, these are um, preliminary findings. There's not nearly the kind of um, uh, volume of, of results that we have for um, alcohol in terms of risk, but it looks like light drinking may decrease all-cause mortality. And that's because light drinking is associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, it, it improves cardiovascular disease outcomes and um, cardiovascular disease, among breast, women with breast cancer, cardiovascular disease is as important a um, source of mortality as breast cancer itself. It does look like light drinking may increase death from breast cancer and drinking intensity may be important. So not only the amount that a woman drinks, but the amount that she drinks per drinking occasion. So um, if you have seven drinks in a week, that's different if you drink it one drink per day than if you drink three or four drinks on two occasions. So there still is are many questions to be answered in terms of understanding the impact of alcohol and breast cancer. Um, we don't know whether if women change their alcohol consumption, if they can reduce their alcohol um, consumption, does that reduce their breast cancer risk? And how quickly does that happen? Most likely it does, that would be our assumption, but we don't have good evidence on that. Um, as I was just, uh, Summarizing the information on alcohol consumption and breast cancer survival, still there's much to be understood in terms of what kind of impact that has. And also, again, the effect of quitting and changing alcohol consumption after diagnosis. Um, what, imp what impact does that have on mortality outcomes is not well understood. Um, in most of the studies that have been done, there's a, just a single measure of alcohol consumption. And clearly there, um, if women are, living 
10 years or more, there may well be different changes in their alcohol consumption over that time period. But the guidelines from a number of different organizations, from the World Health Organization, from the CDC, from the NIH, from the American Cancer Society, for women in relation to breast cancer is that it's best not to drink, and for women who do drink, to limit consumption to no more than one drink per day. And these are some references, and thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you for that excellent presentation. If you have questions for Dr. Freudenheim, please add them in the Q&A box. Um, and uh, we'll also answer them at the Q&A at the end. Uh, now, please welcome Dr. Sinha. Thank you, uh, Dr. Chandar. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen first. Um, uh, let me see if I can move this. Okay, you can see my screen. Just gonna move that into presentation mode. All right, well, thanks again. I'm going to talk about the harmful effects, effects of alcohol and other substance use in women. And you've already heard uh, a very nice overview from both Dr. Kube and Dr. Wolkow. And so I'm just really gonna focus in on um, and what are the harmful effects? We'll review that very quickly. Why is it more harmful to women? The role of sex and stress steroid hormones in alcohol and substance use intake. How does binge use and regular use um, impact those stress and sex steroid hormones? And does it impact um, drug-related harmful effects? And then finally, a little bit about uh, treatment and treatment development and sex-specific treatment development. So. One of the key things is that um, there are massive uh, sex differences in, in brain anatomy, structure and function. Uh, drugs and alcohol um, have different pharmacokinetics and physiologic effects in women than uh, compared to men. Uh, females generally experience higher levels of intoxication on the same dose of various agents and have variations in response based on the menstrual cycle. And so we'll be talking about the estrous cycle um, in animals and in humans. And then sex steroid hormones play an important role in the subjective and behavioral effects of drugs of abuse. And we'll uh, talk a little bit about that um, in, in a, a little bit more uh, detail. And so um, if you think about now the alcohol uh, harmful effects, uh, Dr. Kub reviewed this very uh, nicely, but just again, pharmacokinetics, women achieve greater BALs, higher intoxication for the same amount. They also have lower levels of first pass metabolism due to the gastric enzyme for that breaks down alcohol. The medical consequences are much greater in women. We see higher levels of alcohol-related liver disease, cardiomyopathies, alcohol-related brain atrophy. You just heard about breast cancer, also alcohol, other alcohol-related cancers, sedative effects, um, and then, of course, the impact on the fetus and offspring, which uh, we know a lot about FAS, but what about perinatal uh, effects in the, in the offspring? Um, alcohol use disorders um, in terms of comorbidity are higher in women, psychiatric comorbidity, especially things like mood anxiety, mood disorders, anxiety disorders, and PTSD, and um, the phenomena of telescoping as well. I will cover pharmacotherapy effects uh, later in the talk, so I'm going to skip that here um, and go into nicotine's harmful effects in sex differences. Again, pharmacokinetics are different in women versus men. Women metabolize it more quickly due to higher act actions of enzymes like the CYP2A6, the nicotine metabolizing enzyme, the medical consequences of um, uh, chronic nicotine use are greater in women compared to men. Some of that is listed here things like risk for coronary artery disease, lung disease, health problems relating to obesity, menstrual cycle related effects uh, on nicotine withdrawal, sexual dysfunction, and again, uh, impact on fetus and offspring. Um, comorbidity has been noted to be higher in women compared to men. And again, this is psychiatric comorbidity as well as the medical comorbidity I just re reviewed. Uh, same illnesses, mood, anxiety, and PTSD. Um, and higher rates of treatment failure 
particularly with nicotine. Uh, and we will talk about the pharmacotherapy effects very briefly, and you will hear more about them later in the conference as well. But there are sex differences in the effects of the treatments that are available for uh, nicotine uh, misuse. Women show low benefit, for example, of NRT, but higher uh, NRT side effects. They do have higher efficacy of bupropion and better short-term smoking cessation outcomes in women uh, than men. Um, so the next drug is heroin that I wanna discuss. You heard a little bit about this from Dr. Volka, distribution volume of opioids is higher uh, in women than men, um, but limited data on pharmacokinetics. Uh, medical consequences, of course, you see the spike in overdose risk that you just saw from Dr. Volka's talk, but also things like women are at higher risk for hepatitis C virus, uh, HIV infections, a higher risk of mortality, overdoses um, and sexual dysfunctions, as well as impact on offspring. Again, the comorbidity effects are, are greater in women compared to men, um, and the women have higher rates of sexual trauma in, in those with opioid use disorder. And there are pharmacotherapy uh, different sex differences as well. Women have higher blood levels of buprenorphine after equivalent doses, greater naltrexone side effects, and lower methadone-related QTC prolongation. So what about cocaine? There are no sex differences in pharmacokinetics, but data are limited. However, menstrual cycle effects are, um, are and sex hormone effects potently impact uh, drug effects. Women show lower uh, duration of uh, cardiovascular effects and lower risk of uh, severe cerebrovascular accidents, but have a higher risk of mortality. And we don't understand that, uh, why that is greater injuries and violent behaviors in women. They have a shorter time from cocaine use onset to mortality outcome, greater sexual dysfunction. Again, the same uh, psychiatric comorbidities are there uh, with cocaine use disorder in women, higher rates in women um, than men. And of course, there are no pharmacotherapies that are FDA approved for cocaine. So we will um, skip that, but I will mention disulfiram later in the talk. Uh, going to cannabis, and you heard that cannabis rates are increasing, particularly in the young adult group. And um, these pharmacokinetics are not well studied, although you did hear that the CB1 receptor, the endocannabinoid receptor, there's higher number of receptors in males compared to females. Um, and there, so there are sex differences there. And there are likely sex differences in adolescent brain development and cannabis' effects on regional brain volume particularly what has been reported is change differences in the amygdala and prefrontal cortex um, relating to uh, cannabis use. And women progress more quickly from onset to dependence and in time to seeking uh, treatment, the telescoping effect, that's true for cannabis use disorder as well. And women show an earlier age of onset of psychotic symptoms and illnesses associated with uh, cannabis use disorder for those who have risk of that. Again, no pharmacotherapy has been FDA approved for cannabis use disorder, uh, and so we won't cover um, that. So why are women um, more, more susceptible to the harmful effects of alcohol and substance use? And what are the role of sex and stress steroids um, in, in this context? So here's just a very quick uh, slide to review the menstrual cycle. Um, and here's the rat, the rodent menstrual cycle and the human menstrual cycle, of course, ours is longer, much, much longer. We have two peaks for estradiol uh, and one a major one for, uh, for progesterone, a little bit different than the rodent one. And I point this out because we really need the human studies in addition to the animal studies, because in fact, when we look at sex steroid hormones and their effects, they may not be equivalent um, in terms of uh, translation from uh, animals to human studies. Um, so what about uh, sex steroid hormones and their interactions with alcohol and substance use? Alcohol increases estradiol, binge use alters the E2 receptor signaling, the estradiol 2 receptor signaling, higher levels promote alcohol intake um, and PMS related negative affect, which is related to uh, estrogen uh, changes uh, may increase uh, in alcohol intake as well. In nicotine, estradiol is necessary for nicotine intake initiation, enhance effects of cues during the follicular phase, so women are more sensitive to nicotine cues, estradiol mediates stress effects on relapse, 
This has been shown in animal studies and progesterone reduces subjective nicotine effects and lowers craving in luteal phase. Um, opiates, estradiol enhances intake and motivation. Otherwise, this has not been well studied. In cocaine, estradiol enhances intake, motivation, drug-induced reinstatement, or ovarectomy, attenuates self-administration, and progesterone decreases stress and uh, Q-induced craving. And in cannabis, this has not been well studied, although ovarectomy decreases Q-induced um, reinstatement. So let's talk about stress. You heard from Dr. Volkow, stress is a major, major factor in use of uh, drug use, escalation of drug use, and also in relapse and uh, treatment failure when people do seek treatment. Women are more likely to use drugs to cope with stress, trauma, and victimization and negative affect, and men may have a greater vulnerability towards the positive mood effects. And then among substance using individuals, women relapse often in the context of stress and negative affect while men may have more um, susceptibility to drugs and drug-related um, uh, situations. Um, so these are, you saw some nice data from Dr. Volkow on methylphenidate effects. Um, and here I'm showing you older data, but sex differences in striatal, striatal dopamine release in response to araclopride using the same methodology that Dr. Volkow was talking about, uh, positive positron emission tomography. And this is in healthy and nicotine smoking adults. Um, what you see there is the uh, dorsal striatum um, and the ventral striatum, and um, that the number of um, activated voxels are much lower in females here uh, compared to males. So sex differences in a critical reward pathway and in dopamine, um, particularly, which is activated by all of the drugs of abuse. But dopamine is not the only um, um, neurochemical that uh, drugs of abuse stimulate. And here, what you're seeing is beautiful summarized data by uh, Nancy Mello and colleagues showing that in fact, drugs, in this case, nicotine, as you start smoking in the gray bar there, there's uh, activation of, the, of ACTH and rises of ACTH, particularly with high nicotine uh, cigarettes rises in cortisol, epinephrine, DHEA. So sex steroids as well as stress steroid hormones are being activated acutely um, by drugs of abuse. And there are changes as a result of uh, chronic use. And what do I mean by that? Here are data that we published now quite uh, some time ago showing ACTH levels um, in response to stress in um, women who have uh, were using cocaine and alcohol, and there's a gender main effect overall, women have high, lower, um, lower levels of ACTH compared to men, but that difference is really coming a lot from uh, the interaction with drugs of abuse. So greater levels in, in uh, men, uh, cocaine uh, uh, dependent uh, men compared to uh, cocaine dependent women. What about, uh, Cortisol, cortisol as well. We have a gender main effect, lower levels of uh, cortisol in women compared to men, and that same trend in cocaine um, uh, women versus uh, men for uh, cortisol. And then the reverse for norepinephrine. So thinking about the autonomic nervous system, we have females showing greater uh, autonomic responsivity compared to healthy females in uh, with stress in um, among the cocaine use disorder compared to uh, men. These are data that are uh, under revision, but you don't have to be a neuroscientist. This is functional MRI data where we expose people to stress and to drug cues. And these are individuals with substance use disorder, alcohol and cocaine and uh, cannabis use disorder. And we see that under drug conditions, greater striatal activation in men that predicts later relapse. Whereas in women, that is completely different, it's not the striatal regions, it's the lateral um, uh, frontal, inferior frontal gyrus, but blunted responding under drug conditions that predicts greater drug use here. Uh, these are days to relapse, I'm sorry, these are days to relapse here on the y-axis and, and on the x-axis is the, is, the, um, is the activation. And the more blunted they are uh, right here, the greater um, their risk of relapse. And then under stress condition, we see a blunted prefrontal cortex 
predicting greater uh, days of, of uh, any drug use in the 90 day period. This is a prospective study and uh, quite dramatic differences in what is predicting relapse and use uh, in the future for men compared to women. And then um, as we look at, um, think about treatment, I just wanna end with uh, sex specific treatment development. There's a need really if the biology is different, if we're talk, focusing on the differences in, in harmful effects, but also relating to sex steroids and to stress, uh, steroid hormones, as well as to uh, dopamine and reward uh, uh, differences by gender, um, wouldn't it be important then to think about the fact that our treatment should be uh, sex specific as well? And biology clearly indicates addiction pathophysiology and stress reward. I did not talk about immune pathways in, in the interest of time, but those are all highly sex specific. So the promise, if we did uh, took the sex specific uh, approach, the promise would be that we would actually tailor treatments. We would know which treatments work for men and women and develop them specifically for each gender. Um, medications for nicotine dependence show sex differences. I already mentioned the differences in nicotine patch and bupropion. Um, I will show you something on naltrexone in a minute. And disulfiram, while we don't have a, a FDA approved treatment for cocaine dependence, disulfiram was shown to um, uh, improve uh, cocaine use outcomes, but there were significant sex differences there. And medications for opioids have not been looked at. I'll just show you one uh, dramatic data, and naltrexone or Vivitrol has been shown to be efficacious in the treatment of alcohol use disorder. What you see here is pre-treatment levels of uh, heavy drinking, and then the placebo in the light gray, and then naltrexone at the two doses for overall for men and women. And what we want to show you really is um, that for uh, women, for men, there's a nice reduction uh, based on dose right here, but for women, there is no difference, no significant effects. It was in fact a, a treatment by gender interaction here. So, um, and we don't know about Vivitrol for opioid use disorder, which in fact it is being used for opioid use disorder, but are there significant sex differences? This has not been um, assessed fully. Uh, I just want to end with our own data sh with uh, an agent called guanfacin, which is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. Um, it, it targets the adrenergic pathways and changes sympathetic nervous system as well as affects the HPA axis. And we did a laboratory study doing chronic treatment with guanfacin in males and females, what you see here in cocaine craving. These are individuals with cocaine use disorder. And in men, um, guanfacin did in fact made craving worse, but in women you see an effect of craving and anxiety overall. There was a guanfacin reduced anxiety and uh, stroop performance got better in women uh, right here on guanfacin compared to placebo, but did not affect uh, men and stroop performance is an indicator of prefrontal function, self-control. And so this started to tell us that in fact, uh, guanfacin might have more preferential effects, benefits, for women compared to men and studying it together is going to reduce our ability to really understand its effects and to target people who could benefit from it. Uh, we have just completed a guanfacine versus placebo um, study and we are, we are uh, uh, looking at the data now, but I just wanna show you, don't believe uh, only the summary slides, I'm gonna show you data on this is trauma and pain levels in women with sub poly substance use disorder, which was our, uh, target uh, group here. And that, there's the demographics right there. Uh, but what I wanted to highlight is just the high levels of substance use. And when you look at uh, what Dr. Volkow was talking about with opioid overdose, we have you really have to think about how much other drug use is also going on to so perhaps to, uh, to normalize their system, to uh, regulate negative affect and trauma and high levels of trauma here. Um, if you look at just the 6.2 6, uh, mean uh, levels of uh, traumatic events, 63% have a history of self-harm, 74% are reporting sexual abuse and early trauma, uh, high levels of legal um, issues and interpersonal stress and trauma. This would be domestic violence, uh, relational trauma and things like that, and high levels of pain. This is the chronic pain um, threshold of four or more for chronic pain. And the mean score here is 
is for. And so I want to end with this saying that when we are seeing this profile among women with, with polysubstance use disorder, how can we not target treatments that are in fact um, really helpful to address some of the pathophysiology related to stress and, and uh, chronic drug use interactions. So with that, let me just go ahead and, and end that I've shown you and touched on the fact that women show greater sensitivity to the rewarding effects of alcohol and drugs. There's significant sex differences in the pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, greater overall medical morbidity and health consequences. There's differences in drug effects. There's um, that are linked to sex steroid hormones, their receptors and sex specific effects are there on the stress pathways um, that may mediate harmful effects in women and girls. Uh, women are at higher risk of violent victimization, sexual abuse, trauma related effects uh, that interact with drug use and abuse. I showed you some of that data from our own um, uh, treatment study that we are now looking at whether we can um, see guanfacine effects on, um, on uh, both drug use outcomes, but also their mood and anxiety. And then finally, alcohol and substance use disorder treatments show sex specific effects. And so it's imperative that treatment development targets needs uh, to be specific for women to reduce the harmful effects in women. So with that, I wanna thank my team here at the Yale Stress Center um, and the NIH for supporting all of our work uh, over the years, years. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that excellent presentation. Um, if you all have questions for Dr. Sinha, please do add them in the Q&A box. Um, and now I'd like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Dr. Partha Sarathi, um, who will be, who's up next? Okay. Um... Can everybody see my screen? Just need to swap displays. Go to display settings yeah. in the top. Yeah, I'm just going to do that. Yeah, okay. Okay. So I just wanted to say thank you um, to the organizers for including me in this conference. And I'm very honored to present uh, my research uh, focusing on the disparities in the receipt of alcohol brief intervention treatment, uh, the intersectionality of sex, age, and race, and ethnicity. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors at the Division of Research, um, Kaiser Permanent in Northern California. And I would also like to thank NIAAA for funding this research. So I'm not gonna go much into the um, alcohol consumption background because I think um, everybody uh, has spoken earlier. Um, I just wanted to say that um, there are important um, uh, underlying these trends. Uh, there are important complex interplay between age, race, and um, race ethnicity. So for example, whereas boys tend to initiate earlier, girls tend to have heavy episodic drinking sooner. Women over the age of 30 are drinking more heavily compared to men. And white, women are more, uh, white men are more likely to be heavy drinkers compared to black men but such differences do not exist among women. Um, so coming to treatment, um, alcohol screening and brief intervention is in adult primary care is an evidence-based population health approach to reduce at-risk drinking. Um, brief intervention provides an important opportunity to reach women because they are, as you heard, they are much li uh, less likely to enter treatment, uh, specialty treatment, Women are also more likely to have regular primary care visits and brief intervention provides an opportunity to reach the women who are drinking beyond recommended limits. Um, and as with consumption, um, brief intervention rates also show significant differences by age, race, ethnicity, and sex. Um, and there, are, there isn't much research examining differences by gender and brief intervention. Um, So um, the work I'm describing today is set in Kaiser Permanente, Northern California, a large not-for-profit not integrated healthcare system, which serves about a third of the population of the Northern California region. Um, it is diverse geographically and covers urban, rural, and suburban areas. Uh, it's, the population is socioeconomically and racially and ethnically diverse and reflects um, the US population with access to care. 
The Kaiser Permanente is a carved-in system in that the majority of members have direct access to specialty addiction, med addiction medicine and uh, psychiatric services. So to give a context to this um, research, uh, the data I'm using here comes from a large-scale alcohol screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment uh, initiative or SBIRT initiative that was implemented in our system beginning in mid-2013. Uh, in the workflow adopted by the health system, medical assistants screen patients using NIAAA's evidence-based screening questions as part of the rooming process when they are weighing you or taking your blood pressure. The patient's answers are then displayed in the EHR or the electronic health record for the primary care physician, who then provides brief intervention, including referral to specialty care as needed. So um, here is uh, the alcohol as a vital um, sign initiative at a glance. Um, so you can see that the top rows reflect the actual number of screenings conducted and the bottom rows um, show uh, the number of patients who are screened. So close to half a million uh, patients have received a brief intervention between 2013 to 2022. So the research aim of my talk is uh, to examine receipt of brief intervention by age, uh, by sex, age, and race, ethnicity, and the intersectionality uh, between um, and their intersectionality, accounting for heterogeneity of effects and the role of systemic disparities in access and outcomes in co incorporating important patient characteristics. That was a mouthful. Anyway, so the data primarily comes from our screening and brief intervention, um, alcohol as a vital sign initiative and uh, EHR based um, data, which has um, patient characteristics and other um, comorbidity and so on. So here is a strobe diagram and strobe stands for um, strengthening reporting of observation studies in epidemiology. So you can see that there were about um, slightly less than half a million patients who were screened between 2014 to 17. And included in the study were patients um, uh, I mean, excluded from the study were patients who did not have a continuous membership in the year prior to intake, and those who were um, less than 18 years of age. And we further excluded um, the, uh, patients and providers who had missing data on uh, certain characteristics that were included in our model. So our final sample consists of approximately 287,000 patients. Uh, and these are some of the measures. I'm not going to go over them. Um, yeah, I can pass on the slides to you later. Um, so we just include demographics and you know insurance and prior health care and comorbidities and so on. And for providers, we, we included that age, gender, race, ethnicity, years of service, and specialty and where they work. Uh, so the statistical modeling approach we used was a random intercept model uh, to model the probability of receiving a brief intervention. This accounts for clustering of patients within providers, and it adjusts for medical facility as a fixed effect. Um, we conducted a series of logistic regression models examining uh, gender, um, sex by race, sex by age, and sex by drinking levels. And for each model, we, um, uh, we determine the odds ratio and the 95% confidence interval. Uh, across level for uh, for each sex group and then comparison between sex across levels. So here's a summary of the findings. Um, so, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so looking at this um, slide, um, so you can see that, for example, most of our patients were male and predominantly white. The average age was approximately 46 years women were less likely to smoke, whereas they were more likely to have a mental health diagnosis. Women were also uh, more likely to report exceeding weekly limits, um, weekly drinking limits, whereas men were more likely to expo um, report exceeding daily limits only. Um, coming to provider characteristics, the majority of our providers were female, predominantly Asian, um, Native Islander or Pacific Islander or white and majority were in the 35 to 49 age group uh, with at least um, six years of service. So looking at brief intervention um, rates by age, uh, we, we compared um, first uh, among men and women. 
uh, you can see that um, women were less uh, likely to receive, um, sorry, um, uh, among women, those between the ages of 35 and 64, you can see were less likely to receive BI than younger women. And among men, those aged 66 and over were less likely to receive brief intervention. Uh, it may be that women in the 35 to um, 50 age group are, um, or you know, even 34 age group are busy raising families, and maybe um, that could be an explanation. And uh, with regards to men, um, there is a change in the drinking guidelines uh, when men turn uh, 65, so maybe the men are not aware of it or the providers are not aware of this um, change, and that may be a possible explanation for the lower rates of BI. Um, so in direct comparison between men and women, we see that women are less likely to receive brief intervention across all age groups. Um, coming to brief intervention um, rates by uh, race ethnicity, we look at, um, we see that Asian and Pacific Islander women were more likely to receive BI and black and Hispanic women were less likely to receive brief intervention compared to white women. Um, and Asian, and, and it's true for uh, Asian um, and Pacific Islander men as well. But unlike women, there was no difference in the receipt of brief intervention between black and white men. Uh, now coming to the direct comparison, we see that again, women were less likely to receive brief intervention across all race ethnicity groups. Um, next, we examined uh, receipt of brief intervention by drinking level. So men and women who exceeded both weekly and daily limits had higher odds of receiving BI than those who exceeded weekly only limits or daily only limits. Um, so that's reassuring. Uh, now coming to the comparison between men and women, uh, we see that women again um, were less likely to receive a uh, brief uh, intervention across all um, drinking levels. So um, the limitations of the study are obviously it's based on EHR data, which is self-report. And so there may be some social disability bias and maybe under-reporting. And the other limitation is, of course, yeah, you know, the generalizability, although we would like to say in our defense that um, Kaiser Permanente does represent the geographic region um, and um, it has a size of a market share. So, so to summarize our findings, um, compared to men, women were less likely to receive brief intervention across all age, race, ethnicity groups and drinking level. Um, this may be because women were less likely to repeat uh, report drinking behaviors at a level which physician feels merit uh, a BI or there may be other competing clinical factors which take precedence during a women's medical appointment. Black women were less likely to receive brief intervention than white women, but this difference was not found among men. Latina Hispanic women had the lowest odds of receiving brief intervention. The interaction of uh, sex and age was most pronounced in the middle age group. Um, uh, that is middle aged women uh, reporting unhealthy use were much likely to receive brief intervention and older men were less likely to receive brief intervention than young women. And uh, I alluded to some of the reasons why this might be so. Our finding that women who exceeded both daily and weekly limits had greater odds of receiving brief intervention than those exceeding either weekly only or daily only limits is somewhat reassuring and in line with um, earlier research. So some of uh, the implications that female, um, uh, you know, based on what we observe on the provider side is female clinic, uh, clinicians versus male and those with longer tenure uh, versus shorter were more likely to deliver BI. Um, so clearly training and experience matters. Um, black and Latino clinicians versus white were less likely to deliver BI. Um, this is something that um, needs further research and wanting, and maybe um, the findings reflect some um, differences in communication style, which may affect provider comfort level in screening for use and delivering BI. Um, clearly, more research is needed to explore the cause of these differences, including um, institutional and systemic factors. 
that can help guide development of targeted clinical training and enhance brief intervention important tools such as scripts and other um, clinical decision support tools. Um, robust delivery, uh, delivery of brief intervention may help women avoid more severe alcohol problem use and increase clinician awareness and training about the importance of BIs for women and unhealthy alcohol use. So um, oh, once, I mean, what I would like to propose or suggest is that uh, we actually need to use a multi-pronged approach to address, to address disparities. For example, from the organization um, perspective, we may need to um, um, reach out to inform patients of available resources. And these can include things like secure messaging and um, you know, other uh, video appointments or um, if there's any child care providers and so on. Um, and from the patient side, we actually need to empower and activate patients so that they are actually able to access these resources. Um, this may include, you know, um, training in how to access a secure message, how to communicate with providers and so on. And on the provider side, we may need targeted clinician training to address hazard of drinking among women and also reinforce the efficacy uh, and evidence-based um, uh, effectiveness of um, providing brief interventions. And um, lastly, we may require um, different strategies for framing the brief uh, delivery of brief intervention, which may increase its delivery and acceptance. And as you saw in earlier talks, you know, um, the risk of fall or the risk of cancer is higher among, um, you know, women who drink. And this may be a, you know, context in which you can frame the brief intervention so that, you um, lower the stigma and make it more acceptable to women. Um, so to conclude, a brief intervention in primary care, um, as, uh, as it gains momentum, it is imperative that it reaches all individuals in need without regard to sex, age, or a, 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 age differences. And policies that ad ad address disparities in the receipt of brief intervention are critical to ensure equitable access to this important preventive service. And thank you. And if you have any questions, please do not uh, hesitate to reach out to me now or after the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, sharing. now, okay. thank you for our final presentation. Uh, prior to the Q&A session, we welcome um, Reverend Dr. English. Thank you. Thank you for the um, invitation to participate in today's discussion. For today's talk, I will discuss my experience in building community partnerships to improve public health, especially in resource limited settings, and the importance of including a focus on spiritual health in such partnerships. So I'm proud to serve as the director of the Partnership Center at Health and Human Services. We have prioritized five core focus areas that align with Secretary Becerra's priorities. And they are maternal health, knowing that the U.S. has one of the highest maternal mortality rate than any other developed nation in the world, behavioral and mental health, with particular focus on youth mental health. Uh, we'll be releasing our first youth mental health toolkit this year. In addition, we focus on suicide prevention. Of course, we have our continued work around vaccination and boosters. And last but absolutely not least, which is what brings us here today, I'll focus on substance use disorder inclusive of overdose prevention. We have released our revised faith and community roadmap to recovery support toolkit in both English and Spanish this year, and have been able to get into the hands of many of our stakeholders. As a center, we work to identify resources from grants to non-monetary resources to strengthen the work of national regional and local faith-based and community-based organizations throughout our nation. <clears throat> we support them through creating connections with like-minded organizations and government agencies, as well as help them think of creative ways, new avenues to improve or strengthen their processes and desired end goals. And before coming to the Partnership Center and prior to working as the Deputy Director of Faith-Based Initiatives for the Governor of New York State, in New York City, a large portion of my work was in building coalitions that address the atrocities we face as a city. And before I go further, I wanna just take a step back to help you understand what helped me realize the need to build community partnerships and using the faith-based community as an anchor. 
For me, it was personal. I lived in a house that lived by one of the worst statements that have been embraced by families everywhere, and particularly in our communities. And that is what goes on in the house stays in the house. Some things needed to come out of the house. Um, and if we allow those things to come out of the house, our family could have received the help they needed, then perhaps some of the issues would have been less severe or non-existent. Substance abuse and alcoholism were at the core and due in part to stigma surrounding mental health. Obviously the social determinants of health and lack of services, they all contributed to that. My brother died in 1992, opioids, um, heroin addiction, full-blown AIDS, um, three sisters addicted to crack cocaine, now these three sisters no longer are addicted to crack, but the lack of access to care, lack of knowledge, and more importantly, the stigma that was and is associated with seeking mental health care contributed to their ongoing struggles with substance use disorder. Yet they contribute getting clean uh, to their faith, prayers, and being sick and tired of the life. Uh, spirituality played a key role in their recovery. And there is overwhelming evidence that persons receiving mental health services, including addiction services, view spirituality as essential to recovery. And a number of researchers have emphasized the need for clinicians to give more attention to client spiritual needs. Present findings also suggest that spirituality, religious practices, and life meaning increase moderately as recovery progresses. A handful of previous reports have indicated that spirituality increases from pre to post recovery. My older brother was the person you saw pushing the shopping cart down the street, matted hair and garbage in the cart, stemming from substance use disorder and mental health issues. He is no longer with us. Again, we kept things in the house. But what was missing was connectedness in community and family, collaboration, the faith community, there was such a strong disconnect between faith and science. So when you ask me about services, I would have to ask what services were us growing up in Spanish Harlem was almost non-existent or non-accessible, indeed considered a resource limited area. So for my first example, I wanna start at the point I heard of the alarming rates of human trafficking in New York City among women and girls and the suffering of victims from mental illness and substance use disorder and suicide attempt. And then the number of children that were victims, all disheartening. But it was important to bring together all sectors of city government, a department of health, immigrant services, even the New York Police Department, service providers, community leaders, survivors, and the faith community together at the table in the planning stages of addressing these atrocities. And all played a key role in developing a proposal that eventually yielded a million dollars in funding to address human trafficking in New York City, even changing the name of the existing office to include addressing human trafficking, but more importantly, connecting victims and survivors to needed services. And the key to success came from listening, which I consider the most effective means of communication and recognizing one another's strength at the table, our voices and the power of collaboration. The faith community was key as it is the first entry point for many that are suffering. We also found that we have the widest reach. So what did we do? We promoted connectedness among members of communities. We built alliance with local organizations and with government. We identified resources and what connecting to services look like. We ended up funding a center that partnered and was housed within a local hospital where they provided services for traffic victims. Again, collaboration. We created strong awareness campaigns in partnership with community and government that was promoted throughout communities of faith. Because disconnect comes when you don't understand the language of faith, thereby messaging becomes less effective. We embrace cultural differences and intentionally looked at the situation through each other lenses and not just our own. My next example at the Partnership Center, an underserved rural population, we have worked with an organization called Team Challenge and other programs like it to encourage the use of medical assisted treatment in more recovery settings. Many of these and other faith-based programs like them actively promote the spiritual health of their clients as a mode of treatment 
and their engagement with MAT treatment methodologies empower stronger collaboration with other treatment providers. This in turn has been highlighted on federal webinars and we have encouraged connection to state and local treatment systems. Furthermore, many adult and teen challenge program work in and work closely with individuals from rural communities where the shared, in this case, Christian faith tradition allows for a population to connect with substance use treatment. They and their loved ones trust and participate in more fully because of the shared trust, operative word trust. And this is true for other faith communities working in this field. Programs that approach substance use disorder from the community and faith as opposed to a strictly medical clinical framework is where success lies. And it's important to share what the science is learning about addiction and take steps to translate that science for other treatment settings so that, so those programs draw in what works and what keeps people alive while also allowing them to keep what makes their programs effective for a distinct part of the population being served. Next, for women, including women from more rural settings, we work with the program called Unshattered. This program, which is highlighted in our Faith and Community Roadmap to Recovery Support Guide, supports women who have struggled with SUD, with employment, but also a community of support for their ongoing recovery. The Partnership Center has highlighted their efforts in various ways beyond the guide, with their involvement in meetings, White House events, and policy meetings. And my final example for today is Choose Healthy Life, CHL. Founded by Deborah Frazier House, it's a black church initiative that ensures churches, the oldest and most trusted institutions in the black community, receive the necessary resources, training and support to address COVID-19 and to deliver preventative wellness programs. They now have expanded to other help to, uh, to address other health disparities, inclusive of mental health and substance use disorders, diabetes, to name a few. As an example, CHL established a network of 50 black churches in five major cities and grew to 120 churches across 13 states. The success of the program is centered around the leadership of the Black clergy and the establishment of a faith-based community health workforce in the church. In its first year, CHL hosted over 2,500 events, administered nearly 100,000 COVID-19 tests and vaccination through its churches. Their goal is to collaborate with local healthcare organization with the vested interest in providing support to underserved communities and to deliver measurable and sustainable impact that drives health equity and work to see a decrease in morbidity and mortality in the community served. They have developed a proven sustainable and scalable model to address health equity in the Black community through the Black church. This model can be used as we think of ways of effectively addressing alcohol and substance use among women and girls. In my conclusion, we must realize faith is important to many individuals in underserved and rural communities. It is a source of strength for them and their families. It is a source of authority and influence in their lives. Listening and engaging with this community can begin with something as simple as including questions about faith and spirituality in an initial assessment with a client or an individual being served. Also consider from the clinical side that SAMHSA points to spiritual health as one of the eight elements of wellness, which they connect to questions of meaning and purpose. These are all elements that can draw from, connect to, and relate to faith communities and the leaders of these faith communities. Finally, I want you to take a look at this very short video produced by the Partnership Center of how trusted messengers with lived experiences from the faith community came together to address stigma around mental health and promoted health and human services, 988 Suicide Prevention Lifeline, as just one example. Thank you. I grew up with one of the most um, horrific statements that can be made in anybody's household. And that was, what goes on in the house stays in the house. And for me, and as a black family, that nearly destroyed us. 
And it wasn't long after that, my nephew, 14 years old, hung himself. It wasn't long after that when you found my brother pushing a shopping cart in the middle of the street. Yeah, he was that one. I'm the father of a suicide victim. My daughter was my only child. She was my heart. And she took her life. If there had been a helpline in that hour of crisis, it could have made a difference. I've personally had to uh, receive mental health and assistance. I've had family members uh, who've received mental health, who thought about suicide. The significant number of folks who are attempting suicide, who have suicided, are young people between the ages of 13 and 19. I have a friend who was very spiritual, loved the Lord, and who took her life. And the biggest problem was at the funeral, all of us knew it, and no one could talk about it. Growing up in a family of 15, I really do know what it means when individuals would say that what goes on in the home stay in the home because that's the way our parents really raised us. Too many people are experiencing suicidal crisis or mental health related distress without the support and care they need. There is hope. The Lifeline works. It helps thousands of people overcome crisis situations every day. The 988 dialing code is just the first step towards strengthening and transforming crisis care in this country. It serves as a universal entry point so that no matter where you live, you can reach a trained crisis counselor who can help. 988 offers 24-7 access to trained crisis counselors who can help people experiencing suicidal, substance abuse, and other mental health crises. To reach the Lifeline, people can call or text 988 or chat 988lifeline.org. 988 is more than just an easy to remember number. It's a direct connection to compassionate, accessible care and support for anyone experiencing mental health related distress. But we're at a moment in time now where we have to indeed break that cycle and be open to a number of things that are happening in our families, especially in the black church. You may be the person that stands between them that ultimate irreversible decision. Thank you for calling the Lifeline. How may I help you? Thank you very much. Um, and thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I now invite the panelists to uh, turn on their cameras and we will begin our question and answer session. Um, please do uh, post questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, I will actually start with a question that came up um, uh, for Dr. Freidenheim, which is, um, you know, in your talk, you mentioned that the risk of breast cancer is increased even for women who drink as little as one drink per day. Uh, what, uh, what is sort of the pathophysiology or what might the biological effect of that small amount um, of alcohol, what's the cause, you know, for a disease like breast cancer? So Dr. Sinha spoke a, a fair amount about how alcohol can affect um, steroid hormones. Uh, there's a change, there's an increase in um, estrogen levels in the blood uh, shortly after any a single alcoholic beverage and also over time with um, increased drinking, you see a, a chronic effect of alcohol on steroid hormone levels. And steroid hormone, hormone levels are um, strongly associated with risk of breast cancer. And in addition, alcohol has other effects that um, seem to, uh, that probably also increase the risk of, of breast cancer, um, oxidative stress, um, inflammation, all of the pathways that are important for cancer are influenced adversely by alcohol. Uh, thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Reverend Dr. English, what are some ways that we can improve access to mental health and substance use care in our community? Oh, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I keep forgetting about that mute button. 
Um, but I, I have a, several uh, uh, recommendations. One is intentionally partner with trusted messengers in the community from both faith and nonprofit communities. Um, look for those um, who have lived experience, uh, who can elevate your message through PSA and, and other means. Faith, voice, faith voices and messaging is critical to reach this population. Um, have these partners at the table early in discussions before rolling out a master plan. Creating buy-in and ownership go a long way. Um, search out existing entities that have um, existing health ministries and or coalitions to partner with and work to increase workforce with culturally competent and perhaps religious competent individuals. Um, lastly, take time to meet with faith community that have proven models such as CHL founders and members, glean and implement as you move toward reducing alcohol and other substance use among women and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Um, a question for uh, Dr. Sinha. Does uh, chronic drug use alter the gonad gonadal hormone levels? Um, and uh, could that be involved in greater risk of alcohol and other substance use related illnesses? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, we need uh, more research on it. We did some work, uh, now it's over 10 years old, uh, where we monitored um, a daily uh, saliva, uh, sex steroid hormones for t over 28 days in our poly substance using uh, women and showed um, changes. And this was during, in, they were in an inpatient unit. And so this was during early abstinence and um, estrogen levels are very variable daily. And of course, this is in saliva, uh, well uh, validated kits, but uh, progesterone levels particularly were higher. Um, and so there are adaptations that are going on with chronic drug use, but we certainly need more, um, more experimental studies and, 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 and data to show that, um, that, that they are altered. There's indication that there may be. Thank you. Um, Dr. Uh, Parthasarathy, um, can you uh, give some examples of um, or reasons of what telescoping is and why that might be uh, more noticeable among women than men? Yeah, I think, um, I don't know, one of the speakers mentioned before about the biological, you know, the hormone differences, you know, and how the brain processes um, alcohol. Uh, that's one reason, but um, there, uh, the other important reason can be like co-occurring disorders. So for example, 40% of people um, with substance use disorders have also had a lifetime eating disorder. So, you know, those, um, you know, the, the co-occurring mental and, and uh, as well as depression and anxiety. The, so that's one reason. Um, and also socio-cultural um, pressures may also precipitate the telescoping effect. So, um, especially during pandemic, for example, you know, with, with kids staying at home and, you know, if you're a single parent and so on, I mean, it, I mean, it's, it's not strongly only for women, but it does, it is more noticeable though, you know, it, it can apply both ways, but it does show more for women, um, the, the effect of telescoping. Thank you. I have a, a couple of additional questions that uh, came up in the chat for Dr. Freudenheim. One is um, regarding the possible health benefit of light drinking. What about the Lancet 2018 review, the Global Burden of Disease Study, or Bittinger? Uh, is a drink a week or a day pro or anti-health or innocuous? So that's an area of very active research. Um, there. What I think the person who's asking that question is referring to these findings that among the um, among individual women who had been diagnosed with breast cancer, we still are figuring out what the impact of continued drinking is. And at this time, it looks like there's um, with uh, light drinking that there's some increase, uh, decrease in risk of overall mortality. But I wouldn't really hang much on those findings. There's a lot to yet to understand about when to make the measurements, how much people are changing, and other factors that might also affect um, their mortality risk. Um, thanks. 
Um, another question um, that came up, uh, it seems to me that there's a trend in the last few years for young women to be more likely to drink cocktails and hard liquor. Does it make a difference? What kind of alcohol a woman drinks, whether it's wine, beer, or hard liquor? So most of the evidence is that there is no difference, that it's the alcohol itself, the ethanol that is the um, factor that affects breast cancer risk, and that it doesn't matter what kind of drink, it's the quantity of, of consumption. Um, Reverend Dr. Uh, English, uh, how can we uh, listen to the community more and connect the resources? Um, for uh, addressing substance use disorder to what we hear? <clears throat> well, listening really means opening ourselves up to a new perspective and ideas that we might not have as much experience we, with ourselves. You know, we are rich in every community with our diverse backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives. And we honor that diversity, that richness, when we listen and ask how someone's different story relates to our story. And when we are curious about where other people are coming from and how that helps us understand them better, but perhaps more importantly, how it helps us understand ourselves better. And when I think about the intersection of uh, faith and science, I think about, you know, the need really, um, when we talk about listening to understand, you know, there's a need to, I would say, translate uh, the science into language that is understandable to many of our faith communities. And working together um, intently will help us accomplish that. Thank you. Um, if there are no further questions, um, oh, here's one question for all panelists. There's a waxing and waning nature of insomnia as well as seasonal affective disorder uh, effect uh, more than men. Does it affect women more than men? Could you please comment on the role of seasonal affective disorder and sleep disturbances on women's drinking patterns? Thank you. That's a really good question. I can jump in here. I mean, seasonal affective disorder, it does, I believe, uh, occur more commonly in women. Um, and, and again, I would, I would point to changes in, in hormones that affect sleep as well, but I don't think that has been studied pertaining particularly to uh, SAD comorbidity and substance use disorder. And it's a really good question, needs, needs some further work. Thank you. Um, any further questions? So oh, I think they're now coming in. Oh, um, it says you may want to briefly say what seasonal affective disorder is for this uh, audience. I don't know, Dr. Sinha, if you want, would like to do that. Um, you know, we can, we can go into, I mean, it, it's focused basically on, on uh, mood symptoms and affective symptoms, um, greater depression and distress occurring tied to, uh, to really the winter months originally, but really changes um, as people uh, historically looked at this, this was related to seasons and as specific seasons, particularly um, relating to uh, to uh, winter and um, and then alleviation of symptoms during uh, during the summer. So mood uh, mood changes occurring as a function of seasons. Thank you, um, and thank I want to just thank our panelists for really outstanding presentations and um, for the active discussion. Um, we'll now uh, wrap up this section and uh, take a brief break. Um, and be back uh, according to our agenda at 11.20 a.m. Thank you. Thank you.
Good morning. This is Liz. I'm not sure if the moderator is supposed to speak. Hi, Stacy. Hi. How are you? Good. Yes, the moderator is supposed to speak. Hey, Sandy. Jan? Is Jan on? Deidre, Jan is not on yet. Okay. Could we give him a minute? And I'm uh, sorry. Dr. Dunbar Cooper is not able to join us now. Our second panel for the day is overview of harmful substance use among adolescent girls. And uh, we'll begin with a presentation by Dr. Elizabeth D'Amico. Thanks. Um, I believe David's gonna share my slides for me and give me control. But I wanna say I'm really honored to be asked to be here today and to be on a panel with two amazing people, Dr. Sandy Brown, who I worked with for many years and Dr. Sterling, who does amazing um, work around expert and telemedicine. I'm hoping to set the stage today to talk with you about some of our prevention research with teens in the context of an understanding of substance use among girls and boys, women and men. Um, and so I'm gonna be talking to you about some of our programming that we have done over the years. I know um, Dr. Brown's gonna be talking about the health impacts and focusing on the differences between girls and boys. And Dr. Sterling's gonna talk specifically about expert in girls in pediatrics. But what I think is um, important, oh, I have to click this little button. Um, I just clicked the arrow button, right, David? It's not moving. Yeah, I mean, you might have to click it another time. There you go. Ah, okay. So this is from work that we've done um, with NIAAA funding with several grants looking at um, trajectories of use over time. And I think an important thing to notice here and what we've seen over the last few years is that the girls are catching up with the boys. So rates of use for alcohol and cannabis are pretty similar. And I think that's important in the context of prevention because I think sometimes we may focus more on boys when the reality is that we really need to be addressing and screening substance use for both uh, boys and girls. Some of the key factors of influence that we have to think about when we're addressing substance use among this age group is, you know, are my peers doing it? Do they think it's cool? Is my best friend using? We know important adults in teens' life can also affect substance use. Siblings who are both a family member and a friend. And then a lot of our work has shown the importance of advertising in affecting substance use among teens. So these are all important factors that we need to incorporate into our interventions for these youth. So some of the key policy questions that we've been trying to address around prevention with young people is how can we reach them to make healthy choices? How can we reach diverse and underserved populations, which is really important. We need to go to a lot of different settings in order to do that. We also need to make sure that programming is engaging. Um, I don't know anyone out there who likes getting told what to do, myself included. So programs really need to be collaborative and guiding versus telling teens what to do. And then most importantly, and I know a big focus of this conference is how can we create programming that's sustainable? So when the funding ends, how do we give these programs to communities so that they can continue to implement them? And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later, bridging that that gap between research and practice. So our team has a lot of interventions targeting diverse at risk young people. These are a few of them and I'm gonna focus in on a couple, but CHOICE is one of our programs that we have for middle school. And as many of you know, middle school is a tough time for a lot of teens. It's a time when we see alcohol and drug use rates triple among boys and girls. And so a really important period for intervention. 
We also um, know that not all kids go to school. So we have to think about other ways to reach teens. And we have a brief intervention that took place in primary care for adolescents 14 to 18, because we know at some point everybody goes to the doctor. We also know that there's groups that um, are, have been historically marginalized and are more vulnerable. And so some of my work has also focused on um, Native American youth. I've done work on this with Dr. Dan Dickerson, who's an Alaska Native addiction psychiatrist at UCLA. Thinking of other settings, um, Project AWARE is an intervention developed with Dr. Joan Tucker for young adults experiencing homelessness, so trying to reach those um, youth that are in drop-in shelters. And then another intervention we developed to reach at-risk youth took place in a teen court, and these are for youth that are having problems and have a first-time alcohol or other drug offense. So I bring this to your attention because I think it's important to understand that we can reach youth in so many different settings and ways. And we've got to provide access to resources and get creative. So one intervention that we did was CHOICE, which was this voluntary after-school program. And it um, cycled over the years. So youth could attend after school and it had five sessions focused on norms, which is a really important around peer influence, right? Not everybody is using substances. How to cope with feelings around stress. So instead of turning to substances, what are ways that you can decrease that stress and also preparing for risky situations. And we know, for example, that um, when you think about girls and women, often they're being offered substances maybe by their significant other. And so there's a lot of different ways that people get offered substances. And so trying to teach them ways to prepare for these situations and how to say no. What we found with this program over time is that youth who went to the program decreased the likelihood of initiating alcohol use. And what we also found was that across the entire school setting, so this was a randomized control trial in 16 schools, the schools that had choice, the entire school actually reported decreased alcohol initiation rates. We also found that the teens that came to the program were more likely to say, hey, I know how to say no when someone offers me a substance. And the cool thing when we were like, why did this happen at the school level was we found teens who attended choice were spreading the message to other teens and telling them, hey, guess what? Not everybody's drinking. And so that's a really important thing as well in middle school because peer influence can also have a positive impact. And finally, it's a very cost effective way to reach teens and it ended up being only about $20 per student. Another intervention that we developed, as I mentioned earlier, because not everybody's in school, but everybody goes to the doctor at some point, was in primary care. And this intervention was developed to be part of a primary care appointment. It was only 15 minutes. And we were screening teens. We were testing the NIAAA screener for alcohol use. And based on this, one in five teens screened in at risk. And another important piece I think of this is that even though many teens screened in around alcohol use, many of them, I would say over 90% were also using marijuana regularly. And so for both boys and girls, as you saw in that graph, these are substances that are getting used at similar levels and we need to be addressing both. So in this intervention, um, we had teens either receive a brochure about substance use or get our intervention because sometimes we don't know if screening actually happens in primary care. And I bet Dr. Sterling can talk more about that. But what we found over time was that over a one year period, the teens who received chat reported reduced alcohol use and consequences, reduced marijuana use and consequences. They had more accurate norms and they started to change their social context. So they were spending less time around other teens who used substances. I think one of my most favorite interventions is the one that um, I developed with Dr. Dickerson, which is Makune, Motivational Interviewing and Culture for Urban Native American Youth. And what we did in this intervention was combine um, my work in motivational interviewing and Dan's work focused on traditional healing as a way to prevent substance use. 
And for those of you that have worked with historically marginalized populations, you know it's really important um, when we're doing randomized controlled trials that there is fairness, that things are done ethically, particularly with the Native American population, given the unethical research that has occurred over the last two decades. So we worked closely with the community and what we decided with the community was that there wasn't going to be in a real control group, but that everybody was going to receive some type of cultural programming, which is really important. And so youth were randomized to one of two groups in this study, each of which had an important cultural component. All of the youth received what we called a community wellness gathering, which was this amazing event that we put on every month across Southern California, focused on culture, and it was held over the dinner hour, and all of the community would be invited to attend, including the youth that were in the program, and it would begin with an opening prayer and focus on drumming, dancing, beating, storytelling, and then talking about how to make healthy choices. So all of the youth in this study got a wellness gathering, and then half of the youth also received three workshops, and these were focused on healthy choices around the medicine wheel for body, brain, and spirit. And they all began with an opening prayer, talking about ground rules. And the workshops were very interactive. And the first hour was typically about how to make healthy choices around substance use. And then the second hour was a cultural activity that tied in with those choices. For example, talking about the brain and how substance use affects the brain, and then doing a beating activity and tying that into how you use your brain for beating. We also had native cooking and a sage ceremony. And what we found over six months was that both groups stabilized their use. So we did not find differences between the groups, but found that instead of the increases we typically see, as you saw on that graph, alcohol and marijuana use stabilized. And this really highlighted for us the importance of culturally centered programming. And this was one of the only randomized controlled trials done with urban Native American youth and really highlights the need for continued work in this area. So with these interventions, what I think we can show is there's innovative ways to reach boys and girls and reach them across different settings with minimal cost. Choice, you know, we reached 15% of the population, but we saw reductions at the school level. Chat was only 15 minutes, but we saw huge reductions in use one year later. And Makune, we saw reductions just for those youth that attended this two hour cultural gathering. This all speaks to um, bridging this gap between research and practice that I mentioned earlier, and really starting to think outside the office and how can we make sure that these programs are feasible and sustainable. And a key important part of this is identifying leaders who can help you disseminate the programming. So these are all leaders that are were part of our Makune project and are part of a more recent um, grant we have focusing on opioid misuse among Native American emerging adults. And what they are so important is talking to the community about the program and getting that program to continue in the community. And because of the work we did, Dr. Carrie Johnson, who's a collaborator um, on Sacred Path Indigenous Wellness Center, was able to obtain funding to be able to continue Makune and continue providing those resources throughout Southern California. Another really important piece of dissemination is getting the word out to everyone. We all do peer reviewed publications, but we need to break it down for people so they understand, you know, what is going on? Um, what are your findings? And making it accessible to people so they can understand the results. You know, how can we help women? How can we help teens? How do we need to talk to them about substance use? And this is really important. Another key piece, I think, for dissemination and sustainability is also getting the word out to everyone. And what we've really tried to do is do this by briefing our results to Senate and House committees. Um, our work on e-cigarettes was cited by the FDA commissioner around vaping. And I'll show you in a second, but our um, a lot of our work has been used to inform policy for state legislature. And an example of this, um, for those of you that live in LA, know that when um, 
marijuana became legalized recreationally, it was kind of the wild, wild west out here and advertising was everywhere and there was no regulations. And we were able to show that this advertising really affected youth choices, girls and boys around cannabis use. And that youth who were exposed to more advertising over seven years were more likely to report marijuana use, have consequences, have higher intentions to continue to use. And they were able to use this work to create an ordinance that restricted advertising. So for example, you weren't able to advertise in front of a school or a playground anymore. And so I think, um, you know, an important part of our work that we do as researchers is figuring out how we can use that work and bring it into communities to help communities. And another key part in bridging this gap is making our programming available and accessible. So what we have done with a lot of our work is brought it to the community at different levels. So for example, you'll see here, we have a website that's free. It's called grupamyforteens.org. It has all of our curricula up there for free that people can download. It has training videos. And a lot of the community has been using this. I mentioned, you know, Makune is being done in Southern California. Our choice program is being done in school districts um, throughout the United States. And Free Talk is also being implemented. And people can contact us, they can get the information, and they can have these programs for free and bring them to their communities. Um, we also created with um, the NIDA clinical trials, this training program that you see here that says engaging adolescent patients about marijuana use. And this was based on the chat intervention that I talked with you about earlier, where we screened boys and girls in, and we use those digital recordings to create this patient, David, who comes into the primary care office with marijuana use. And depending how providers talk to David determines how much he tells you, just like in the real world. So if you tell David that he better quit using pot, he's pretty much going to shut down and not tell you anything else. And what this training program does is it provides free continuing education to providers and allows them to work on their motivational interviewing skills on how to talk to teens. And then this um, page you see in the middle here from our Takuna project, which is Traditions and Connections for Urban Native Americans, is a way that we disseminate our work to communities as well. So we do these press releases that are written in lay language for every publication we have and disseminate them to the community so that they have access to our findings in a way that's accessible. So these are all different things that we've done to try to really make our programs accessible to people. Finally, as I mentioned at the very beginning, um, bridging the gap also involves thinking through implementations across different settings. Schools, community settings, primary care, metropolitan areas, there's so many ways that we can reach teens who need resources. And so we have to think outside of the box and continue to go into different settings so that all teens can have access to these different resources. So with that, I know we're taking questions at the end and I will turn it over to Dr. Brown who is following me. Thank you. Well, I am just uh, delighted to have the opportunity to uh, follow uh, Liz D'Amico. Uh, what an amazing set of interventions that uh, she's designed, developed, collaborated on, and um, it shows us that there are many, many ways uh, in particular to reach young people around the problems that alcohol, marijuana, and other substances create. And I'm gonna follow that with a discussion of a few aspects of health effects um, provoked by alcohol and other substances that impact adolescent development with a particular focus on girls. Um, and uh, so let me see if I can move my slides forward. Let's try this. All right, here we go. There you go. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so what I thought I would share with you today is some uh, practical uh, types of new research findings that come from two national consortia. One is the National Consortium 
on alcohol and neurodevelopment in adolescents. Uh, this is a project that has five sites, uh, over 800 youth participating across the country, uh, all uh, recruited from schools and uh, with uh, some diversity, but not quite as much diversity as the second project that I'll refer to, uh, which is the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. That's a much larger study, uh, 12,000 youth and their families uh, from 21 sites across the nation. And uh, in that sample, uh, these youth are youth that match the census characteristics, demographic characteristics for youth who are nine and 10 years of age. That's how old they were when we first recruited them. Um, uh, 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 seven years ago. Uh, and I thought I would share several aspects of health today that come, uh, that now we know about relatively new findings that have to do with brain health, uh, cognitive functioning, thinking abilities, uh, uh, some components of mental health, and the importance of sleep. And then finally, because we all lived through COVID, not just those uh, uh, participants in the programs that we that we serve, I thought I'd share a little bit about some of the sex differences that we found related to COVID. So first, with regard uh, to brain development, um, even if you don't remember the specifics of the differences between boys and girls and the impact of alcohol, please remember that alcohol impacts normal brain development across adolescents. Many studies over the years have found that uh, uh, alcohol impacts brain functioning of adults. We now have evidence both from um, younger adolescents and older adolescents that alcohol directly influences how the brain develops. Now, to really uh, say that, that a change or a difference is a function of alcohol, we need to pay attention to the age of the youth. We need to pay attention to transitions in their use patterns. And this is why at the Encanda study, the first consortium is so important because the majority of those youth, ages 12 to 21, were non or very low drinkers at the beginning. And we've been studying to see what happens when they transition into different drinking states. And then finally, we need to be sure that those changes are just not age-related changes, but are actually changes over time in each individual. So in the Encanda study, we repeat brain scans and neurocognitive assessments and clinical evaluations every year from adolescence to adulthood. And I thought I'd give you an example of how alcohol uh, influences uh, brain development and how we can feel confident in the kinds of preventions, early interventions and intervention studies that Dr. D'Amico was talking about and say that these are effects of alcohol or other substances. So first, when we follow these youth over time and they continue to either not drink or be low drinkers, um, we see changes in several dimensions of the brain. I'm going to share with you about cortical thickness here. And what happens to cortical thickness, that is sort of the covering of the outside component of uh, our brain, uh, is that it uh, diminishes as we move from early adolescence to late adolescence to young adulthood. And uh, so we know what the normal pattern is by following these individuals and seeing what standard changes. If we look at youth who have transitioned from non-drinking to drinking states, uh, uh, but are not heavy drinkers, they're not regular bingers, for example, what we see is that their cortical thickness decreases faster in the youngest cohort. So the earlier you start to drink, the more impactful it is on this dimension of brain development. And the changes are slower than uh, would be expected uh, at the older ages at, in late adolescence and young adulthood. And importantly, for those youth who transition from non-drinking or very low drinking up to 
to regular heavy drinking, uh, binge drinking, for example, it's the very fastest in the youngest cohort and the very slowest in the older cohort. Let me give you a picture of this. There we go. Uh, so if you look at the red lines here across these different parts of the brain, what you'll see is that they all look like the, the decline, the, the rate of change uh, is about the same uh, across all of these five time points that we studied them. Um, but if you look at the green and the blue, the moderate and, and the uh, heavier drinkers, you see that decline is slower here. It's slower in this part of the brain. It's slower in this part of the brain. So, and we see that all the way across and that, the, and that at, at the end, there is a much bigger di difference uh, in terms of uh, the level of thickness in the brain and the rate of the intercept as well as the rate of change. Why is that important? Because these kinds of brain changes, um, cortical thickness changes, gray matter reduction, uh, white matter increase, and functional uh, connectivity, neural network connectivity, are all important in, in the process whereby the brain basically restructures, reorganizes, and becomes a more efficient learning and memory system. So if alcohol disrupts that, uh, that process, we, pro we will be able to see that manifest in uh, the way youth make decisions, the way they learn in the classroom, the way they remember things, uh, and how planful they can be as they move through adolescence. So uh, we've done a number of studies in this Encanta project where we're looking at individuals over time. And what we find is that gray matter volume reduction is impacted by alcohol. Um, it's not exacerbated by marijuana use, for example, but it's impacted by alcohol. Those who are alcohol users, uh, uh, the patterns look the same as if they have other drugs on board. White matter um, uh, uh, integrity, meaning uh, as the myelination occurs in the nervous system, uh, neural, neural networks in the brain, uh, the uh, effectiveness of that myelination, the completeness of that myelination uh, is impacted by alcohol. It disrupts how efficiently parts of the brain can uh, connect and send messages to one another and can work in coordination. Uh, we talked about a volume difference. And the last thing is alcohol Im impacts this functional connectivity, meaning how the networks of nerves work together in different regions of the brain to help us make good, good decisions, uh, to help us understand other people's feelings and thoughts and their behaviors, to plan our own behavior, for example. And this is an area that I think is really important because while alcohol clearly has an effect in all of these types of development, we don't see uh, these biological differences in uh, between boys and girls, um, in uh, in white matter and gray matter and in cortical volume, but we do in functional connectivity. And I just want to show you uh, what that means and um, share with you what I think are some implications. If you look at the lower left hand side of the screen, these uh, the two figures at the bottom on the left, there are girls and on the right, there are boys. And you see there is an increase here uh, on the left side. And it, there is the, in all three levels of um, uh, uh, drinking are, uh, are flat in terms of their relationship uh, between connectivity and alcohol use on the right side. These are boys. And these are girls. Well, what does it mean? It means that for girls, the more that they drink, the more number of times in the past year that they drank, the heavier that they drink, there is a dose relationship between the disruption that's created in this neural connectivity. Um, for boys, it looks like uh, uh, the impact of alcohol and other substances is the um, same uh, for 
um, days uh, if they're using alcohol, but for girls, it's higher. And for boys, it looks like the uh, drinking, um, excuse me, yeah, drinking directly affects connectivity. Um, whereas for girls, what drinking does is through this alteration, uh, uh, the alterations in sensation seeking, it increases um, the uh, connectivity uh, levels or it impacts more strongly the connectivity levels. So what does that mean for us? This is in the sensory motor part of the brain, and we see exactly the same thing, the, the same patterns in the motor network as well, uh, where we see stronger effects for girls than we do for boys in these parts of the brain, and these same patterns, and there's a dose uh, response effect. So in a way, this is showing us that the brains of girls, the brains of female adolescents and uh, late, uh, early and late adolescents are more impacted, uh, disrupted by alcohol use the more the, girl, the girls use. For boys, uh, alcohol is disruptive, uh, but it does not do so through enhancing sensation seeking. And if you think about it, um, this heightened sensation seeking um, uh, can put girls at risk, can put it, sensation seeking is very normal. Risk taking is very normal in adolescence. But if you have something that heightens that, that can also heighten other types of risk, uh, exposure to dangerous situations, exposure to unwanted sex, those kinds of things. Um, uh, perhaps driving more rec recklessly, for example. So um, uh, this is an important arena where alcohol affects uh, so much of brain development in adolescence, and it especially impacts girls in um, adolescence in, in the, this way. So um, we know that these are pretty consistent findings. We've seen these in several studies now. Um, and we also know that alcohol impacts cognitive performance. Now, in adults, we know that women's tend, uh, uh, that alcohol and other substances do influence cognitive functioning, learning, memory, uh, attention, uh, executive functioning, problem solving, for example, and um, behavioral inhibition. Um, and we, we see this to a lesser extent in, in our behavioral measures of cognitive performance in uh, younger people, but we still see those differences. But for girls, I want to point out that alcohol appears to have a stronger impact on nonverbal memory. That's visual spatial kinds of memory. And remember, I just showed you this functional connectivity link that's more impacted uh, by females. So we see behaviorally in um, visual spatial memory, what we saw in the functional connectivity measures. And with boys, alcohol appears uh, to impact sustained attention or vigilance more. Uh, than other domains uh, and more than girls. Uh, the, on other domains, we see, see those differences, but we uh, don't see uh, as a result of alcohol use, but we don't see the differences between females and males. Uh, so there are in fact differences in the way alcohol and other substances affect the brain, that they affect how we think, and other aspects of health as well. One of the things we know is that over the past several decades, there has been a dramatic increase in depression among adolescents. And um, I'll talk to, uh, to that again um, uh, when I mention a few things about COVID. Um, but if you look at younger children between the ages of five to 11, we know that uh, 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 death related to depression and suicide, for example, pretty low. But by the time youth move into this 12 to 17 year age range, you can see that suicide is the second most common uh, cause of death for youth. Although uh, ideation is um, 
um, it's more, excuse me, it's more common in Caucasians than um, other populations. And uh, uh, death by suicide is more common in, in males in this younger age group. However, girls, almost a quarter of them have said uh, that they've seriously considered suicide uh, by the time uh, they're in high school and uh, high school seniors. So uh, this kind of ideation is pervasive for girls. Um, we were interested in the ABCD study with how early this starts. And you can see that even controlling for all types of confounding factors, that 6% of the nine and 10 year olds said that they, they had at least had passive um, ideation, like life is not worth living for them. Uh, two and a half percent said that they thought about it and thought how they might do it or even developed a plan. And 1% uh, had actually made uh, attempts. Over 9% had made some personal kind of injury, cutting, head banging, et cetera. So it's important for us as we think about early interventions uh, to look at what are the risks at these early ages. Some things are not surprising, like high family conflict, a lot of stress in the, in the family. But limited parent parental monitoring was also associated with greater reports of suicidal ideation. And one thing I think that's very important for us clinicians to know is that the reports of youth about suicidal ideation were typically not known by the parents. So in clinical settings, uh, we want to be sure that we're asking the children, even at these younger ages. So uh, with regard to alcohol and other substances uh, and how this relates to depression and suicide, um, we know that the rates for girls who have um, both uh, heavy alcohol use and depressive symptoms, the rates for suicide are six times higher. Suicide attempts are six times higher. Um, there have been studies that have looked at, well, what are the kinds of risks, either genetic uh, or uh, environmental risks that, that might predict to suicide in these populations? We know uh, depression in terms of polygenetic risk scores for, for depression do relate uh, to suicide attempts. But ADHD uh, is, a, is a risk factor for ideation, not for attempts, but, but for ideation in early adolescence. And at the bottom of uh, this uh, slide, I'd like to, to highlight that um, uh, we, we know genetic effects, uh, particularly PTSD-related or high-stress trauma uh, effects, uh, are important, but they have a small effect size. And environmental stressors uh, uh, are, are more important in predicting whether a youth will have ideation or make an attempt. Family conflict similarly has a moderate effect. But I wanna bring to your attention um, that sexual orientation discrimination has a large effect. It, it has, uh, it's in fact, uh, three times higher than um, uh, the, the uh, genetic related effects. Um, why is that important? Because the, these populations often will turn to uh, alcohol and other substances to manage the discomfort that they feel and that uh, exacerbates the risk that they have for uh, suicidal ideation. So alcohol, uh, and uh, depression is a very risky combination. It's one of the more common combinations for comorbidity in adolescence. Uh, and it's particularly dangerous uh, for um, girls relative to boys. Um, another set of new uh, findings that I wanted to be sure to share had to do with uh, alcohol, adolescent alcohol use and sleep. We know it from adult studies and now consistently with adolescent studies that alcohol disrupts sleep across adolescents. But importantly, sleep uh, disruption leads to greater binge drinking in the future. And this is especially true uh, for girls. There are characteristics of girls that, uh, that are related to sleep problems and uh, risk for continued 
or exacerbation in, in binge drinking, uh, being awake, uh, a pattern of being awake later in the evening, um, more daytime sleepiness, uh, shorter weekday duration of sleep predicts to future binge drinking, onset and exacerbations, um, and uh, uh, shorter week weekend duration of sleeping as well. We see some of these effects, the, the shorter duration of sleep uh, uh, predicts binge drinking for boys, but this is really important for girls to ask about the quality of their sleep. Be sure you understand um, uh, the if they're having difficulty and to help them address that. That's an important health domain that seems to unfold and actually be exacerbated in adolescence. Uh, so uh, let me uh, uh, summarize uh, so far that we see alcohol affecting the brain and uh, cognition, and it looks like gray matter, white matter, cerebral volumes, and cognitive performance, especially executive functioning, seem to be impacted about the same for girls and for boys, um, and including the impacts of binge drinking and blackout level drinking, by the way. Um, but for girls, alcohol produces more visual spatial memory problems. Uh, it uh, produces impairment in neural connectivity development, both in the sensory motor and motor um, arenas, and sleep problems for girls uh, are at elevated risk, uh, elevate risk for subsequent alcohol use. So I'd like to close my time by just making a few comments about uh, the COVID period, uh, these last two and a half years that we've all uh, had to struggle through, and it's been especially hard uh, for those who go into the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic, disadvantaged in any way, uh, economically, uh, in terms of family uh, life, et cetera. But for, we see a 14 to 16 percent increase in depression for those who were reporting uh, depressive symptoms before COVID onset. So for those uh, uh, individuals, both boys and girls, there's a 14 uh, to 16 percent increase in, in depression as a function of COVID uh, during the first year. And this is regardless of whether they've had COVID or not. And girls report being substantially more stressed uh, uh, by uh, the pandemic than, than do boys. And on the right, you'll see all these different ways in which, uh, at least in our repeated surveys in both in Canada and ABCD, we find that COVID has impacted youth. Um, uh, uh, disrupting uh, relationships with their friends and their family family members, uh, making problems that existed before, whether those are financial concerns, health concerns, uh, mental health concerns, making those kinds of things worse. And um, uh, so we see all the different ways in which uh, uh, and, and the extent to which uh, these factors uh, were influenced by COVID. Um, when we look at how much stress people experience during COVID, um, uh, we see that girls experienced much more stress than, than boys. And one of the things that mitigates the level of stress that's experienced, uh, uh, particularly for girls, is communication with parents. And here I'd just like to highlight that uh, Black and Hispanic communities and uh, socioeconomically disadvantaged families were parents were much more likely to talk to their children about the challenges of COVID uh, than were families, uh, than were Caucasian families or families with uh, that were less financially impacted of higher SES. Uh, it's a really important message, I think, for us about the resilience that we can uh, see and observe and need to understand in uh, across these different types of families. So uh, with that, I think I'll pause and uh, very happy to take any uh, questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dr. Sandra. If you have, Sandra Brown, if you have any questions for her, please put them in the Q&A box 
and we'll be able to answer them during the QA session at the end. Perfect. Now, please welcome Dr. Stacy A. Sterling. Dr. Sterling? Hi. Yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here today uh, to talk uh, about SBIRT, screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment for adolescents and some of the implications for adolescent girls. And I'd like to thank NIAAA for their support of these projects and especially thank Dr. Roach for her passion and, and commitment to bringing this conference to fruition. Um, so let's see. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about adolescent girls and alcohol and drugs and comorbidities, uh, but we've heard a lot today about the health and mental health effects of alcohol and drugs on adolescents and girls in particular, and just want to remind everybody about the convergence that we have seen between um, girls and boys and their use of alcohol and drugs over time that we've heard from several of the speakers today. And so I'll just present a few findings that really echo uh, the what we've already heard. Uh, talk a little bit about um, the evidence base for adolescent SBIRT, um, particularly for girls, um, and uh, talk about current guidelines and recommendations, and then share some findings from a trial that we have conducted in our health system, Kaiser Permanente Northern California, of adolescent SBIRT and some of the findings over time, particularly the long-term findings. And then hopefully uh, talk about some next steps or future directions. Um, so, you know, as we've just heard from Dr. Brown and others, uh, you know, some of the um, health and mental health impacts and the um, increases in use among adolescent girls um, that we've been seeing over time, I think, have been exacerbated during um, the COVID pandemic. Uh, we know that there's a lot of distress and stress out there, particularly among adolescent girls. Um, there are suggestions that um, girls have been drinking more during the pandemic uh, because of access to alcohol, because of isolation, uh, being at home, Zoom school, and so forth. Uh, we have looked at this uh, a little bit in our system, and just to, uh, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Kaiser um, Northern California, it is a large integrated healthcare system. We serve about a third of the population of Northern California. Uh, we have about 4.3 uh, million members overall, and about 400,000 adolescent members. Um, we have looked at um, self-reported mental health symptoms and substance use um, collected during the course of regular pediatric primary care visits pre-pandemic onset and post-pandemic onset to try and get a sense of um, whether we were seeing the same kinds of trends in our system that um, uh, we were seeing you know across the country. So already you can see this is pre-pandemic and you can see that, um, you know, girls were self-reporting alcohol use um, more than boys were. Uh, about equal uh, percentages of um, self-reported marijuana use, um, but much higher uh, reported uh, self-reported mood symptoms and suicidal ideation. And that was, you know, this really echoes what we just heard from Dr. Brown. Post pandemic, uh, we see even more, you know, uh, a, a slight decrease in the percentage of boys who are reporting alcohol use, but an increase in the number in the percentage of girls who are. Uh, we see now more girls, a higher percentage of girls reporting marijuana use, um, and it's gone down for boys. Um, and then really strikingly, if you look at these um, uh, self-reported mood symptoms and suicidal ideation, you know, really uh, increases in, in what girls are reporting. So that's really concerning, obviously. So moving on to uh, what we know about adolescent SBIRT. And I just want to step back 
a little bit. I think probably most of you are familiar with SBIRT, but in case not, SBIRT stands for Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral to Treatment. It's a public health approach to early intervention for substance use problems. It involves uh, systematic screening using evidence-based screening tools, um, and then a standardized protocol for having a conversation about substance use. Um, it's really informed by motivational interviewing, and then a protocol for referring people uh, who need specialty treatment. Um, and historically, you know, SBIRT was really developed and tested in adult populations. And the blue circle that you see here was really the focus of that. So people, uh, adults with unhealthy alcohol use or a substance use disorder. Um, but I would argue, and I think a, a lot of us in the adolescent SBIRT field really feel that SBIRT can encompass the entire spectrum of um, of substance users because adolescents shouldn't be using any substances. So, you know, the people who are abstaining, who haven't yet initiated substance use, um, what we would consider experimental or low risk users, anticipatory guidance is all part of SBIRT for adolescents. Um, the adolescent expert literature is, I would say, 10 or 20 years behind the adult literature. Uh, however, uh, you know, it, it's a growing and robust literature, um, you know, including studies that have been conducted by people who you've already heard from, like Dr. D'Amico, um, showing you know positive outcomes across a broad range of of outcomes, not just use, but also other functional outcomes, um, things like delinquency, uh, things like um, driving while intoxicated, things that are very, you know, outcomes that are very important to adolescent uh, health and well-being. Uh, there have been um, fewer studies that have had the numbers and the power to look at SBIRT specifically among girls. But I think that there are promising signs that SBIRT not only works for girls, but actually may work better for girls than it does for boys. Um, some recent studies are Lisa Weitzman's work, uh, D'Souza Lee, Sharon Levy, all of which suggest that girls respond very well to um, to brief interventions um, delivered in different settings. Um, so I want to take a little a little little bit of a detour and talk about current guidelines. So many of you are aware of the US Preventive Services Task Force and their recommendations about um, the evidence for efficacy and effectiveness of different preventive health services uh, for primary care. Um, and currently, um, and the most recent updates of their recommendations for alcohol misuse screening and counseling and drug use screening and counseling uh, both of which received an insufficient evidence rating. Um, I think this really speaks to um, the dearth of studies um, or the, 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 the fewer number of studies in adolescent expert research and brief intervention research um, than in the adult literature. And I'm really hoping that um, you know, as we go forward, more and more studies are coming out demonstrating the effectiveness and efficacy of SBIRT for adolescents and that these ratings will change. So I would say that, um, um, you know, stay tuned. Luckily, um, other experts and, and uh, expert bodies have um, moved forward and recognized that brief interventions can be a very effective approach to prevention and early intervention. So the Surgeon General talks about the importance of early intervention for adolescents um, uh, in terms of um, drinking and drug use, uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, issued a policy statement um, specifically talking about the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force rating and how important it is to um, nevertheless integrate SBIRT into pediatric primary care. And you can see that all of these medical organizations recommend regular screening um, as part of preventive care for adolescents. 
So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a trial that we have uh, that we conducted beginning in uh, 2011 and we've been able to oh sorry I've, I already talked about our settings so I won't uh, belabor that. Um, so this is a trial that we um, conducted beginning in uh, between 2011 and 2013. It was a large pragmatic cluster randomized uh, effectiveness and implementation trial. Uh, we used a population base of adolescents uh, and over 9,000 adolescent well visits um, and relied um, completely on data collected in the electronic health record. Uh, we randomized pediatricians to one of three arms. <clears throat> Excuse me. In one, we uh, trained pediatricians to deliver uh, brief interventions and referral to treatment. In another, we had an embedded uh, clinician that the pediatricians were able to um, refer to. This was a behavioral health clinician. And so if they identified a, um, a teen who, who they felt was at risk, uh, they would refer to this clinician. And then in a, the usual care arm, they, they dealt with alcohol and drug problems um, as they, they normally did. And we looked at a whole variety of outcomes. We looked at implementation outcomes. We looked at patient outcomes, both um, alcohol and drug use, but beyond that to uh, many other salient um, outcomes for adolescents. We looked at um, uh, specialty treatment initiation and engagement rates for kids who were identified as, as, being, uh, as needing that level of care. And uh, uh, we looked at health services utilization. And we have um, published, uh, a, you know, a lot of different outcomes so far. Uh, we had po we've seen positive results in terms of um, substance use, depression, and mood symptom and other mood symptoms, specialty treatment initiation and engagement, um, and then healthcare use and um, the emergence of. Um, uh, disorders over time, uh, behavioral health disorders over time. Um, as I mentioned, one of our main uh, focuses was on implementation, and we found that um, uh, either way SBIRT was delivered, um, the adolescents in those arms were much more likely to receive a brief intervention than um, the kids who are in usual care. And one thing I want to point out here is that you'll see that, um, whoops, I'm sorry, um, whoops, sorry, um, you'll see here that um, for girls, it seems as though, and, and this is just a in, in that behavioral clinician arm, but that doctors um, often referred the, the girl to the behavioral health clinician based on identifying a mental health problem. Um, but, but once the behavioral clinician started talking to the uh, female patient, they uncovered alcohol and drug problems. And I just, you know, we don't see that with the boys. And I think that this really speaks to uh, maybe some of what you heard from Dr. Partha Sarathi earlier about how um, clinicians perceive girls and women and um, alcohol and drug problems. So today I, I wanted to focus on uh, this uh, on longer term um, analyses that we've done. And in, in this, what we did was we looked at, um, we combined the two ESPERT groups. So the group of uh, where the pediatricians delivered ESPERT, the group where the behavioral health uh, uh, clinician delivered ESPERT and compared those to usual care. And these were um, all among all of the um, teens who actually endorsed a risk factor. Uh, and so over time, we saw that compared to usual care, um, the ESPERT group had fewer specialty psychiatry visits and um, slightly fewer emergency department visits at one year. Um, uh, girls were more than twice as likely, though, to have had a psychiatry visit than boys. 
um, we had we see fewer um, specialty psychiatry visits and fewer total outpatient visits compared to usual care at three years among the expert group um, adolescents. Um, and girls were a third less likely to have had a substance use treatment visit than boys at three years. Um, the expert group was less likely to have mental health diagnoses or chronic medical conditions at a year and was less likely to have substance use diagnoses and more, but more likely to have had substance use treatment visits if they had a substance use diagnosis than usual care at three years. Um, and now we've been able to look at these uh, kids young adults now um, at seven years. So all of these are uh, uh, this, you know, all of the these uh, participants are, are young adults now. And compared to usual care, uh, we see in the expert group that they had lower odds, odds of any substance use, alcohol, any drug, marijuana, or tobacco diagnoses. They had lower odds of any inpatient hospitalizations. They had lower Charleston medical comorbidity scores compared to the usual group. Uh, we did not see any differences in mental health diagnoses in general between the two groups. Um, among adolescents with at least one health care visit, those in the uh, expert group had fewer primary care psychiatry visits, but more addiction medicine visits. Again, I think reflecting that uh, for those uh, who needed it, uh, the connection to specialty addiction medicine um, uh, was higher among the, uh, the expert group. Uh, we were also able to look uh, to, we, we had a big enough sample to look at, to do stratified analyses, and we were able to see that among Latino youth, uh, those in the expert group had lower odds of any substance use, drug use, or marijuana use diagnoses. Uh, compared to usual care, and among Black and African American youth, those in the expert group had lower odds of alcohol use diagnoses compared to usual care. Um, I just wanted to point out here that, um, you know, here are these young adults, um, and we are continuing to see um, young women with much higher um, likelihood of having a behavioral health diagnosis, depression, anxiety diagnoses, but lower um, likelihood of having a substance use diagnosis. So, can, you know, this reflects what we see in the literature, but we're seeing it here as well in our system. So I think what we are, are determining you know, from this study, you know, in our system, that uh, is that SBIRD delivered in um, a variety of different ways, whether by pediatricians or other clinicians, can improve identification and treatment of adolescent substance use and mental health problems in pri uh, pediatric primary care. SBIRD is wholly consistent with the um, preventive orientation of pediatrics and adolescent medicine. Um, Girls frequently have higher rates of risk factor endorsement, especially comorbid mental health uh, symptoms, and these um, may have been exacerbated um, during the um, pandemic. And I think that we are going to be um, dealing with um, the sequela of the pandemic for a long time. Um, but I think it provides opportunities to intervene on substance use in girls through other means, so starting out talking about mental health problems um, or in psychiatry, maybe. Um, but pediatricians may be less likely to think about girls as having substance problems, and training and education of clinicians is really key. Um, SBIRT may be as effective for minoritized youth as for white youth, but we really need more and larger studies looking at youth of color, LGBTQ uh, youth, youth in low and middle income uh, countries, um, and that SBIRT alone is really not enough, and that uh, young people and parents really want um, a broader spectrum of behavioral health services in pediatrics and adolescent medicine and young adult medicine and other stigmatized, non-stigmatized settings. So I'm, I'm going to leave you with this, and these are some questions that I have, and, um, you know, ESPERT was, uh, you know, the early studies, which are 
were great and we we lean on them a lot but they were really you know involved mostly you know middle-aged uh, white men <laughs> and um, I think it's time that we really um, think about SBIRT more broadly so we don't necessarily need to use the same old SBIRT modalities uh, for teens. Uh, that may involve telecare, some of the really exciting stuff that you just saw Dr. D'Amico talking about, the ways that they have approached these kinds of interventions, so that self-administered, peer facilitated, social media based, you know, going where teens are. Uh, we really need to look at effect heterogeneity and so what works for whom in what context and delivered how um, and but we have to also be thinking about so how do we balance this tailoring of interventions with high quality uh, large scale systematic delivery so i will leave you with those questions which keep me up at night um, and thank you Thank you for that excellent presentation, Dr. Sterling. We will Thank now you. transition to the question and answer section of this presentation. Please put all of your questions in the Q&A box provided. I will also start off with questions that were sent in. And the first one is, what would you say, and this applies to all of the presenters, what and to the audience as well, you can respond. So I think this is important that we get input from the audience because that's what the conference is mainly about. What would you say is most important to think about when you're working with historically marginalized communities and how have you and your team been able to build trust in these different communities? Anybody in the audience can answer this question here and, and we will provide um, an answer. I'm happy to address that. Okay. Um, I think it's a really, really important question. And, you know, the work that I've been doing over the last 14 years with um, Dr. Dickerson, I've really learned so much about, you know, we think we know <laughs> what it means to be marginalized, but I think until you're in those communities and talking with them, you have to really, really understand and understand the best ways and the, and the challenges and how we can best create programming that's going to be culturally and developmentally appropriate. And unless we, you know, build those conversations into our, our research, we're not going to be able to bridge that gap with research and practice. And I think that's why some of our programs have been so successful, because we really spend sometimes a year in the field trying to understand the issues before we develop the programming. I'm sure others have ideas as well. So Liz, I'll just um, uh, support what you're saying. Uh, it, it, it is so critical to take a community-based collaborative approach uh, to not assume that because we've done research, we know how to do it because we don't know how to optimize uh, services. And um, we really need to uh, uh, approach this as a partnership uh, and design the, um, the way we ask questions, uh, the way we approach this, how we approach this, the context in which we approach this, all after listening to what the challenges and the needs of the various uh, groups are. So that would just, that's a very generic kind of 10,000 foot view, but it's a very different approach uh, to developing uh, interventions, uh, to even developing assessments. Stacy, do you want to add to that? Yeah, no, I would, I would echo all of that. I would say <laughs> that in our context, uh, you know, primary care is, I think, an opportune setting for a lot of people, you know, uh, many uh, minoritized groups have lower rates of treatment initiation, specialty treatment initiation for a whole variety of reasons, you know, mistrust and historical mistreatment and so forth. Uh, but a lot of people, most people and most adolescents have access to pediatric primary care now in this country with, you know, changes in coverage. And um, so many pediatricians and, and, and doctors are trusted uh, 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 
you know, professionals. And so that I think for us is a way to reach populations that might not be willing to um, be interested in any sort of specialty care. Is there anybody else who would like to add to the conversation? If not, we have some questions in the Q&A. Are there any studies that look at concussions related to youth sports would have a greater effect combined with substance use? Um, why don't I just begin with that? I'm not an expert in this area, but I will uh, say that we are in this process of analyzing both the NCANDA data and the ABCD data as relates to this now. What we do know about trauma, physical trauma, um, uh, sexual trauma, emotional trauma, is that when we look at the impacts on development in the brain, that there are lots of similarities that trauma influences brain development in much the way that the assault of alcohol and other substances impacts or interferes with uh, healthy brain development. Um, and so the real question is, is, is this just an additive effect? Uh, is, it, uh, is there unfortunate synergism that it, that it even more disadvantages uh, the youth who've had these physical traumas uh, or other types of traumas in addition uh, to the insult that alcohol and other drugs produce. I'll, I'll pause there in case anyone else would like to share. Okay, the next question is, do you think the girl, that girl's rates of depression, suicide ideation and actual use could be affected by their hormone levels? Well, uh, I'm not an expert in this per se, but I think that we've heard um, from Dr. Sina and others, I think absolutely. <laughs> you know, we see that uh, those effects with um, adult women and, and I, I can't think of any reason why. I mean, Dr. Brown, you would probably, could probably speak to this more than I, but yeah. Yeah, so I just agree with you, St uh, uh, Stacy, and uh, you see, uh, changes in rates of depressive symptoms, uh, in um, uh, increases in prevalence of uh, depressive diagnoses, uh, other types of internalizing disorder diagnoses as well uh, that are related to the to uh, uh, transitions through pubertal stages. So uh, totally agree with you. Thank you. We have a comment that I just wanted to comment that Esbert is so in line with no wrong door policy. I have to agree with that one. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it's not used enough. Did community-based partnerships with adolescent stakeholders inform how and where findings were disseminated? Are there any examples? I think that's a really great question and um everyone was talking about the pandemic and the effects it's had on across many levels. And for those of us doing research during this time, we were supposed to do an in-person workshop with emerging adults around opioid misuse when the pandemic hit. And so we had to switch everything to virtual. So when I think about this, the ways that we've been able to connect have been recruiting through social media, using Instagram to talk about our project, disseminate findings. And so a lot of that was in concert and talking with um, adolescents and emerging adults about ways. So we've, we've done a lot of that. And the way we disseminate the research is all based on talking with our community <clears throat> partners on how to get the word out. Um, and so they really help us tailor the way we send out information. But I think the pandemic really had to make us think more about how to use these resources we have out there to get information to people. Dr. D'Amico, I have a question for you. In your studies, you mentioned about suicide and suicide ideation. Were any Native American youth involved in that analysis and research? 
Oh, I think that was Dr. Brown. Um, oh. But we did, we do address suicide in ours as well. But I think it was the NCANDA work, perhaps, that you're referring to. Yeah, um, I wasn't sure whether the rates for African Americans and Caucasian youth was the same or less than for Native youth. The generally speaking, we know that suicide ideation in Native communities is really high among youth and, and adults. So. Yeah, so uh, that that uh, is the case. You might remember that the base rates for these are um, uh, quite low, but we uh, but we did find that uh, marginalized uh, communities have higher rates. Um, uh, or excuse me, Native American populations have higher rates. There are uh, other groups where the where the rates are not substantially different. Uh, from uh, Caucasians at a young age. But again, you know, it's, um, uh, I think what I presented uh, uh, to you were the base rates uh, for the preteens that we study. This is sort of the baseline sample. The shocking thing to me was that already uh, we had 9% of children who said that uh, they um, had uh, injured themselves some, uh, somehow, purposefully so, uh, and uh, that uh, over 1% had already made a suicide attempt and 6% had already had thoughts. So those rates are relatively small. I do wanna say at nine and 10 years of age that uh, there were not differences between genders, not like we see with adults. So that emerges over the course of adolescence, that there is an exacerbation in, in uh, depression and suicidal rates uh, for girls rel relative to boys. Thank you. Are there any further questions from anybody? Thank you again to all our panelists. We'll now begin our 15 minutes, we'll now end our 15 minute question and answer. And we'll close now until the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Jan? Yes? Are you ready to introduce? Huh? Are you ready to introduce Ms. Ms. Hold on a second. Let me turn the volume up. I can't hear you. Hello? Yes, Jan, are you ready? Hey, Sarah, to... thanks for coming. <laughs> Hi, thank you for having me. Yes. Jan, what do you want to say about you? <laughs> well, it, I, I, I'm happy to do it if you would prefer. I would just say I'm introducing Sarah Platt, okay. a young lady who has agreed to speak with us about her experience. How's that? Perfect. Okay. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Sarah. Um, I am a person in recovery, so I've been sober for, I'll have five years in February. Um, I, well, I guess I'll just start at the beginning. So, um, growing up, I was one, I'm one of four. Um, I'm the second. So I was always very, um, I was a very anxious kid. I really tried to do everything perfect. Um, I did very well in school. I was always in the advanced classes, um, studied really hard, did all my homework, was devastated if I broke a rule or disappointed my parents. Um, and that kind of was my experience up until high school. Um, so I kind of should have known off the bat that drugs and alcohol were not for me, but the first time I ever drank, I was 14. Um, and I decided with two of my other friends that we were going to try drinking because we'd heard some of the older kids had been doing it and wanted to try and see what, um, all the talk was about. So we drank, um, and it's just so different in, this day and age. I feel like such an old person saying that, but with phones, it's so hard to just forget about things. If there's a video or a picture, it feels like it is out there for forever, which was um, what happened with me. So there was a picture, a video of us drinking, 
me and one other girl and it got sent to some of our friends from high school um and then that got sent to more people who got sent to more people and then the school administration knew about it and my parents knew about it people from our church knew about it and me being um a die hard rule follower it was devastating absolutely devastating i was humiliated um my my parents were very embarrassed um my mom didn't really know how to handle it and it just felt like my whole world my freshman year of high school was like crumbling around me um i i think i had a really hard time coping with it and i felt like my facade, me trying to be perfect, I feel like it was shattered. And I didn't really know who I was anymore. Um, and a lot of my friends stopped being friends with me. And I kind of um, got really depressed. And I, I isolated myself. And then I kind of started to look for friends who I felt like fit into who I was supposed to be now. So I went from somebody who never broke a rule, um, was really conscious always to make people happy. I was a big people pleaser and I felt like I wasn't that person anymore. So I started seeking out people who I felt like fit that narrative. Um, I started drinking a little bit more. I went to more parties. Um, and then eventually I started doing drugs. So the story seems like it's progressing very quickly, but I do want to say that addiction is, it's almost like watching your hair grow. You don't notice the day-to-day -day differences. It's like I could look in the mirror every day and my hair doesn't look any different, but I look back from a year ago and it's it's like it's grown a foot. And addictions are the same way. Like day-to-day, -day, it doesn't really seem that different until you look at yourself a year ago and think, how did I, how did I get here? Uh, this, this isn't me. And that was kind of what my experience was. So the more I started to do drugs, the more depressed I became. So substance abuse doesn't run in my immediate family. So my mom and dad, neither of them are alcoholics or addicts. So I didn't think I really understood or any of us really understood what was going on with me. Um, mental health does, mental health issues, anxiety, depression does run in my family. So that was kind of what we thought the issue was. Um, so I went from having like perfect attendance to not really going to school. I missed maybe um, one day every week and then two days every week. And then I got high and drunk on the weekends at parties and then on the weekends during the days and then after school on the weekdays um, and then during school, before school. And it just it just progressed. Um, it didn't seem quickly at the time, but it really did. I think I I think I kind of like fell in love very, very, very quickly. Um, so my freshman year, the second half, I kind of failed out of my advanced classes. I was in AP honors classes and I just couldn't keep up with the workload. I couldn't get out of bed. I, I, I just wasn't motivated to do anything. So I um, was sent to the hospital for a suicide attempt where I got help um, with my medications. I was taking medication at the time. And unfortunately, it didn't work very well. The medicine didn't work as it was supposed to because I was using drugs and alcohol. Um, but we tried to fix that. And I went back to school. And then my sophomore year, I failed out of my regular classes. And it was just so devastating. It was just so devastating. And it's hard to to like put it into words because it seems just like, well, I made a mistake and then started doing badly in classes, but it was felt like that was my whole identity. I had built my whole world around that and I just didn't, it felt like I had nothing else to offer. It, like I wasn't smart. I wasn't good at school. Um, I was disappointing my parents. My family was very upset with me. They didn't understand. And it just felt like I had nothing. I had lost a lot of my friends and I was just, I was just devastated. So um, I was put on a special schedule where I only went to school half days because my parents and the school thought that that would help me get to classes on time. Um, and that didn't help. 
I stayed just not going to school, not getting out of bed. My parents tried everything. They called the police, um, threatened truancy, and it just, none of it mattered. The only reason I got out of bed was to get drunk or high. And if I wasn't actively trying to get drunk or high, I was thinking about how I could get drunk or high. My whole world revolved around it. I went from um, constantly thinking about how to people please to constantly thinking about how to use drugs. So I went to rehab my first time the summer going into my junior year. So I think my parents kind of figured out what the issue was. I They knew I had been using drugs, but they didn't know the extent of it until I um, went to treatment for my first time. So I went to treatment there and it felt like it really opened my eyes. Like I really understood what my issue was because I think the thing about addiction is when you're not really sure what's going on, you just know that the only thing that makes you feel better is using drugs or alcohol. You don't really understand that that is the whole root of your problems. It seems like everything else is the problem. And the only thing that is helping are the drugs and the alcohol. So I kind of learned there how the drugs and the alcohol were affecting me. And it felt like everything made sense. Um, I wasn't stupid. I wasn't a bad person. I didn't like get joy out of disappointing my parents. I had an addiction. I had a disease. And that doesn't mean that my behavior was excused, but it made me feel better. It made me feel like I wasn't a failure. I was just really struggling with something. So junior year came around and my parents and I kind of came to the conclusion that there was no way I could go back to my old high school and be sober. Um, I'd been sober for a couple weeks, courtesy of rehab. And and knew that if I wanted to continue doing what I was supposed to do, that I couldn't do it at my old school. So we heard about a high school called Hope Academy, and we were so fortunate that it is it was right downtown, right in our backyard. Um, and it's a school for high school kids who have drug and alcohol problems. So that's pretty much what the whole school is centered around. There's like academic, the academic side, obviously high school diploma, and there's also the sobriety side. So you get like sobriety supports, you have um, a recovery coach that you talk to, meetings, all, all that kind of thing. Um, they drug test you. And it was just, it, it was like an environment where people understood um, what you were going through. So I enrolled there for my junior year and I had really done a lot of damage to my brain and I had missed out on a lot of schooling. So it felt like two years, I, I had no recollection of what I'd learned at all. And they were so patient with me because I really, I've, I mean, I've said it several times before, but I really felt like I was stupid and they, they really worked with me, um, helped me figure out what my strengths were and helped me get better in my weak areas. And it kind of felt like I was, you know, becoming the person that I'd wanted to be or becoming the Sarah that I knew two years prior. Um, but as we all know, um, recovery is not a straight line. There's hills, valleys, you know, and I relapsed after four months sober. So it kind of started as I had been sober for a while and thought that I could use normally. I thought that if I tried again, I would be fine and I would be able to stop. And we all know how that goes. So I relapsed, used once, and then thought, well, I'll just use one more time. And then I, I won't touch it again. I'll use one more time and then I'll be done. And then it was, well, I'll, I'll use one more time and then I won't touch it. And then it turned into, well, I'm going to fail my drug test anyway at school. So I'll just keep using up until my drug test. And it's just, I mean, you can see like the mental obsession come back. I was just constantly um, coming up with excuses as to why I could keep using drugs. And I went downhill fairly quickly. So the funny thing that I noticed, um, during this relapse was it's not like you start all over. So your addiction doesn't revert back to where it was the first time you used. It's kind of like you pick up where you left off. So it wasn't like I started smoking like once a month, smoking weed once a month and then worse my way up. It was like, I got right back on where I was headed and just kept going. Um, and I think that really scared my parents. It really scared me. 
it really scared my friends. And I just, it was like, I was a completely different person. Um, which is, which is just one of the hardest parts of addiction is that you're just not you. The things that make you, you are, are not there anymore. You're just totally consumed with, um, the getting and using of drugs, which was very evident in my behavior. So, um, my parents really, really, really tried to help me support me. And I ended up, um, running away from home. I put quotes around it because I wasn't gone very long, but I had it in my head at 16 that if I ran away from home and I could just drink and use drugs, how I wanted that, everything would be fine. It was, it wasn't the drugs fault. It was my parents. It was my schools. It was my friends. They didn't understand. So I ran away from home. Um, I, I don't really even know where I ended up somewhere two hours away from home with people I didn't know. Um, the police eventually found me after a day, brought me home. And it, it's just humiliating. It's obviously I was the one who chose to, to run away to do those things. But being caught, it's just, it's just humiliating. When you have to be faced with your decisions and the consequences of your actions in front of your family members, it just feels like you can't even cope with it. Um, and I remember being in a meeting with the administration at my new school and my parents. And the point of the meeting was basically, where do we go from here? What do we do? Because nothing seems to be working. Um, we, she went to rehab once. She was sober for a little bit, but we're right back to square one. So how, how do we help her? And I remember my mom looking at me and crying. And she just said, I don't know how to help you. I don't know how to help you. Please just tell me what it is. And I'll do it. I'll do anything because I just can't watch you destroy your life like this. And it's just such a surreal feeling knowing that you've caused so much pain, um, but that you would be willing to do it again, if that makes sense. It was like, I'd caused so much pain, but for me, it felt like the drugs were worth it. And I remember saying, none of you know what it's like. None of you know what it's like here, the administration and my parents. You guys don't know what it's like to wake up every day and have two decisions. Either you get high and you disappoint everybody around you, or you get sober and you're just horribly depressed. And that was what it felt like my life was. It felt like every day I was faced with that decision. Like, do I, do I stay sober? and feel suicidal or do I get high and make everybody um, disappointed in me again? And it just felt like there was no way to win. It felt like uh, no matter what I did, it wasn't going to be right, which is just such a hopeless, horrible place to be in, which is, I just feel like I just feel like when you get to that point in your addiction, where you realize that you have two options here. You either get better or you keep going down the path that you are and you end up in jail or you end up dead. It's, it's just so it's heartbreaking. It really, really is. And I had nowhere to go. I had no idea where I was supposed to go or what I was supposed to do. Um, so we decided that I would go to rehab again, but it was, a special rehab where it wasn't just for drugs and alcohol. It was also for mental health. Um, so if you haven't heard it before, normally mental health issues and substance abuse go hand in hand. So I had had some trauma, um, some sexual assault trauma from earlier in my um, drinking and drugging career that I hadn't really dealt with. Um, and then not to mention, I feel like I was embarrassed to use the word trauma because it didn't feel like um, it was bad enough. It didn't feel like what I experienced was bad enough to be called trauma. If, if you understand my meaning, it felt like trauma was what um, people who've been to war experience or people who have survived horrible car accidents or plane crashes. And it felt like what I experienced, um, like, getting too drunk or getting too inebriated and having someone take advantage of me didn't feel like it was, it was worth something, you know? 
And I think that was such a blessing to be able to go to this treatment facility and have my my eyes opened to to the fact that my pain was valid and that it didn't mean that using drugs and alcohol was okay or that it was excused but again it kind of reinforced what i learned earlier that i wasn't a bad person i had made some bad choices but i wasn't a bad person and i didn't deserve the bad things that happened to me and that i had so many more options in life than to either be sober and depressed or um, under the influence and a disappointment. So I was in that treatment center for about two months and um, I still remember it with such fond memories. I really do. It was an all girls treatment center and I felt like I it created such lifelong friends. I mean, I think there's something to be said with, well, one, you're living with these people, so you can't get away, get away from them, even if you wanted to. And you guys are all also in such vulnerable points in your life. You know, you all come, you're not, you don't go to that treatment center because you're like really killing it. You know, you go there because you need help and to be able to witness people's journeys and just witness like their raw healing and their raw pain is such a, um, it's such a, it's an experience that just connects people. Um, and it just felt like the girls that I was in this treatment center with, they lifted me up. It felt like, like they'd saved me and they'd offered me support, um, that I just, wasn't able to get from other places. And that's not to say that my friends or that my teachers or that my parents didn't give me support because they did. They gave me, they gave me an indescribable amount of support, but it was, there's something to be said for having someone who's been in the same, in the same trenches you've been, who knows what it feels like. Um, and you don't feel so alone and so isolated, which is one of the things that I think addiction is so good at doing is isolating you, making you feel like you're the only one who feels like this. But I just had such a connection and such a community with these girls. And I mean, I will forever be so thankful to them for all that they did for me without even knowing it. Um, so I got out of treatment and, um, I had such an incredible experience, but I think I just, I just wasn't done yet, um, which breaks my heart to say. So I started getting high again, once I got out of um, treatment and it breaks my heart to even say that because I just, it's just such a dark place to be in. Um, and I remember my dad has always been like my biggest supporter has, has always done everything that he could do for me. Um, even when saving me meant being my worst enemy. You know, he was willing to do it. He was willing to set down hard boundaries and make hard decisions um, that kept me safe. And he said to me one day, um, Sarah, I found all the bottles in the bottom of your closet. And when you turn 18, you are more than welcome to leave because I don't know how else to help you. You have younger siblings. Um, and we just can't keep, we can't keep doing this. And I remember guys, I was 17 and I crawled into the back of my dad's car and started kicking the back of his seat. I'm not, I'm embarrassed to say that, but I did. I acted like a child and kicked the back of the seat. Um, and I threw a fit and I cried and said, um, I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking. And of course I was. And he said, I don't want to hear your excuses. I just want to let you know that. So when you turn 18, you know, the choice is yours. You can get sober, you can leave. And that was February 6th, 2018. And that was my first day sober. I had plans to go home after school that day and drink. And I just, I couldn't do it. And it's not because I like suddenly saw the light and, and was ready to be sober. And it, it was the, I was so excited. It just felt like I didn't have it in me anymore. Like I literally couldn't lift my hand to pick up the bottle. I was just so exhausted, so exhausted. Um, and I went home and I went to bed and I just slept. And I mean, yes, I feel like I did get 30 days sober, but I think 25 of them were spent sleeping. So <laughs> um, sleep was kind of like my safe place for a while because I knew that if I was sleeping, then I wasn't 
I wasn't in danger of getting high or getting drunk. Um, so I did spend a lot of time in bed, but I spent that time in bed sober. So I'll take it. Um, but it was really, 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 really hard. It is, it was one of the hardest things I've ever had to do because there's good days and then there's bad days and the bad days are very, very hard. Um, and it just feels like you're never going to be happy again. It just feels like everyone around you for some reason has it figured out and they're living a happy life and you're just never going to be a part of it. And again, it's like the isolation is just so crippling. Um, and I just kept at it. And and one of the things that, again, saved my life, it wasn't the same girls from the treatment center, but the women in AA, women in recovery, um, my mom who loved me through everything, my sister who loved me through everything. Um, I created relationships with them and it felt like they, I mean, obviously I'm the only one responsible for my sobriety, but it felt like they kept me sober. Like they gave me a reason to keep going when I was, you know, having a horrible day. And I went to a meeting and I sat down in between, um, two of my gal friends. It felt like I wasn't alone anymore. And it felt like I had somebody who could stand there next to me while I fought this incredibly difficult battle and could lend me some of their strength. Um, and that's not to say that I didn't have healthy relationships with men because I did. My dad was amazing. My brother was amazing, but I just needed, I needed the love of women. I really, really, really did. Cause I think I not only spent a lot of time trying to, um, cope maladaptively with drugs and alcohol, but I also tried to seek out validation from, from men. Um, and that was just as toxic as the drugs and the alcohol were. And it felt like when I had a relationship with a woman, a friendship with a woman, that it was just so genuine. It felt like, like sisterhood. Um, and to this day, when I have sponsees or people that are trying to get sober, girls that are trying to get sober, I always say, surround yourself with a tribe of women, find yourself that find yourself a woman who has what you want that you look up to that you admire and, and just stick with them, stick with the winners because it, it makes the biggest difference in the world. Um, and if I didn't have the strong women that I'm blessed to surround myself with today, I, I wouldn't be here. I really, really, really wouldn't. And, and I don't know why that is. I don't know why, um, having them around me made such a big difference, but I'm, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna, I, I, I don't know. It just, it changed my life. It changed my life. And I wish, um, I wish I could give each and every gal, girl, woman who's trying to get sober a little piece of what I experienced because my life is just, it's so much more beautiful than I ever, ever, ever could have imagined. Um, I'm blessed to work with young girls who are trying to get sober. And when I hear them talk, it's, it's kind of like looking in the mirror four years ago, you know, and it just breaks my heart because I know I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to be alone, to feel like you have nothing to offer. Um, and it's just, it's just incredible that I was able to be helped out of that place um, by the hands of other women. So I'm very blessed to be able to speak to you guys today. And I'm very thankful that I get to tell you my story because um, I feel like I was, I truly was, I was blessed to be able to, um, survive, to be a person in recovery and to meet so many amazing girls. Um, and I want to thank you guys again for letting me speak. I know I have a couple more minutes. I don't know if I should leave time for questions or. Sure. If anybody has any questions to ask Sarah, please go ahead. I mean, if not, I'm more than happy to talk for, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, there are people in the chat who are chatting Sarah but thank you so much this has been amazing you're so brave and so honest of course. and I personally have learned a lot about recovery and the challenges that I didn't know about so thank you so much for coming and 
virtually from Indiana. Thank you. <laughs> of course, of course. And you guys are so kind in the chat. Thank you. They're all very, very sweet. My heart is happy. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Um, I can stay on a couple more minutes, or if you're ready, I can move on. Up to you guys. They're still chatting in the chat, Sarah. We love you and so forth. <laughs> oh, well, thank you guys. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to tell my mom. She's going to be so happy. <laughs> <laughs> this is an amazing way to spend my Thursday. Yeah. And what a cool thing to be a part of. Yes. Truly. Happy birthday, somebody said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's not my birthday yet, but I'll take the happy birthday. <laughs> Is it someone? <laughs> but I do have five years in February, you guys. Hopefully I'll get a really good gift. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> well, I'd like to hear that you are you will be sharing your experiences and that you're interested in helping other young people. And that's so important so that you, you've arrived at this place where your journey is still going, but you're strong enough and confident enough that you want to share and help other young people Thank with you. their recovery. Thank you so much. Oh, of course. And it keeps me sober, being able to help others. It, it keeps me going. Yeah. So, Well, there is something to say then for peers being very important in yeah. the recovery of people with oh, um, addiction. You have confirmed that today. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It really is. Okay, that's it. Sarah, thank, thank you so much. Oh, the next panel you. is Model Programs for Mothers with Alcohol Use Disorder, other, other Substance Use Disorders, and Children with Prenatal Substance Exposure. And Mary Kate Weber will be the moderator. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mary Kate Weber. And as Jan said, I'll be moderating this panel um, focused on model programs for mothers with alcohol use disorder, other substance use disorders, and children with prenatal substance exposure. I'm very pleased to introduce our panelists today, Dr. Andre Jones, Dr. Kiana Brown, Dr. Grace Chang, and Dr. Claire Coles. Following their presentations, we'll have a 15-minute Q&A with all of our panelists. Now let's please welcome our first presenter, Dr. Andre Jones. Thank you, Mary Kate, so much um, for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to share my screen now, and hopefully everybody can see that. Let me just make it big. Um, yeah, so with the time that I have, I was asked to speak about maternal opioid and stimulant use. And um, in order to be able to do that, I thought that it is important to level set in case um, people thought these, uh, but just it's just such a very incredibly sobering reminder of the challenge that we have in our country in terms of uh, overdose deaths. And I, I've been in this field many years and have never seen a line that looks like the blue one with the synthetic opioids other than methadone that's almost straight up. As you can see in the little yellow box, we've had a 39% increase from 2019 to 2021 um, in our total overdose deaths. And, you know, many years ago, it, it used to be we really focused on opiates, Ray. Oh, we're seeing those psychostimulants, we're seeing the cocaine, talk a little bit more about that. So we really do have twin crises of um, our opiates as well as our stimulants. And these are just some more data, just again, to kind of level set us, um, broken out by sex, uh, where we can see uh, females and males with our national overdose deaths with involving any opioids. And you can see both of those lines are going up a little more starkly uh, for men than for females. And then finally, when you look at figure six over here, um, you can see that all psychostimulants are in the blue. And then we can see that combination of psychostimulants with opiates. And so 
Um, again, these are just data just to remind us these are people's lives and it is incredibly more deadly for individuals to be using drugs in our country given um, the fentanyl that is out there. Fentanyl is that uh, often illicit opiate that is 50 times more powerful than heroin and 100 times more powerful than morphine. Um, and it seems to be in everything. I can tell you that the women and pregnant individuals that I have the honor and privilege of, of serving every day, they come in and to our prenatal care clinic and the vast majority of individuals have urines that are testing positive for fentanyl or the fentanyl um, to, uh, metabolites. And many of them are not even aware. Many of them are saying, I thought I was just using methamphetamine and they're coming up fentanyl positive. So it is something that is happening in the state of North Carolina and I'm hearing across many other places in the country. And this is um, just methamphetamine. We can see the overdoses uh, per 100,000 individuals. In the quote unquote old days, you can see the um, more dense version or the more dense data happened out west. Um, and now it is really swept across the United States into 2018. And we can see in West Virginia that they have um, the greatest density of uh, methadone overdoses. And then you can see here in this other part from Millennium Health that we've got methamphetamine positivity in urines, drug testing rose by 42%, fentanyl by 75%, which is just sort of that uh, sort of a underpinning of the anecdotal data that I just shared with you. And um, the combination, look at that, rose 153%. And there's lots of reasons why fentanyl is now more prevalent and methamphetamine is more prevalent. A part of that was accelerated uh, because of the COVID pandemic and changes in the way uh, the illicit drug manufacturers and distributors made their drugs and, and got them um, to folks across borders and um, during the lockdown and things like that, which we could have a whole nother conversation about. Uh, just to, again, kind of uh, remind us of the concerns that we are, are facing in our country, particularly for all people, including pregnant people, is fentanyl contamination. You can see this is just another piece of data to show that um, there was an increase in methamphetamine and positive um, uh, fentanyl tests together. And a lot of the cocaine overdoses that we're seeing are also intertwined with fentanyl. And so why might uh, people be using fentanyl. One, it's the um, drug dealers are contaminating with fentanyl. It's easy, easier to get people uh, addicted to fentanyl. They'll come back for more. Um, and then the other piece too is when you use these in combination, it can kind of take away um, the harshness of either substance. So it kind of it evens you out, which can be incredibly dangerous because then you're in the situation where those drugs are masking the high of each of the individual drugs. And um, we, as you can see here on this slide, we've got somebody saying, you know, it also helps me function. The other problem too is in many places, heroin's not even available. Fentanyl is the only thing. And so being, and sometimes when fentanyl's not available, uh, what people will use the only thing that is available to them, which might be methamphetamine. When we talk about pregnant individuals, these again are our national data. These are uh, self-reported past month use. This is not use disorder, uh, but this is self-reported use. And as you can see, 2016 in the light blue, 2017 in green, 2018 in gray, and 2019 in the dark blue, you can see that the most commonly used substances are tobacco and alcohol. I know that there will be more talks about alcohol in just a minute. Um, and so I wanted to just remind you all that we need to be talking about these fully licit substances. And then with the arc of marijuana legislation changing um, in terms of its legality across the country, we're seeing more, um, more, mar or more cannabis use. Um, so you can see that reflected uh, and when we have more cannabis use, we have more people that are using cannabis during pregnancy. And um, while I've just talked about the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, um, what we can see here is that in terms of our self-reported use, we have many fewer individuals during pregnancy that are reporting use, but that is not to say that it is something we should ignore. Um, it is something that is quite a concerning challenge for 
for us and we need to embrace people and help support them um, in many different ways to help them consider life changes or to be able to support them in the best ways possible so that they have the healthiest uh, birth outcomes and long-term outcomes for themselves as well as for their children. And so here we can see why this is important. We know that uh, the identification of neonatal abstinence syndrome has increased in the United States and since 2004, as you can see those numbers on the screen, 1.5 per 1,000 deliveries were identified in 2004, up to 7.3 out of every 1,000 deliveries in 2017. Um, and then when we have an, an increased rate of neonatal abstinence syndrome, that withdrawal that babies can experience uh, having been prenatally exposed to opiates and other substances, we also see a related rate, not surprisingly, and maternal related opioid diagnoses also going up. And you can read those numbers on the screen there. And what's important is that we need to differentiate um, between individuals that might have an untreated opioid use disorder with those who have a treated opioid use disorder with a methadone or a buprenorphine um, type product, because we know that neonatal abstinence syndrome is an expected condition that happens after patients have been taking methadone or buprenorphine but it is treatable and we are learning so much more about how to identify and how to treat. And there's been a lot that's happened with Eat, Sleep and Console. If you're interested in that, I'm sure people will be talking about that too. Um, so again, uh, just to recognize that there are radiating consequences for how our society responds to individuals who are using substances or have a substance use disorder during pregnancy or in the parenting period. And here you can see um, many times children are removed from their parents as, um, with a contributing factor being a, being a parent being identified as having substance use. So you can see the national averages there. There's wonderful conversations happening now about um, how to best care for children and how to best support and reimagine support for um, parents who are using or have use disorders and making sure that children are safe and parents are safe too. Uh, we could not talk about substance use disorder during pregnancy without talking about maternal mortality. We have um, a massive uh, structural discrimination challenge in our country where you can see that in this slide, non-Hispanic Black individuals um, are more likely to have maternal mortality due to all causes compared to the national average and compared to non their non-Hispanic white counterparts. And the slide at the, or the part at the bottom are our opioid related disorders or um, maternal mortalities that are overdose, oh, sorry, our maternal mortality that is opioid related. Um, and that has been going up in the United States. There is a tremendous amount of work that has been um, happening for maternal mortality review committees. The CDC has some terrific work and some really nice publications. Um, and so there's a lot that again is happening in terms of recommendations and opportunities for, um, for new ways of doing things, for reimagining and reconfiguring. This was uh, just a review that we wrote uh, just talking, recognizing uh, the stimulant crisis and how much it is intertwined with our opioid crisis. And uh, the good news is that there are well-proven interventions and treatments that we have used for years. Uh, one of those is contingency management plus a community reinforcement approach. We have some promising data on that. Um, unfortunately, you know, bench to bedside, uh, there is always there is you know a, a challenge in terms of the uptake, and so um, the good one of the pieces of good news is that uh, California, for example, has adopted contingency management as as a part of their state Medicaid as a way as an intervention for helping to reduce uh, substance use disorders um, and looking at stimulants as as a part of that. Uh, we have known for many decades, and it's in the night of uh, treatment principles, the effective use of contingency management, particularly for those that have stimulant use disorders and that have co-occurring use of um, opiates as well as stimulants. So there are um, treatments that are available. It's part of the challenge is learning how to scale them up. Um, in terms of medication to treat opioid use disorders, with the advent of um, fentanyl and the combination of fentanyl with methamphetamine, there has been a very dynamic time in terms of learning how to 
uh, initiate patients onto methadone and buprenorphine while, um, while they are withdrawing from fentanyl. And so there's a lot of papers that are coming out about that, some many different protocols, and there's still a lot of room for, for learning. Uh, we know that fentanyl can have um, increased tolerance as a longer, more variable half-life. There was a lovely paper that was just published that indicates, uh, that talks about advancing maternal age, actually predicted a slower conversion of fentanyl to norfentanyl, and then gestational age actually predicted a faster conversion. So there's, again, we, when we're thinking about urine drug testing and looking for fentanyl and fentanyl uh, metabolites, we need to be very careful, both looking at age as well as gestation. Um, and there's lots of creative strategies right now in terms of low dose initiation methods. And I wanted to just say something about that. Uh, so you'll hear a lot in the media and even maybe some of our colleagues are talking about microdosing. Microdosing is often known um, in as terms of hallucinogen microdosing. You'll see that whereas low dose initiation, dose initiation, particularly buprenorphine, um, is a strategy to help um, more comfortably initiate people who have been who have a who have been using fentanyl and have an opioid use disorder. And the idea is to titrate up the dose to make it more comfortable and more medically accurate. So please, when you're talking about these new types of uh, protocols, we want to be using the term low dose buprenorphine. Uh, we also definitely need to be talking about the racial disparities or the structural discrimination that still continues to happen in our country with access to medications to treat opioid use disorder and access to other forms of treatment. Here, we have a number of different studies um, and often we haven't as researchers really looked at the stra racial, structural racial issues or ethnic inequalities. Um, and when we do look at them, we don't do a very good job of describing them. Uh, Davida Schiff and her team has been looking at this and we certainly know uh, basically, that um, compared to uh, white women, non-Hispanic Black women have a, a harder time accessing medications, particularly buprenorphine, and are less likely to be remitted on those medications in large parts uh, because of differences in, with, uh, in structural racism. And when um, Black women are able to receive the medication, there was a paper that came out of um, Pennsylvania that showed that when they do, they are, Black women are getting a lower dose of methadone than their white counterparts. So this is an opportunity for us to look with an equity lens uh, how, we are, how, we are, how our protocols are for medication um, initiation, for access, for outreach, for all of those things. Um, and so when we think about this twin uh, crisis of opiate and stimulant use disorders during all individuals and particularly during that perinatal period, there are a couple of things that we can continue to do and do a better job of doing. First and foremost, um, making sure that we are universally verbally screening people, normalizing the idea that it is okay to say, yes, I am using substances and our response to it is what matters most. So when we say, thank you for telling me, let's get you some support. Um, we're gonna have a much greater opportunity to have trust. And I am convinced that change and honesty happens at the speed of trust. And so to, to be able to assess in a non-judgmental way, to have OB clinics that have not, like if you miss, if you come to your OB clinic two hours late, we're still gonna see you. That's what we do at Horizons. We are so thankful that you've got transportation to make it in. So having those flexible times, more frequent visits, so not carrying on the model of, oh, I can't see you until next month. We see everybody every two weeks. We have whole family care making sure that we're involving the pediatric um, colleagues as well as our social service colleagues. So when our patients come into our, U our UNC Horizons program, it is an integrated clinic. They see not only the obstetrical provider, they also see a peer support specialist or a case manager and a therapist. So our visits are longer. They're not the 15 minute prenatal care checks. They could be 45 minutes to an hour, but that's what our patients need. We've actually looked at our outcomes um, in terms from a racial lens, and we do not have differences in maternal mortality or in birth weight or um, uh, estimated gestational age differences. So 
We wanna be able to provide for all individuals a safe and dignified and compassionate care approach. We can use a shared decision-making approach to talk with patients, even something as small as, would you like the curtain open or closed when I leave? Making sure that we're knocking on the door and announcing our name before we walk in. Um, being able to make sure that we are really truly assessing people's pain and believing them when they say that they have pain and appropriately treating them for, um, for that postpartum labor and delivery pain. Making sure that we're talking about breastfeeding and helping give people the support, helping give people peers. So it, the best thing it, we, we ha that happens is when we have a real breastfeeding champion at Horizons and she ends up talking to everybody else and gets everybody else excited about it. And breastfeeding is hard and recognizing that. Um, and then of course, connecting to childcare and recovery and housing, which is by far the biggest challenge that we have. So just to summarize, um, we know that the drugs that people are taking are more deadly these days, and we need to give people support um, for how to make it safer for them to live a whole healthy life. And we need to be able to act on the recommendations that all of these maternal mortality review committees are coming out with, um, both on the state level and, the, and more nationally. We've got good treatment principles. We know what to do. Our buprenorphine dosing, methadone dosing may be more of a challenge, but everything else we've known how to do for 30 years, and we need to make sure that we're doing that to provide the compassionate care, to use our behavioral treatments that NIDA has invested um, in us and our taxpayer dollars has invested in us to be able to create these. So what can we do to help get them out to the general public that so might desperately need these? And then finally, just a reminder that when we provide safe, dignified, and compassionate care, we will have better healthy outcomes, healthy moms and healthy babies and healthy birthing persons. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for that excellent presentation. Um, if you have questions for Dr. Jones, please add them in the Q&A box and we'll be able to answer them at the end of the um, session today. I'd now like to turn it over to um, Dr. Kiana Brown. Good afternoon, everyone. I am just going to get into slideshow view here and um, get started in just a second, bear with me. So, I'm Dr. Kiana Brown, and I'm so honored to be here with you today, and I thank the NIAAA for inviting me. I am going to talk and I'm going to discuss prenatal cannabis use in the context of health and social equity. Like many of you, I am a scientist practitioner. I began my career as an Army nurse where I didn't treat many patients with substance use disorders. I eventually founded and directed a community-based nonprofit substance use disorder treatment center for women, Jane's House of Inspiration, named after my beautiful late mother, Jane, who suffered from substance use disorders on and off throughout her life. And there we are pictured together, <laughs> celebrating a moment of her recovery. And like any mother, while the celebration is for her, she's bringing me gifts to the party. <laughs> but nevertheless, um, fast forward to today. I am a substance use disorder epidemiologist, translational scientist, and social worker. And I'm here with you, the collective, the collective of people who have dedicated <sighs> bear with me <sighs> because while I'm skilled at this work and I'm expert in it, it is personal to me. We dedicated our careers to addressing substance use disorders amongst women and girls.
We have decades of training between us. Thousands of publications. And we've treated countless patients. All hard won victories. But I feel like I'm emotional here because it's frustrating. What is what is the end game? What is the what is the end game? Problematic substance use is still a major public health problem, particularly prenatal substance use. And when we think about the fact that only 10 to 20 percent of the factors that shape health can be attributed to clinical care and the other factors are other social determinants of health, it becomes clear or it should become obvious that the only way for prenatal substance use to become a problem of the past is if we address the social determinants of health that cause it, right? But we know this. I don't want to preach to the choir here. But despite our knowledge and our acknowledgement of the importance of addressing social determinants of health, this is not how we spend our money. Of the billions of dollars per year spent on healthcare in the United States, only a small proportion goes to public health activities that can actually address social determinants of health. While there was an increase in public health spending from 2.6% to 5.4% from 2018 to 2020, this is still dismally low compared to spending in other areas. And it's certainly, doesn't represent the value that we place on addressing social determinants of health. So given that we're not putting our money where our mouths are, right? I want you to think about these questions as I continue with this presentation. What is your role beyond clinical care in addressing the social determinants of health associated with prenatal cannabis use? What is your role beyond clinical care and reducing disparities in prenatal cannabis use? What is your role beyond clinical care in promoting health and social equity? Is the current system working? If not, how can you help change it? And what support do you need to drive change? So why is any of this important? is important because prenatal substance use is associated with poor maternal and child health outcomes to include maternal anemia, low birth weight, and neurodevelopmental deficits. <clears throat> Recommendations from health promoting organizations such as the ACOG or the American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists and the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend that people ex abstain from cannabis use during preconception, pregnancy, and postpartum. Despite these recommendations, and despite the potential maternal and child health consequences of prenatal cannabis use, prenatal cannabis use is increasing among pregnant and non-pregnant reproductive age women and burdened people in the US. In a study my colleagues and I published, we found that from 2002 to 2014, prenatal cannabis use increased in the United States by 62%. This represented 50,000 more pregnant women who used cannabis in the past month in 2014 compared to 2002. During the same time frame we found a 47% increase in cannabis use amongst non-pregnant reproductive age women and burdened people. 
representing near the, nearly 2 million more non-pregnant reproductive age women and birthing people who use cannabis in 2014 compared to 2002. And the trends are continuing with regards to prenatal cannabis use. In 2016, the prevalence of prenatal cannabis use was nearly 5%. This represents more than a 110% increase in prenatal cannabis use compared to 2002. Moreover, while prenatal cigarette use and prenatal alcohol use are decreasing, prenatal cannabis use is increasing. And we need to think about that seriously and think about why. But important to note, while prenatal alcohol use is decreasing, it's not decreasing significantly. We certainly need more research in this area because there has been decades, since certainly since before I was born, decades of public health messaging on the risk of prenatal alcohol use, including fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. But unlike the consistent health messaging we've had regarding prenatal alcohol use and its, and its risk, there's tons of misinformation regarding prenatal cannabis use. For example, cannabis dispensaries and internet sources are recommending that pregnant people use cannabis to treat pregnancy-related symptoms like morning sickness. This information, or misinformation rather, contradicts public health messaging, which might explain the decreases in perceived risk of prenatal cannabis use observed in the United States. So for example, in a nationally representative study, there was a 153% increase in the predicted probability of reporting that there is no risk associated with regular cannabis use. I just reviewed the risk, right? And this was among pregnant people in the US who use cannabis. There's no face validity there, right? So if you use cannabis, you might expect people that use cannabis to perceive cannabis not to be risky. However, what's striking is this 371% increase in the predicted probability of reporting no risk of regular cannabis use among pregnant women and birthing people who did not use cannabis in the past month. In the past month. What does that mean in terms of prevention? Essentially, all pregnant women, regardless of cannabis use status perceive cannabis use to be less risky. I wanted to, and I did, examine perceived risk of cannabis use and cannabis use more closely among, among pregnant women who use cannabis in the United States. So what I found among the proportion of pregnant women and birthing people who use cannabis was that they use when they perceive use to be most risky. So of the pregnant people who use cannabis, the majority use in the first and second trimester, nearly 54% use in the first trimester, 31% in the second trimester. But nearly 60% of pregnant people reported any risk of cannabis use during the first and, first and second trimesters. We need more research to examine this counterintuitive behavior. Moreover, perceived risk is a significant correlate of prenatal cannabis use, particularly in the third trimester, where the odds of past month cannabis use was over 14 times higher amongst pregnant people who perceive no risk of cannabis use compared to those who received, perceived any risk. So what are we gonna do? Is a, this is a population level problem. What are we gonna do and how are we gonna do it in a social political environment that puts more emphasis on criminalizing prenatal substance use to include prenatal cannabis use relative to treating it? 
25 states in DC have mandatory reporting laws that require physicians, social workers, and other healthcare providers to report prenatal cannabis use to Child Protective Services. 24 states in DC consider prenatal substance use, including prenatal cannabis use, child abuse, while only 19 states have drug treatment programs focused on prenatal substance use. This makes absolutely no sense. And an, and an important question to ask with regard to prenatal cannabis use, given that most states have legalized cannabis for medical or recreational purposes, is if cannabis use legalization will result in increases in mandatory reporting for prenatal cannabis use. We certainly need research and research funding to explore this. And it's not just mandatory reporting laws. I live in New Jersey, I'm a professor in New Jersey. There's no mandatory reporting laws. There are voluntary reporting laws. I, I teach social work students. My students come to me who have been social workers longer than I have. They're just coming back for, to school for advanced degrees. They tell me constantly that they're in family court because of prenatal cannabis use with their clients. This is in a state without a mandatory reporting law. My question to you is what does this mean to us as researchers, practitioners, policymakers and advocates. What are we really gonna do? And are we actually empowered to do it? So it might seem overwhelming and a bit abstract. How do you get started to address major population level health issues? It doesn't take that long. I wrote a script for you. And I challenge you that during the next 15 minute break or during this next conference break, I want you to call the righteous state legislators you can Google them. If you don't know who they are, just Google them. There's probably a web form on their website. It's very simple. That's why it only takes 15 minutes, right? Call and write your state legislators. Schedule a meeting with them. Tell them your ideas on how to protect pregnant individuals who use substances. That's why I asked you those questions at the beginning of the talk. Tell them your ideas. Give them specific examples of what's needed regarding equity-driven policy in this area and ask them to sponsor a bill and hold them accountable to that. Ask them to repeal mandatory reporting laws that criminalize prenatal substance use if you live in one of those 25 states. The American College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists have been working for a decade to get the over a decade to encourage physicians and other healthcare providers to work with policymakers to repeal these laws. Does it really take that long? Clearly, there's some barriers that aren't so easy to address. We have to get suited up for the long haul and the hard work, right? So if you need more examples of what you can do, please read these two articles that I published with my colleagues in Addiction and GEMMA Network Open, making recommendations specifically as to how we as researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and advocates can protect pregnant people and their babies with regard to prenatal cannabis use and prenatal substance use in general. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Brown, for sharing your passion and this excellent presentation. Um, if you have questions for Dr. Brown, please add them to the chat to the Q&A box and we'll work to address those at the end of the session. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Grace Chang. Thank you so much for the privilege of presenting on this panel and I am very, humbled uh, to be with such a distinguished group of women. Um, I'd like to talk about maternal alcohol use, our past efforts prologue. And I think this 
ties in with um, some of the points that have been made earlier about the challenges and maybe how we shouldn't be complacent. I just want to make sure that you all can see my slides. Is that correct? Okay. I'll... Thank you. All right. Let's see. Um, but now I have to be able to advance them. I may need some professional assistance here. Okay, great. So for the audience, I just want you to know that I got help uh, with reviewing the literature and that I do receive some royalties from up to date. This is my plan. I wanted to go over the critical background. I wanted to summarize the past decade of research and I wanted to talk about the next steps. Dr. Roach asked me to talk about model programs for mothers with alcohol use disorders. And I told her I wasn't actually sure there was anything particularly model-like, but that we needed to look at the evidence and then figure out what comes next. The critical background is that we really need to know about the consequences of prenatal alcohol exposure, the prevalence and the recommendations from professional groups. And I think what we're really hearing what we've been hearing throughout the day and through this panel is that there's probably no safe alcohol or any drug during pregnancy. And Dr. Coles, who will be the final speaker for our panel is the world's authority on the consequences of prenatal exposure, but I'm just going to give you some highlights. Prenatal alcohol exposure is linked to miscarriage, stillbirth, preterm birth, and sudden infant death syndrome. It's the only necessary cause of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. It's the leading preventable cause of disability. And despite what we've done so far, we can do more. Efforts to reduce prenatal alcohol exposure and the incidence of FASD, fetal alcohol spectrum disorders are still very much needed. How often do pregnant women drink? Um, Dr. Brown pointed out there's been a decrease, but maybe it's not enough. It's maybe too much. It's been reported that approximately 13.5% of pregnant women will drink, 5.2% will have binge drinking. And we heard earlier this morning that very alarming trend that younger, it's younger uh, girls uh, and teens with the highest rates of binge drinking. The National Birth Defects Prevention Study, which um, looked at a larger sample, actually came up with the number of maybe about a third of pregnant women who drink. Healthy People 2030 goals is to increase the abstinence rate to 92%. And so we're a little bit far away from that. The most prudent recommendation is to abstain because you know what? There's no safe drinking limit during pregnancy. The World Health Organization guidelines was published in 2014, and I had the privilege of working with many of the people who are here today. Um, and the purpose of these guidelines was to, was to enable health professionals to assist pregnant women who used alcohol or drugs. It was a multinational effort. It was amazing. Um, and it used the grade system to assess the quality of evidence and reviewed the literature. Screening and brief intervention garnered a strong recommendation for, despite the low quality of evidence, and psychosocial interventions to prevent prenatal alcohol exposure and the incidence of FASD got a conditional recommendation because of the very low quality of evidence. And examples are motivational interviewing and home visits. That was in 2014. What do the professional organizations say? Well, the American College of OBGYN um, issued a committee opinion and created an ethical framework for doctors and encouraged routine screening methods, brief interventions and referral to treatment, much like what Dr. Jones described. The Society of OBGYN in Canada said, we should ask all pregnant women about alcohol use with evidence-based screening and brief intervention approaches. 
What does the past decade of research show? There are four major themes of the research in the past decade. We did a literature review uh, beginning in 2011. These were the databases we searched. These were some of the terms. We got 238 records, 217 were eliminated. And, and, and at the end of the day, 21 studies were reviewed and there were four overarching themes that I can tell you about today. The first theme is case management. This is an intervention to reduce prenatal alcohol exposure, usually consists of a home visit or case management, most relied on motivational interviewing and community reinforcement. There were four studies, two were unblinded indication prevention efforts without comparison groups, two studies used a randomized controlled design. I can just say a few words about the um, Catherine et al study from 2020, where public health nurses provided frequent one-to-one -one home visits from early pregnancy to age two. This was an amazingly luxurious program uh, where people had up to 14 prenatal visits and 50 postpartum visits for 739 pregnant women. The goals were to see if there was going to be a reduction in prenatal substance use. Um, and at the end of the day, no evidence, there was no evidence that the nurse um, program was effective in reducing prenatal alcohol or cigarette use. So what's the main point about the case management approaches? It doesn't appear, they don't appear to have strong empirical support and consistent with the WHO guidelines uh, published mid-20s. Mid mid the next major effort or type of intervention is preconception trials to prevent alcohol exposed pregnancies. These are five studies based on the project choices paradigm, um, basically motivational interviewing and cognitive behavioral strategies. And the target is to adopt effective contraception and to reduce alcohol use. So the point is that women who are at risk, women who are of childbearing age, who aren't using effective contraception and drink at risky levels are offered this approach. It's a consistent approach. There's a baseline assessment. There's randomization to motivational interviewing with assessment and feedback or comparison condition. And people are evaluated three to 12 months later. What's, com what's the common finding? In contraception is improved, but alcohol use is not reduced. What's the take home here? The project choices, preconception approach to preventing alcohol exposed pregnancies appears to exert its primary effect by improving effective contraception in sexually active women of childbearing age rather than reducing alcohol use. And we also don't know what happens when the women become pregnant by choice. Another major category of effort, motivational interviewing and screening and brief intervention to reduce alcohol use. That is screen and assess, do a brief intervention, perhaps make a referral to an expert for treatment. In the past decade, there were two studies. This, were, this technique was something that was much more popular um, uh, in, the time, in the decade before. There were two small randomized trials that affected, evaluated the effectiveness of a single session motivational interviewing to reduce alcohol use in pregnancy, and they were small. Study one had 67, study two had 122 women, and really at the uh, results showed that there were no significant differences between the groups in both studies. The, researchers felt that there were very low baseline levels of drinking, so it was hard to have improvement. And it should be noted that comprehensive assessment common to most research studies may exhibit an independent therapeutic effect. Take home. These two small trials do not demonstrate a, that a single session intervention will influence drinking behavior over the course of pregnancy. This last category of 
research, the use of technology is probably, in my opinion, the most exciting. And there were all these different types of technology that were evaluated, text messages, telephone-based interventions, computer-based interventions, and a very novel application of 4D ultrasound. And I'd like to tell you about them. So there were two, two major studies that looked at text messages. Text for Baby is a social cognitive theory-based mobile health program delivering health messages to pregnant women and new mothers. And there were two studies um, that had nearly a thousand women if you combined. They were uh, completed by the same research group. They included baseline evaluations, randomization to text for baby plus usual care or usual care with follow-up. Among the lower income pregnant women and of 123, there were, were in fact significant there was in fact significant improvement of out attitudes toward alcohol consumption and stronger attitudes against prenatal alcohol use. When this same research group tried this study in a larger sample of 943 military women, they didn't find any um, study effects. So how about the telephone? Two studies of a preconception intervention for sexually active women of childbearing age who drank and did not use effective contraception. So as you can see, it's kind of a variation of the theme of the project choices paradigm. Uh, project early remote uh, was offered to 46 non-treatment seeking women. Uh, there was no comparison group. It was one session um, and there were reductions in drinking. There was a randomized trial of 132 women where there was a brief two session interview via the telephone or in person. At six months follow up, there were no differences between the groups. So it may be that we've moved beyond the telephone. What about computer based interventions? There were five studies that looked at uh, computer-based interventions in both preconception and pregnant women. Uh, I won't go through all five studies, but I have listed them here for your information and should you want to look them up. Um, one of the most interesting ones is this randomized cluster trial of 60 Dutch midwifery practices com that compared health counseling and computer tailored feedback letters versus usual care. Uh, this was a very difficult study to implement, but it tried to approximate real world practice. So this is something that is very different, 4D ultrasound. This was a very novel randomized trial that included 90 pregnant women who were attending an OB clinic in Finland. And the women had either current or recent use of substances, including alcohol. The women were randomized to either get usual care or had the opportunity to meet with an ultrasound specialist and saw the fetus at 24, 30, and 36 weeks. And the idea was that maybe by seeing the ultrasound, the women would feel more connected with the baby. Outcome? similar rates of fetal drug exposure and perinatal outcomes. It, they did also find that more women attended the 4D ultrasound sessions than treatment as usual. What's the technology take home? Well, it looks like maybe text messages and telephone-based interventions are not that promising. Computer-based interventions, novel approaches appear to be promising. You know, we've gone through COVID. There's been, this has been an inflection point for us as a society and how we offer healthcare. What about virtual interventions? What about larger studies of the most promising approaches? What are the next steps? Well, evidence-based approaches to reduce prenatal alcohol exposure and the incidence of FASD are promising, are pending. There are promising approaches. But I wanna echo something that Dr. Brown had mentioned and that Dr. Jones also mentioned. We have to look at a multi-pronged approach. 
FASD is a complex developmental disability that's determined by not just one thing, a range of lifestyle, sociodemographic, maternal, social, gestational, and genetic factors. And many studies had a very, very narrow focus that did not include the complexity of current childbearing. One thing to think about is, is the demand for evidence-based approaches, has it had unintended consequences? No safe drinking limit. Some people have interpreted to mean, it means you can drink while you're pregnant. I'd also point, like to point out some secular trends. There's been increased alcohol use amongst women during and since the COVID-19 pandemic, and that there has been a mistrust, growing mistrust of science and professional advice with historic roots. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Dr. Chang, for that excellent presentation. Um, if you have any um, questions for Dr. Chang, please put them in the chat in the question and answer box and we'll address those at the end of the panel. Um, now I'd like to welcome Dr. Claire Coles. Hello, I hope that that is sharing effectively and then is in the right part of the screen. Yes. Um, it's always an adventure. Uh, I'm gonna talk about prenatal exposure to alcohol and other substances. Uh, and I'm gonna describe a model for the care of affected children. I, there is so little um, really good research on this that I'm not going to review research. I'm gonna talk about a model which we developed and um, the reasons why we developed it. I want to acknowledge the very wonderful people who support our laboratory. This is the Center for Maternal Substance Abuse, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Emory University School of Medicine. And as you see, we have both the state um, and various federal organizations, the Organization of Territorial Information Specialists, and so on, as well as the SKK Foundation who support our efforts. And I have no conflict of interest to report. Uh, I'm going to talk specifically about uh, prenatal exposure and specifically about the effects on the child. Um, as everyone else has been saying very cogently, the type of drug use in the last month when we look at pregnant women is essentially the most commonly used substances are tobacco, alcohol, and marijuana. A great deal of attention legally uh, is turned to cocaine, heroin, methadone, um, methamphetamines, uh, opioids, and prescription medication use, which are illicit. And many people end up in the system as a result of that. But always and consistently, alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana are the most commonly abused substances. When we look at the long-term effects, of these substances in pregnancy. There is evidence for persistent deficits, even when we account for SES and postnatal environment. And I do not in any way discount that, and I agree with Dr. Chang's statement that there are multiple factors that enter into this. However, even when we are able to control for those things, we still see some effect of the alcohol, particularly alcohol, but also tobacco and other drugs. Um, and there is certainly an effect of those substances on the social status or social circumstances of the woman and her family. And that also has a huge effect on the child's development. So these things are completely interlinked. For some drugs, we find clear evidence of neurological basis for the behavioral findings. For others, this has not been so well established. For some drugs like alcohol, there may be global deficits. But in addition, there may be specific cognitive problems in a number of areas um, that we look at when we're looking at development, motor function, visual spatial functioning, um, cognitive functioning of various kinds, and eventually social behavior and 
and psychiatric disorders. And we are beginning to discover through uh, following up cohorts of individuals into middle in midlife that there may be long-term effects on physical and mental health. Particularly, we've been looking at alcohol, but this is true uh, in many other areas as well. I'm gonna briefly mention um, three important drugs, um, but I don't mean to slight the rest. I'll be happy to ask questions about them. One of the most commonly used drugs, period, and in pregnancy is tobacco. And we talk about prenatal tobacco exposure. The outcomes that we often see include lower birth weight, increased respiratory problems in the infant, more otitis media is reported when the child is in the first year of life. And then we have found specific auditory processing impairments. And this was originally identified by our laboratory in a paper that um, Dr. Cable is the first author on, in which we looked at brainstem functioning and were able to determine that prenatal exposure to cigarettes or nicotine uh, resulted in alterations in the acetylcholine functioning, and that affected the perception of sound. Interestingly enough, in 2021, that uh, particular finding was confirmed in a much larger sample, which I found very gratifying. Um, auditory processing deficits do lead to reading problems and what is called dyslexia. And then there's been multiple um, reports of short and long-term behavioral dysregulation in children whose mothers smoke during pregnancy. And this has included um, alterations during infancy, ADHD in children in midlife in school age, and even criminal behavior in a sample taken from some of the uh, Scandinavian databases and published by Patty Brennan and all. As you all know, um, I think, there are potential effects of alcohol use in pregnancy. And these include the fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. They include growth retardation, global cognitive deficits in some cases, as well as specific neurodevelopmental impact, which can be associated with academic deficits. They may also include arousal dysfunction, emotional development problems, specific problems with executive function, conduct disorders, and long terms on health. Another area which uh, was uh, Dr. Jones discussed was effects of opioids on the fetus and newborn. And as we know, opioids cross the placental barrier just as they cross the blood brain barrier. We do see growth retardation in this group, although that usually is overcome as the child is born, after the child's born. Um, there is a higher incidence of fetal loss or stillbirths. And methadone maintenance does often result in development of tolerance or dependence in the infant. And that can lead to, as mentioned, neonatal withdrawal syndrome, which is a in increasing and uh, persistent problem in children with these kinds of uh, exposures. Very important in addition, as was mentioned, is the social risk for children of drug abusers. There is a much higher risk for placement outside the home for such children. And this is gonna depend not only on the behavior of the parents, but also the specific drug laws within different states or the specific laws in different states about um, maternal substance use during pregnancy. Such children are more likely to enter the foster care system and they're more likely to remain longer in foster care. They also show a higher rate of school absenteeism and when you look at the statistics on these things, they're three times more likely to be abused and more than four times more likely to be neglected than other children. Obviously, these factors lead to all kinds of consequences themselves. We had done a lot of research on these things for many years, and it became apparent after a while that doing research was not sufficient in and of itself, that we had to do something about what we were seeing. We were able to receive funding from the state of Georgia uh, to set up a model program to provide treatment to children affected by alcohol and drugs to, to exposure to affect uh, children affected by exposure to alcohol and drugs, I'm sorry. Um, it's currently called the Emory Neurobehavioral Exposure Clinic. 
And the goal of this uh, clinic is multidisciplinary assessment and treatment for the complex problems that result from being born to a woman who was unable to um, effectively deal with her substance use problems during pregnancy. The mission of, of this program is to treat children zero to 21. Uh, and as part of this, we do comprehensive diagnosis as well as treatment of the effects of the prenatal exposure to alcohol and drugs. Very important to us is that we have to do it within a developmental context. One of the um, bones I sometimes wanna pick with child psychiatry or psychology is that, because uh, I'm a developmental psychologist originally, um, is that they often um, are looking at children from sort of an adult perspective instead of from a developmental perspective in which you are looking at how a child grows and changes and the factors that um, affect the child as they're growing. And so we try very much within this clinic to take a developmental context to understand where a child should be, how a child typically develops and the things that um, are important to the child. We also believe very strongly in taking into account the multiple environmental factors that influence development and developmental psychopathology. We assume that a multidisciplinary perspective is most effective in understanding and addressing these complex problems. And by a multidisciplinary perspective, I mean, I'm a psychologist, but I certainly don't know everything. And most of the children we're dealing with have problems that involve um, social issues, so social work. They involve medical issues, so a developmental pediatrician is necessary. They may involve multiple other medical specialties. They may need the um, treatment, the assessment and treatment from people who are working with speech, language, uh, um, <coughs> occupational and physical therapy, um, and the educational issues that arise with these children are extremely important. Uh, many of them have behavioral problems that require psychiatric care. So in order to be, uh, to apply, uh, pro provide the appropriate care for such children, we have to be able to understand and take into account all of these different perspectives on the child. And I want to show you a little bit about the pattern of drug exposure that we see. These are the substances that were used by mothers of the patients that we have seen in, in fiscal year 21. As you can see, about 56% smoked tobacco. Uh, more than 50% used alcohol, more than 50% used marijuana. Cocaine was being used by 42%. Opiates come next and stimulants. Um, then there are other prenatal exposures that occur, other illicit drugs, mood stabilizer, and even um, SSRIs, which some people believe have effects uh, when used during pregnancy. Very important to understanding the, the need for care for such children is to look at the caregiver information. Um, when we children come to us, most of them are not in the care of their birth parents. About 2.2% are with their biological parents at the time we saw them. Uh, a good 41% are in the custody of the county, which is called DFACS in Georgia. Another 35% have been adopted, and another 16 some percent are with their um, relatives. And then there's a small slice called other. Um, when we look at the mother's statistics, we see that about 24% have current or history of incar incarceration. 52% about have current or history of mental health conditions and almost 85% were poly substance abusers. So I think it is evident from this that the group that I'm dealing with at this clinic are extremely high risk children. And they come from a background that is 
fraught with social problems. What services do we provide to these children? Well, we have a, if you look at the little green box, we have a number of different sub clinics. We have a new diagnostic clinic where we try to identify the factors involved and the needs the child has. We have a medications management clinic where children are referred specifically to deal with medication issues. We provide follow-up and monitoring of development for children we've seen for new diagnoses. Um, there is educational testing intervention and consultation available. And we also provide direct intervention um, for psychiatric and psychological services for children and families. Um, we do this by working with all these different uh, specialties, pediatric. Uh, pediatrician provides a comprehensive pediatric evaluation, as well as a dysmorphology exam examination to determine whether there might be alcohol effects. And psychiatric is a medication management consultation, psychological, um, developmental and psychological testing, behavioral management, parent coaching and psychotherapy. And the educational specialist provides special education consultation, educational testing, consultation with the schools. And then she also runs a Saturday cognitive rehabilitation clinic out of the goodness of her heart. <laughs> which is um, extremely valued by the people who come to it. I wanna provide you with um, two case studies that'll give you an example of what the children are like who come to the clinic and what kinds of diagnoses they get. And none of the, these names have all been changed as well as the specific details to um, protect the identities of the individuals involved. Uh, this is Elizabeth's mother, and this was, we obtained this information from birth and social service records. We always obtain birth and social service records whenever possible, which is quite frequently, in order to have a really good understanding of the context. Uh, this child, this mother was 33 when she was born. She was homeless when she pre presented for delivery. The birth father was older and was incarcerated. The birth mother had not received any prenatal care during this pregnancy. She had a history of panic attacks, anxiety, and drug abuse, and was identified as using methamphetamines and cocaine. She was also a tobacco smoker. She was diagnosed with depression. She began taking Zolo Zoloft one week before delivery and was taking codeine. She had a history of infections, including UTIs and hepatitis C. Shortly before her daughter's birth, she had a massive right intracranial, intracranial hemorrhage and, and never recovered. She was in a coma for two months um, with a left-sided hemiplegia and a feeding tube, and she survived for a couple of months. It is believed that um, drug abuse was associated with the hemorrhage. The child was born uh, by C-section uh, at 38 weeks due to the maternal stroke. She was referred to the neonatal intensive care for observation for needle natal abstinence syndrome. She was monitored for hepatitis C until she was 18 months old. We, uh, she was referred to us at 16 months. And at that time, uh, developmental testing indicated she was functioning in the mildly delayed range at the second percentile in terms of her scores. We referred her for early intervention services and recommended developmental follow-up. She was placed in foster care uh, and at two years of age adopted by her foster family. When we reassessed her at three years, we found that her cognitive scores had improved. And at this point, her scores were at the 16th percentile, which is considerably better than previously. Uh, although her nonverbal scores are relatively weak, we ruled out fetal alcohol syndrome and we recommended continue with regular monitoring of developmental skills. And we're working on transition to a special needs police preschool arrangement for her. We will continue to monitor her as the fa family wishes, of course. Here's another case, and this is Anna. Uh, she was referred due to concerns about prenatal exposure and developmental delays. She came to us at 19 months was a spontaneous vaginal delivery at 35 weeks gestational age. Um, 
And this points up an important characteristic of children that we see. They're frequently preterm and they're frequently small for gestational age or SGA. This child's birth weight was at less than a third percentile. She had APGARs at five and eight. And those of you who are familiar with APGARs will know that uh, APGAR of five is a risk, risky score. And she did require a feeding tube. The birth mother was in her fifth pregnancy. Um, she had a number of other conditions, um, including depression. She was reported to be a polydrug user and to have been diagnosed with a substance use disorder. She acknowledged the use of heroin, methamphetamines, marijuana, cocaine, and alcohol. The cord blood was positive oxycodone, Ativan, and Xanax. There's no information about the birth father. So the child was heavily exposed to a multitude of drugs. She was originally released to the maternal grandmother, which is a very common uh, situation. However, she was re-hospitalized at three months with failure to thrive and at that point taken into custody by the county. She then had three other foster care placements and was finally placed with a family who wished to adopt her. When we reviewed the pediatric records, we noted severe reflux and developmental delay and feeding continued to be a problem. She was getting OT through the county early intervention program and a remote speech language therapy as we were in the midst of COVID. And I don't know how useful remote speech language therapy is for a 90 month old, but uh, when we saw her, um, and I put the, her part of her face up there so you can see the features that are highly associated with FAS. When we uh, looked at her, we found current weight and height to be at the third percentile. She had what's called symmetrical growth failure. So it was across the board, height, weight, head circumference. Um, multiples of dysmorphic features were noted, including a short palpebral fissures, epicanthal folds, trabismus, antiverted nares, an indistinct filtrum, and a flattened vermilion. All of those are highly associated with uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. She also showed significant delays in cognitive language and motor development with her language at an eight month level. Remember that she's 19 months old. Again, we, we emphasized that she needed OT and speech therapy and suggested that she should be in a comprehensive day program and that social security disability should be investigated. We also recommended what's called adoption assistance due to the high risk for developmental behavior complications later on and recommended a reassessment at 24 months. This all um, emphasizes the couple of things. Number one, how very complicated the care of these children is and how important it is to get accurate records and understand the child within the context. And at the same time, to um, monitor the child carefully over time. If we look at the statistics on the children we're seeing here in our clinic, about 34% are foster care, 35% have multiple placements, 35, 20% of the mother is incarcerated, 57% maternal co comorbid mental health issues, this is, and 86% polydrug exposed. Uh, among the children we saw at the clinic this year, and the year's not over, 22-23% uh, had fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, 24% had neonatal abstinence syndrome, 32% suffered from neglect and deprivation, almost 16% had been physically abused, and 5% had been sexually abused. After a lot of experience with this, we have decided, we suggest that in setting up a clinic of this sort, there are certain elements that are important for the care of drug and alcohol exposed children. Strongly, strongly indicated early identification. The earlier the child is identified, the more uh, effective in early intervention is. Um, it's also important that caregiver support be in place either through a foster care, uh, a supportive family member, or a program that supports the birth mother so that she can provide uh, appropriate care. We also strongly believe that it's necessary to have a comprehensive multidisciplinary assess assessment 
who will be involved in that is going to vary depending upon the age of the child. Again, remembering the developmental appropriate care. Um, but it will not be just one professional. It will be a variety of professionals who will need to be supportive of the child with this kind of complex and difficult life. And again, I, we strongly advocate developmentally informed assessment and care so that the professionals working with the child understand the nature of appropriate development and appropriate intervention. It is, I think, necessary that we have clinics with knowledge of effects of prenatal exposure. I do not think that this is very common. I think that this is um, often missed by people who are not aware of the implications of this or are not aware of the complexity of, or, or, or the appropriate methods for approaching it. It's also extremely desirable to have a referral network. And we work with every, people from around the state to be able to connect children up with care because they can't all, we can't do very, we can do very little actually because there's so many children and they have such complex needs. It requires a much more comprehensive um, accessing of, a, of the referral networks. And we also strongly argue that periodic, periodic monitoring of child, of the child's status is necessary to identify what's working, what isn't working, uh, and also to provide anticipatory guidance as necessary. And thank you for your attention. And Thanks so much, Dr. Coles. And um, thank you again to all of our panelists for sharing their work and insights on this important topic. Um, we'll now move into the um, question and answer session. And I invite all of the panelists to turn on your cameras if you so choose. Um, and to the audience, please continue to put your um, questions in the chat. And I know we do have quite a few, which is great. Okay. First question is, while the evidence is clear that drug and alcohol abuse among women is on the rise, how do we explain why? How does this affect children? Is there an ultimate difference between a mother or father with an addiction problem? That's actually three questions, <laughs> but if you wanna answer any of those, um, feel free. Or I'm happy to repeat them one at a time. I can, I can start with answering part of that question. The why, I mean, we need to work with mothers, parents, fathers, parenting people, ask them. <laughs> I mean, sometimes it goes back to Thomas. I know we presented a, a lot of data and research, and that's all great because we need science. But if you want to understand why, ask them why. Let's start there. Let's start there and build up. Right, and we see parents, pregnant people, fathers who use substances in our clinics. Ask them why are they using? What can we do to help you in a holistic way? Dr. Jones talked about her clinic and how it doesn't just treat the issue, what might, for face value, seem to be substance use, but it treats the whole, the person as a whole, you have to address the other needs. And then from there, your practice experience with finding out why can inform research. And we, we you know, the scientists can take it from there. I'll just build on Dr. Brown's very lovely answer and it's terrific presentations all around. It's such an honor to serve on this panel with people I deeply admire. Um, and just to kind of expand, I think access I think you know the alcohol industry, as well as the cannabis industry, as well as the tobacco industry, have all targeted women. You know, there used to be that traditional old gap of um, women were more protected, and and that's kind of seems you know, there's data to suggest that that's gone away, and because women are drinking more, using more tobacco product, products, vaping more, 
and using more cannabis products. And there are, um, there are certainly reports out there to show that the cannabis industry specifically targets women. Alcohol industry, think about all of the labels that are out there, skinny girl, you know, alcohol. And so they, they know what sells and they are, they are very well funded um, to advertise in very subtle ways as well as um, not so subtle ways. And so I think when we have more products out there, I think about Disney World. Um, 20 years ago, Disney World didn't sell alcohol in all of their places. Now, everywhere you go, you can't get away from some little vendor, some little something or other where there's alcohol. So there's more of it. When there's more of it, use goes up. Um, so, I, and then in terms of how it affects the children, I mean, I think I'll let Claire Coles answer that, but I, I really think it is, it's so dependent on the family structure, the supports that are there. Um, and so there isn't one clear answer overall about how it affects children, but we know that certainly growing up in an addictive home and with adverse childhood events, um, that the more ACEs that we have, you know, there's a relationship with more mental health and physical health problems later on. So I'll leave it at that. Well, I think I, if I can talk, um, I think I sort of went over how it affects the children. Um, and it, it can affect the children from not at all to very severely, depending upon the child and a lot of other circumstances. And in terms of a difference between mother or father with an addiction problem, there's very extensive literature on children of alcoholics, for instance, um, which mostly we're looking at the children of fathers who were alcoholics. Um, and it is pretty clear that it is not a, a healthy thing to have a parent who is a substance user um, that there are a lot of uh, consequences in, in emotionally for that. Thanks for that. Um, another question, um, do you each have advice on how to combat what Dr. Brown discussed, the perception that can cannabis use in pregnancy is safe or safer than other substances? And related to that, how to get away from the issue of whether it's legal or not. For example, alcohol is legal as well, and yet it's not safe in pregnancy. I, I can start. So safer is not safe. That's what we have to promote um, in terms of health messaging. Cannabis is not a... <clears throat> Uh, you know, a, a, a risk-free drug, M maybe it's not going to harm everyone or everyone to the same degree, but it's certainly <clears throat> contraindicated during pregnancy. So making it clear that safer is not equivalent to safe, right? There's no, there's no research that supports any safe level, safe level of cannabis use during pregnancy, right? So more, and, and so, point people to the research, <laughs> point them to the science on cannabis use, which is still developing. But for what we have available, there are associated risks. So um, have evidence informed conversations with people. That's, that's one way to start. And in terms of legality, in terms of cannabis use laws, <clears throat> These laws, they're helpful in many ways, right? But we have to ensure health equity and social equity in terms of policies. If our state legislators aren't considering the potential unintended consequences of policy across the board, cannabis use legalization just being one example, that's problematic. So as we, we have to work, we have to work with legislators, work with communities to ensure policy is driven by equity. That's just the work. Anyone else have any thoughts? Um, just in terms of the legality, uh, so often um, we do need to educate our policymakers that a legal substance doesn't mean less harmful, right? Or an illegal substance doesn't mean 
more harmful necessarily. And so, uh, you know, kind of changing the conversation from legality to what are the outcomes you're trying to achieve? And you can do that with the policymakers. You can do that with the patients that, you're, that you serve. You know, when you're using cannabis, what is the outcome you're trying to achieve? And let's talk about that. What, how, how is it working for you? How is it not working for you? Um, what are some of the other things that we can do that so you don't have to use cannabis or don't have to use it as much so that we can help you achieve the outcomes, your health outcomes, your life outcomes that you want to achieve in the same with policymakers. Like, what are you trying to do here? So are we trying to punish children and women? Are we trying to support and have healthy birth outcomes and healthy pregnant and parenting people? There is another question. Um, this may be for uh, Dr. Coles and Dr. Jones. How many of these children grow up to have their own substance use disorders, have children while in active use? I don't know what the last clause means. Yeah, I'm exactly. not sure what um, that means either. But um, there's certainly a um, evidence that there's an association between parental substance use and the child becoming a substance user. There's a higher percentage of people who use substances who come from families of substance use. There's also, by the way, a higher percentage of people who are abstinent. So um, just because your parent is a substance abuser does not mean that you're going to become one. Um, so it, it, it sort of sensitizes you to the issue in one way or another. And so you may or may, you may have the opportunity to make choices there. And your choices can be positively supported by the people around you if you get sufficient support. And there are a lot of people who are prenatally exposed to alcohol. We have a long-term study of this. Um, people are now 40. Um, and we have found that there are people who are quite resilient. And there are a number of factors that support that. Usually it is that they had good support from someone and some resources uh, to help them um, have a better outcome. Thank you for that. Anyone else? Claire said oh. it beautifully. <laughs> Dr. Chang, did you want to say something? I, I would if possible. I mean, I think you raised the rhetoric, someone raised the rhetorical question, why do women, why has there been an increase in use despite you know, our increasing knowledge of the risks? First of all, I think people underestimate the risks and they're not fully aware. And secondly, I think we need to take into consideration the possibility that the people who are using are perhaps hurting in other ways. And that, you know, they are using, they're turning to their legal substances like alcohol, cigarettes, or marijuana as some sort of comfort or symptom relief or stress relief that, you know, is most likely counterproductive, but it is familiar. And so I just wanted to mention that, you know, we've had a pandemic within a pandemic, which is the crisis of depression, anxiety disorders, and other issues. Thanks, Dr. Chang. Uh, another question, uh, this is for Dr. Jones. Any recommendation for encouraging OBGYNs to look beyond immediate birth outcomes and have these conversations with their clients, especially when alcohol is concerned. So that may be more than one person there. Yeah, I'll start off, but I, I know that our other panelists would probably like to respond to. So um, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, many times our OBs are trained to look just until the, the person delivers, right? And so um, getting our whole medical, um, our medical uh, trainees, as well as continuing education to really think in a more dyadic way. Um, I think our, not only OBGYNs and the medical practices and societies, but also Medicaid and our third party payers. You know, if we had codes, billing and mechanisms to support dyadic treatment, it's very hard in my prenatal clinic, in our perinatal clinic, 
to get that paid for. We're lucky because we have block grant funding to pay for that. Um, what codes we would begin to build in that type of environment is a challenge, right? So, and then add the child to it too. So I think that there's some structural things that need to be done. Um, as well as in medical schools, as nursing schools, to get, get folks to start to be educated about just the things that um, Dr. Coles talked about so that we can have a more longitudinal lifespan approach to, to what we're doing. Would anyone else like to respond to that? That was a very good response there, Dr. Jones. Thank you. I can respond. I want to share, if I can, just for a second, share my screen uh, again. This is an entirely different presentation for who knows what. But um, it starts with training, right? How do physicians have OBGYNs included have these conversations with their clients? Like Dr. Jones said, it. it, it they are already trained, but we have to think about the new generation. This is Jane's house. I mentioned I started this uh, center in honor of my mom. And these people, other than this person in an orange sweater, he's my husband. But these others, these are physicians. These are physicians from the Johns Hopkins Urban Health Medical and Pediatric Residency Program. They came to complete part of their residency training at Jane's house so they can think about health and women's health and urban health differently. It starts with literally training the next generations of whoever, the physicians, the scientists, the advocates, to be revolutionary to be change makers. It has to be second nature. It, it can't be something that we always have to burden existing providers with doing something else. They have to come that way. And in order for them to arrive on day one that way, they have to train that way. So it is, it is certainly possible. Thank you so much for that. And I think we have made it to the end of our Q&A session. I wanna thank everyone on the panel today. It's been very informative and really great to hear all of your wonderful work. Um, I always learn something new when, when talking to you and, and I, it's been great to meet Dr. Brown virtually. Um, so thank you so much. And now we're gonna move into our next session. Um, which we will do now. Sorry, I have to transition too. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Kathy Mitchell. Kathy, are you on? Hello, Kathy. Hey, I'm here. Great to see you. <laughs> Good to see you. Kathy will be presenting on current and sustainable models that prevent fetal alcohol spectrum disorders by supporting women living with substance use disorders. Kathy has been working with FASD United, formerly known as the National Organization on Fetal Alcohol Syndrome or NOFAS for over 35 years, and is currently their vice president and spokesperson. She is a noted international speaker on fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, Women in Addiction and Stigma. Kathy holds a Master's of Human Services degree and is a licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselor, having served as project officer for many government projects that aim to prevent FASD, reduce stigma, and support families and individuals living with FASD. She served on the Special Committee of the World Health Organization, developing guidelines for the identification and management of substance use disorders in pregnancy, and in 2019 presented FASD, A Vision for the Future at the WHO Second Alcohol Forum. In 2004, Kathy founded the International Birth Mothers Mentorship Program, The Circle of Hope, and most recently founded Recovering Mothers Anonymous. Please join me now in welcoming Kathy Mitchell. Thank you. Let me get my screen up. Can you see my screen? Yes, you need to put it in that, yeah. yeah. 
Awesome. I wanted to make sure we were all on. Great. Well, hi. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you so much. It's really, really an honor to uh, participate in this very important conference. And I just really want to thank um, the whole committee that worked so tirelessly to put this together. And I'm, I'm really, uh, um, again, so honored to participate. So I wanted to share with you today a little bit about, I'm going to minimize that. Um, I, I wanted to share with you some programs that I believe um, are proven uh, to, uh, to prevent FASDs um, and, and really by providing support to women living with substance use disorders or alcohol use disorders. And again, I am uh, Kathy Mitchell, I'm with uh, FASD United. And, you know, so the big question is, so, so many people will say to me, well, everybody knows that, you know, all women know not to drink during pregnancy. And I think it's, it's interesting that I think that most women today will acknowledge that they, that they know, but these misconceptions and I, well, I call them defense mechanisms, but, you know, the, the rationalizing and kind of minimizing use still goes on. And this 2013 study really kind of, again, underscored some of the same things that we've been hearing for decades now that uh, some women still believe, you know, certain types of alcohol are okay at certain times, certainly the last trimester, as long as I'm not drinking a lot, I've had people say, well, I only drink expensive wine, you know? <laughs> um, so there's still, you know, some, um, some work to do. And um, I guess probably the most disturbing one is the, the point, the bullet point at the bottom, you know, they'll continue to drink until they know for sure <laughs> that they're pregnant, which is really um, a big problem, right? So, and in 2012, um, we surveyed 92 women who had had children diagnosed with um, an FASD and um, through the uh, work of the Circle of Hope that Mary Kate just mentioned. And, um, <clears throat> you know, again, you know, for the majority of, of these moms, the majority were women that struggled with an alcohol or substance use disorders. Some women were in recovery, others not. You know, one of the uh, symptoms of having a substance use disorder is denial. Oftentimes, the person that's living with the issue is the last one to really recognize it or see it, where others in the family recognize it. And we see some of that here too. But the majority of women really um, uh, acknowledge that they continued to drink because they couldn't stop, they didn't know how to stop. And, you know, and again, this, this one I highlighted, doctor never said I had to stop. So why would I stop? So again, underscoring the importance of getting that uh, clear message from uh, their physician. And for many of our women, by the time they come to grips with the fact that, um, you know, that they're dealing with an alcohol or substance use disorder, and regardless, by the way, of social positioning or status, they do feel um, isolated. There's a lot of shame that goes on with living with an alcohol or substance use disorder, uh, a lot of guilt, um, grief, um, and, um, you know, many have been traumatized, uh, have grown up in an addicted household. So there's at least been neglect, um, if not abuse, and just, you know, a lot of fear and hopelessness that is kind of driving uh, the train, so to speak. So just to tell you a little bit about um, some of the early work of the uh, Circle of Hope, the Circle of Hope was uh, when FASD United was no fast. I know many of you remember those days. And um, it was, uh, we received funding through SAMHSA, uh, through their FASD Center for Excellence. And so the Circle of Hope was an FASD prevention model. And so really it was, the, you know, the idea was to bring women together who had had that lived experience of having, at that point in time, a child with an FASD. And so the idea being that we know these women are isolated and all the things I just kind of talked about in the last slide, 
and um, they need support. So we connected women to other women. We also provided interventions and crisis counseling. I am a, a licensed uh, addictions uh, counselor, so I handled a lot of those calls and still do, by the way. And we provided a warm handoff to the appropriate treatment or support in their own community and did our very best to connect them to people in recovery or support, whatever the support was that they needed. We also, you know, did a lot of work in connecting women and kind of creating a community. So we had monthly newsletters, we had a Facebook site, we would provide webinars and trainings. Uh, we, we, when we had SAMHSA funding, we had an annual meeting um, and we had actually, uh, we had state coordinators and, um, you know, we, we had objectives that we all collectively worked on. We trained, um, I believe during those days, 23 women to be speakers. And later I uh, was able to uh, develop a training curriculum. I'll tell you more about that. But we, after we lost our funding, we continued to, um, uh, uh, you know, facilitate the circle of hope with no funding and would provide monthly conference calls. And I will tell you from experience, thank God for Zoom, because they really were not very effective. Um, honestly, we would all get on the phone and they were so hard to, you couldn't see each other and you couldn't connect. And it's really hard to create community when you can't connect. And you know, because of our work with the Circle of Hope, we would we were so proud of our women in recovery that were able to come to the table and speak about it and um, go to open uh, events and conferences and talk about their experiences. And we uh, videotaped a lot of our our uh, members and put them online. You know, these were the early days when, every, you know, everything was about Facebook and getting everything online and whatnot. And the trolls, uh, the stigma showed its ugly face very early on. And the trolls went to work, the haters went to work. And this is, I just wanted to give you just a couple highlights of some of the worst things that we saw, but it was an everyday thing. We actually had to have somebody that continued to watch over um, uh, all of our videos and to get rid of some of the very troubling things that um, would come our way. So there's a lot of stigma that goes on with this with this issue. So, you know, this in this poster here, somebody created and they're showing convicted felons, people, women that were convicted of um, child abuse and comparing them to, they pulled photos and videos of our members of the Circle of Hope and compared them. And then they'd create um, uh, fake quotes. They'd have celebrities like Tina Fey. Tina Fey never said this, by the way, but they would send these things around, you know, suggesting that there's like a special place in hell for women that would drink during pregnancy and, and this kind of thing. So again, all just perpetuating this idea that this is something that women um, are, would, would do to harm their own children on purpose and, and um, so on and so forth. So, you know, during during all these years, though, of working um, on this issue, uh, you know, it's we we've certainly learned a lot. And one of the things we all really had to come to grips with was that many of the kind of public health messages that had been developed by NOFAS, but also by many of the um, government agencies and whatnot, you know, because you know, we take, we do the research and then we report the research in a very researchy way, but that doesn't always translate to something that is, can be digested by the general public. So really believe that the public health messaging resulted in a lot of kind of the stigma and bias because so, so many of the messages, you know, factually correct, yes, that um, FASD occurs when a mother drinks alcohol during pregnancy, but not probably, you know, such a great message because it just, you know, the knee jerk reaction is, well, then she ought to be, you know, locked up and, and this is an easy thing to fix. It's all about the mothers <laughs> that do this thing and not recognizing that so many of our moms are women living with uh, disease and that they didn't receive treatment for 
Um, and again, we also had to come to grips with the fact that many healthcare providers were also um, not well educated and actually had a lot of bias and disdain towards women that were um, drinking or using substances during pregnancy. We had an opportunity in 2016, 17, um, uh, and 18 to work with uh, Dr. Patrick Corrigan, who is a, um, a world expert on the topic of stigma. And he did one of the very um, first, I think the only very large population studies on looking at um, the general public and um, you know how you know the stigma towards uh, birth mothers. And he compared, asked questions and compared um, birth mothers of children with FASD to women who had been incarcerated and women with um, substance use disorders and mental um, health disorders. And he found that there was a huge, uh, much greater, um, uh, people saw them as much more different with more disdain and a lot more blame. And he was actually very, he couldn't believe the amount of stigma. He said he had never seen a disorder that um, uh, with numbers that high. So again, the problem is, is that stigma leads to discrimination. Uh, legislators are less likely to support policies. Um, and again, past research shows that uh, stigmatized disorders don't get funding or attention or the resources that they need. Um, you know, and how how do we act that out in in our world today? Well, a, any stigmatized group is kind of you know put out there as well. They're different than me. They're less than me. How how do we need how do we control these people that we think of as being less than we are? And you know, the way that we do that in at least in the U.S. is we jail a lot of people with um, an alcohol or substance use disorder, certainly with mothers that have used substances during pregnancy. Um, you know, with individuals living with FASDs, it's not uncommon for them to be removed from our systems of care. They get kicked out of school or treatment centers. Um, and with no kind of uh, assistance to help them to kind of figure out um, that system. We put them in institutions um, in our country. We're very quick to remove children. And of course, we always need to, you know, keep children safe, but we're, we're too quick to remove children and provide absolutely no treatment uh, for the mother who is suffering with a treatable disease. And um, again, it's not uncommon. I've heard in, other, in different parts of the country, women that are pregnant with their fifth and sixth child telling me that, well, I lost my first four um, to child welfare and I'm just really hoping I can just keep one of my children. You know, I, I think there's something really wrong with that system. and. Um, we need to do a better job. So again, um, harsh laws. And I happen to believe that systems of care that aren't putting enough effort into screening women, providing SBI, educating women about um, pregnancy and alcohol use, um, not diagnosing and taking the time to get women into the uh, support that they need because I'm too busy to do that and that's not my job. I believe that is all uh, rooted in stigma because um, we it's not that important. These are those people and we just don't put enough effort into um, caring about people that are stigmatized. So, you know, I guess one of the things that, um, you know, that I know from my years of working with women living with an alcohol or substance use disorder is that there's no magic pill. You know, um, medication assisted treatment is great, um, but it's not the end all, it's not the only thing. Um, providing, you know, outpatient or inpatient treatment is a beautiful thing, but it's not all of it. There's a lot that goes into uh, supporting women and their families. So I believe it requires a warm handoff to support services, a go-to person that they can check in with. 
uh, compassion and empathy and not judgment. And it requires a referral to many human service agencies, especially if they have children that have been exposed and they need a safe, supportive environment to stay healthy. So it doesn't do much good to provide some of the um, support and then sending them back to a very traumatizing um, environment that um, you know is, is not a healthy environment. So I'll just take a couple minutes here, and um, you know this is I think the the kind of the 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 underscoring of all of this talk is that. Women are not exposing their children um, to harm their own child. You know, as you saw on the first slide, there's there's a lot of rationalizing, there's a lot of minimizing, denial that goes on, not looking at the truth, um, and there's a lot of women that are suffering um, with um, the inability to stop because they have a compulsion to use and don't know how to stop that compulsion. So there's, I've never met a woman who has harmed their own child. Now, this is a photo of me when I am 16 years old. <laughs> and I soon had my first child after this picture. So this is the picture of the villain that many people would like to tar and feather and forever lock away and should be incarcerated and throw away the key. Um, but so many of our women have had this experience. And I do know of, you know, research that's talked about older women, but so many of our women were young moms. Um, so, which is interesting. But, you know, so women aren't doing this on purpose. And I can tell you that, you know, my story is that I grew up in an alcoholic home. Um, my dad was an alcoholic. There were seven kids. My parents were wonderful people that were living with a terrible disease, and they didn't recognize it till, you know, um, way late. And they raised seven kids with, you know, a father that was really troubled with his alcoholism. And he finally got treatment and everything changed. Um, but all seven of us kids were affected and um, were harmed um, by my dad's drinking in many ways. Um, my mother did not drink. She was a teetotaler. She might have drank small amounts, but I, uh, but I doubt it. <laughs> but anyway, um, you know, that, this is a picture of, I went on to have five children and exposed all five. And during the years of my addiction, I had no idea that using alcohol during pregnancy was harming my kids. I went on to have a terrible um, uh, addiction to opioids, to heroin, um, you know, and a lot of that had everything to do with my childhood and trauma and so on and so forth. But the point is that I want to make here, um, this is me giving birth to my third child. I had um, natural childbirth. I did the whole Lamaze, the breathing, you know, <laughs> no drugs, you know, and because I was a really good mom, but I drank the whole time I was pregnant. I had no idea that I shouldn't be drinking. I grew up in a drinking household and all adults drank. So I, I just want to make the point that SBI is really important, but it's not enough. We need to inform young women about FASD and to help them to identify their own risk factors. And if they've grown up with drinking, it may not necessarily mean that they will develop an alcohol use disorder. They're certainly at high, higher risk, but they certainly need that information. And some of that is really lacking. The other point I wanna make is I ended up in long-term recovery. I had um, five children. My last two children died as a direct consequence of being exposed to alcohol and methadone and cigarettes and maybe all three. You know, I, I believe that that's, um, that that's what happened to my children. My son died at birth at, right after um, he was born. And my little girl died when she was three months old. They set up sudden infant death syndrome. But um, both of those children, I was on methadone, I drank, and I smoked cigarettes, and I may have taken um, other pills as well. So um, anyway, um, but and I had after I got sober, 
I got into treatment and um, I realized that my daughter who had cerebral palsy actually had fetal alcohol syndrome and I was able to get her diagnosed when she was 16 years of age. These are my two daughters. Both of my daughters were exposed. Carly has um, full-blown fetal alcohol syndrome. And I think what I want, the point I wanted to make here is that I am in recovery. I'm 38 and a half years um, in abstinence-based recovery. And my life is really great, really great. Um, but the reason that I was able to recover is because of the love and acceptance of my children and my family, and they matter. And many of our women do not have that. So um, just really want to make that point because I hear a lot of judgments about, well, she's been through treatment three times. So it's really on her. And it's like, well, she has no one in her world to love her. And so that's where we come in. So I want to tell you quickly about these three incredible programs that I believe are sustainable and that any communi community can replicate. So you heard a little bit about the Circle of Hope. I'll tell you a little more about that in the Speakers Bureau in a moment. I wanna also tell you about the Women in Recovery um, Summits. And again, this was a SAMHSA funded effort. Um, it was um, a very successful model. Again, um, was evaluated and found to be, you know, um, you know, something that um, made a difference and made an impact not only in the women but in the community. The Women in Recovery summits were held all over the United States. They brought the model is basically you bring women together that are in treatment, you bring the treatment providers together, and you also invite. Uh, the directors of uh, the human service agents, agencies in their own community that are providing resources. And the day is a hopeful day. Um, they, you know, learn about FASD. They, you know, and it's all taught by birth mothers uh, to children with FASD. So it's, it's this great model and um, recovering hope anonymous. And I'll tell you about that in a moment here. So again, with the uh, Circle of Hope and all the years that we've pr been providing services through the Circle of Hope, one of the things I think a lot of people don't really recognize, they know it's a mentorship program, but you know, for a lot of the women that would call and still call, they are pregnant when they call. One of the first things we do, we get them connected with an OBGYN in their community that is knowledgeable about um, alcohol or substance use disorders. So again, working with ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, they have their FASD champions. Those are my go-to. So, you know, we do the warm handoff there to treatment. I would do an assessment and determine what level of service they need, if any service. Some women don't need. They just had an exposure. And again, what we do, we talk to them. We give them the facts without scaring them to death. You know, if it's only been, you know, some women will call. They've had two glasses of wine. And it's like, you know, put the bat down. You didn't know, you know, go to your uh, prenatal care, take your vitamins, you know, all of that, all of the good things we would tell them. And we don't want to send them off being worried to death about um, having those two glasses of wine. Again, there's many levels of treatment, so I won't read through all of these, but if nothing else, we would get them a sponsor, get them going into 12-step recovery get them a go-to um, connection if once I refer them to uh, a center and always there's follow-up, always follow-up. Talk to you about the Speakers Bureau and we developed a, a full curriculum in uh, training our moms. Our moms need to have two years of sustained recovery. And, you know, one of the things that, that we got to do was that we... Um, uh, connected. We worked with ACOG to provi provide grand rounds. We've been doing this for several years now, I think five or six years, but the ACOG FASD champions go around the country and invite one of our speakers from the Circle of Hope to tell their stories. And, you know, one of the things that is that come out um, of uh, uh, the uh, research, the findings, is it's hugely successful um, dispels the stereotypes and, 
you know, and provides incentive for um, physicians to want to do more to prevent FASD and to get women the treatment and support that they need. And by the way, it's really good for the women. Uh, women report it's they they love doing it. And you know, uh, Stephanie said it was one of the best days of her life in, in the uh, quote on the other slide. So we've done this these um, online um, 2020. Uh, of course, we met with, uh, you know, the, the lovely COVID, and we provided actually in 20 and 21 online women in recovery summits to uh, several tribes in Southern California and had a full day of, um, of uh, information on FASD and recovery and brought in the systems of care, and it was uh, just wildly successful. And our latest uh, program is the RMA, um, the Recovery Mothers Anonymous. Recovery Mothers Anonymous, again, came out of 2020 when I actually um, had four women who were pregnant. And it was interesting because I had two women that had been using opioids and two women that had been using uh, mainly alcohol. And normally I would have taken um, a lot of time to handhold them into treatment. And guess what? All the treatments were closed. So I thought, what do I do? What do I do? I need to bring in my gals. I need to bring in the circle of hope. So we uh, went online, um, got Zoom going, and I brought in a lot of the women with long-term recovery, invited them to come to a, a meeting that meets weekly to support these young women who are pregnant. And oh my God, we created this beautiful recovering um, network that continues to meet every Thursday at 7 p.m. And we use recovery as a broad term. A person doesn't have to be in recovery from alcoholism or drug addiction. Um, it, you know, it can be any recovery from trauma, abusive relationship, and it's for women with the lived experience of having used during pregnancy. And, you know, I'm sure everyone here is very familiar with Maslow's um, triangle here. Um, and, you know, I think that one of the things with everything that we do, it's built on this whole hierarchy that in order for women to recover, they need all, they need all of these um, uh, elements in their life. And um, the most important, of course, being um, part of a loving and uh, community that they belong to. So again, just some of the basic needs that the RMA, you know, it's not as simple as meeting every week. We make sure our girls, our uh, um, women have safe housing, that we get, you know, the domestic violence, we address all of those things, you know, dental care, there's everything you can imagine that women um, and young women um, or, or even older women might be dealing with. So we all work together as a community to make sure that people are getting all the services that they need. And there's just so much that goes into this. So again, you know, how do I get social security for my son, he's 18 now. And lo and behold, we have one mother who's an expert in that. So, you know, we have women who are um, physicians, we have an attorney, we have a woman who's a special education um, teacher. So all of those things, um, dealing with child protective services and getting uh, advice about that and just providing natural community supports. And again, you know, with the idea being that our women are resilient and we come from a strength-based place and just encourage them and to never give up. And some of our women will slip and slide and relapse and others just hold on to recovery. And we have become a community. And I will tell you since 2020, we have about 65 total members. We have two treatment centers that come every week. And with both of those uh, treatment centers, there's about probably 15 in each of those centers. Um, during the pandemic, we had six pregnant women and four of them absolutely stopped their use. Uh, we had um, 
uh, baby showers for our women and sent them uh, presents. And they're part of a recovering community now. Two of the women struggled, but they greatly reduced their consumption. Um, and we've had women, we work with the AAPFASD champions to get our women, um, the children screened as needed. So women can and do recover. There's a picture of uh, me with some of my kids and grandkids. And, you know, we should do everything we can to support women so that they can be the mothers that they want to be. So with that, I think that I am going to stop sharing my screen and it's time for me to introduce um, uh, my very good friend, CJ Lucky. So CJ is 38 years old. She was diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome when she was just a baby. She was adopted when she was five, along with an older brother and sister who also have FASD. She is a member of the International Adult Leadership Committee ALC of FASD Changemakers and guides much of, it, of its work. CJ is a well-known speaker on FASD, having presented at and participated in many, many conferences, seminars, really all over the world, sharing her um, experience. And mostly, let me just tell you, CJ is the epitome of a mover and a shaker. She is a change agent. She is a role model. She is a very good friend of mine. She is courageous. And I am really, really proud to call this delightful woman, a very good friend of mine. And so it's my privilege and honor to introduce the very dear CJ Lutke. And I am going to mute myself now, CJ. Thank you, Kathy. I would have said the same things about you, and I'm very honored to be your friend as well. Um, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm going to read from notes now. Uh, and oh, I have a slide share. Give me a minute. There we are. Okay, share. Okay. So um, I'm going to start now. <laughs> Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Just presenter view. Go to presenter view. No. Oh, you're on the wrong one. Your slide. Oops. Uh, I oh, yeah. should stop sharing. It's okay. You get it, CJ. Yeah, no worries. Oh, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay, it had the same picture. I have three presentations this month. <laughs> of course okay. you did. So um, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to read from my notes and do the slideshow now. Okay, so good afternoon. Uh, as, as Kathy said, my name is CJ Lutke and I'm 38 years old. I was diagnosed with full fetal alcohol syndrome as an infant. I weighed less than three pounds at full term birth and spent six months in the NICU. I was adopted by my family who had already adopted two of my older half siblings with FASD. I was asked to speak today because I have learned how to live successfully with FAS, how to face my difficulties and limitations, and there are many. And because I have, and because I have become an advocate for change, working for a future in which all people with FASD thrive. And I am here because I have learned the value of forgiveness, something practiced in my family. I'm supposed to change the slide, it didn't work. I, there we are, there we are, let's see. Okay, so oops. Um, there we go, I got it working. Everything was working tickety-boo last night. Okay, so this is slide two, okay, this is slide three. Mitch Album in his book, For One More Day, said it best. There is a story behind everything, how a picture got on a wall, how a scar got on your face. Sometimes the stories are simple and sometimes they are hard and heartbreaking, but behind all of your stories is always your mother's story because hers is where yours begins. So I want to start where my story began. 
I was born on an early January night. The woman who gave birth to me had alcohol in her amniotic fluid and was not sober when she delivered me. She had nine children before me and they had all been taken from her at different ages in different places. I was her last child and at least five of them had FASD. She was severely alcoholic and a disease that eventually claimed her life. And this is all I knew about her for a very long time. I know she died when I was 10 and she was 42 from her alcoholism. Uh, something that I understand now is a terrible disease that can destroy your body and soul. And I did not know that then. I was far too young. I know now that her alcohol use was never a choice and I did not know that then. And I was far too young and far too lucky to understand trauma. But when you become a teen or an adult with FASD, you grow to be all too familiar with the shame and blame that tears people like us down. We say and do the wrong thing at the wrong time. We make mistakes, lots of them, all the time. And we are all, regardless of our intellectual level of functioning, far too aware of what is said and thought by systems, the media, and the people in general who judge what they do not understand. In my teens and early 20s, as I grew, the disability of FASD made life a lot more challenging than it ought to be. And I really understood what caused my disability, that 100% preventable cause, if you will. My birth mother became an empty vessel for me to blame and to shame and to be angry at, which was easy because I never understood her as a human being. I judged her and dehumanized her and did not understand. And I judged her only through my experiences, which were not hers. I saw it as terribly selfish, but I never understood then that the selfishness I thought she chose was also mine because I was not her and did not even know who she was or what she had experienced as a person. And society gave me that fuel to power my anger, but they never gave me a way out. The unintended consequences of that fuel was not the fire itself, but the smoke damage. And I absolutely did not understand that alcoholism is not a choice for anyone ever. Anger is a natural part of grief and of growing up when you have FASD. Knowing you are different can be very hard. And learning there is a cause and it could have been prevented, was all the reason I needed. Why would she? Why did she? I felt justified in my anger. But one of the great tragedies is that, is that anger people with FASD so often feel towards our birth mothers is not even our own. It is what we have been told or taught by a society that judges what it has so little understanding of because it is often very far outside of its own experiences. Because anger is a mask for pain, something most people don't realize and don't address. But if you stay in that place, then you never stop being angry and you can never find peace and acceptance of yourself. And you never move on because you simply cannot. As a person with FASD, I think everyone with this disability and their family goes through a very long, very complicated and very painful grieving process around the most misunderstood and overused words dealing with FASD, cause and 100% preventable. Because we hear them all the time and they are unavoidable. Because no one talks about FASD without using them. And the message to those with FASD comes across loud and clear that FASD is so awful that preventing us is the only solution. Think about how hopeless that sounds and how awful it is for everyone. 100% preventable is an easy answer. I think I missed a slide. No, I didn't. 100% preventable is an easy answer to a very complicated problem with many layers. What I have come to really dislike are those easy answers to issues that are all too complicated. They let those with the most resources off the hook 
and place the responsibility on those who often have the very least. The third piece to our grief trifecta would be less than. People with FASD think because of her, I was born less than, and it was all caused by drinking. And if she had just not, then all my troubles would have been prevented and I would have been normal. And that is all about what is called disenfranchised grief, rarely even recognized or acknowledged. But the definition is a loss that is not openly acknowledged, socially validated, or publicly mourned. In other words, a loss or society itself fails the griever by simply not recognizing their right to grieve. So what happened next? Something life-changing and very important. It was at one of the big international FASD research conferences in Vancouver, BC, Canada, quite a few years ago now, that I made a remark to my mom, about my birth mom, not having the good judgment or not caring enough or being too selfish not to drink, something in that vein. And it, that changed my thinking. My mom did not tell me I was wrong to think this or to feel anger towards a person for whom all intents and purposes was a complete stranger. Well, what she did do, and for that I will always be grateful to her, was she said to me, there is a session I think you should sit in on. And I said, sure because frankly, nobody says no to my mother at a conference. That afternoon, I sat in an auditorium and listened to a panel of six women speak. Six women who had all drank during pregnancy. Six women who all had children affected by their drinking. Two raised those children and four who lost their children to child protection. They spoke about their lives before ever having children they talked about it in a gut-wrenching way about trauma, secrets and abuse, about violence, addiction, poverty, about mental health, about self-hatred, about growing up in good homes and bad homes, and about their experiences with life as they had to live it. And they talked about everything, things I hadn't even considered. But even if I had considered them, I had heard them from others and so dismissed them. They spoke about being pregnant and drinking, and being unable to stop. Two of them talked about not knowing what alcohol could do. They talked about guilt and self-loathing and shame, the horrors of finding out that they were the cause of FASD in their children, the fight with alcoholism, the stigma, and the world they still navigate because they drank while pregnant. Their enduring pain was overwhelming. I will always remember the shock I felt. How is it that I never knew this? Because I think I was never ready before to hear it or to truly know it or to truly understand it. But I started to learn that day because it was not until I heard the panel and I came face to face with their humanity that I began to understand. I will always be grateful to the moms on that panel for their bravery, honesty, and strength. I will always be grateful for the privilege of hearing their stories. These women and the many other birth moms I have been privileged to know since could have easily been my birth mother. They filled in the critically missing blank and made her a much more complete human being because you cannot forgive, what you do not understand. My anger did not just instantly dissolve or fade away with each woman's story I have come to know. It was evicted a little at a time as I thought and thought about what I had heard. It was a long journey because processing information takes time, especially if you have FASD. In the end, their example showed me what I could do because understanding, acceptance, and forgiveness finally replaced anger. And with it came the knowledge that if I could do this for my birth mother, then I could also do it for myself because as much as I belong to my family, I am also a part of her. And this is the big missing piece for children, teens, and adults with FASD. Because then, only then, do you truly believe FASD is just your origin story and not your destination. It is not where you will end up. Only then do you move on. There are many things I still cannot do and will never be able to do. My short-term memory, 
is absolutely awful. I live by post-it notes that I can never remember to look at. I have a real problem with spatial memory and orientation of all kinds. Left and right is a problem. <laughs> my math scores are still below the second percentile. And of course, my executive functioning is not great. I cannot ride a bike or drive a car. My attention is disorganized. I don't sleep very well. I have anxiety and depression. I have many physical health problems. But I have strengths. I am responsible and reliable and considerate. I'm motivated, resourceful, and a very hard worker. I am good with people. And, if, and I can think and write with the best of them. If I have an editor, and if I have time to process what is being discussed or I want to talk about. I do a blog that is published and I write the presentations for the Adult Leadership Collaborative of FASD Changemakers, the group I work with and represent. And because I have the support I need and the FASD work I deeply believe in, I have a full and meaningful life. I have also redefined what success can look like which should be the right and destination story for every person with FASD. To the woman who gave birth to me, to whom I never knew and who died when I was 10, I want her to know that I am okay and that I hopefully she would be proud of me. I may have had a chance, I may have changed my dreams, but I do have dreams that work for me and I have made some of them come true. Two years ago, I adopted my nine-year-old son who has FASD from foster care. Who would have believed that an adult with FASD could actually adopt? But I am not the first one to do so. And I make a good parent to him because I totally get him. I know what he is going to do or what is happening because exactly what I would have done and still do. And I understand the why, so I know how to handle it and provide explanations and supports that will help him. He is, the absolute unequivocal joy of my life. And I am one of the founding members of the International Adult Leadership Collaborative of FASD Changemakers, a group of adults with FASD in five countries who have been working together unfunded for over 15 years to change perceptions about FASD, old perceptions about the destination and origin story. Why? Because we got tired of waiting for someone else to do it. Because it, because it is all about perceptions. Perceptions that have never actually been tested. There must be a, re, re, a major rethink on addressing shame, blame, and stigma because they are the major obstacles to equity in the ethical treatment of women with alcohol use disorders and to the individuals with FASD and their families and speak to all the ineffective inaccurate and unhelpful messaging. As a society, I think we are doing a very poor job across the board. I must ask why? Do we have less value because we have FASD? Why is what people with FASD able to do and with the right diagnosis and understanding can be a fair bit quite a lot, not seen as good enough? Is our contribution to society less valuable than that of others? We think people with FASD are valued only until we become a cost. And the more society devalues what we can contribute, and it is a lot, the more we become a cost because there has been no investment in diagnosis, services, and supports that can truly make a difference. The first two principles of ethics are to help and to do no harm. So when we become a cost, what is the ethical tipping point? What happens when our cost outweighs the value we can get? Does this mean we are less valued members of society? Is our worth less than yours? Do we then become disposable? Do we have a meaningful and inclusive place in future or not? You must choose whether or not to answer these questions of ethics and equity. And I think you need to. For us, FASD is not just a disability, it is a way of life and a life experience in itself. This is why adults with FASD have began to organize themselves as advocates, because we choose to speak up and to speak out and make change happen. 
All of us in the ALC have overcome poor starts in life and a million things gone wrong. All the bad stuff people usually think about when they think FASD. Addiction, criminal activity, prison, homelessness, child protection, foster care, no education, unemployment, poverty, mental health, and still struggle every single day with all kinds of problems and issues. But we choose to challenge your thinking and to start a conversation for change because we believe that when you invest in us, we will give you a return on that investment. Who would have ever thought that this was possible? But now we know it is. I know you are listening, but I need you to truly hear my words because untested perception is the problem here. In FASD, there's not much difference between being private and being ashamed. Not talking about it just perpetuates the pejorative labels, the stereotypes, the shame and the stigma, which should not belong to us or to the women who use or struggle with alcohol and it helps no one. But talking must start from a place of honesty and respect and we have to learn from, and we have learned from personal experiences and our experiences with birth moms. To do otherwise shames and devalues us and every other person with FASD and every woman who uses alcohol for any reason in any manner in her pregnancy because you do not have to have alcoholism to have a child with FASD. And if you truly believe in the idea of quality of life and the right of all people to have and maintain at least some of that, then you need to provide equity to the people with FASD across the lifespan on an ongoing basis. So not just the usual lip service to the idea, but real access, real eligibility, real funding, real support, and real opportunities. On an, and I want to point out that equity is a process, the many actions that must be taken to get to the outcome everyone wants. And if it is not made actionable through funding and access, then what real meaning does it have? Because if it does not lead to positive and meaningful changes in the conditions of the lives of so many people with FASD, what is the purpose? We who have FASD need society to make an intentional commitment to do things differently. If opportunity along with access, meaningful inclusion, and the chance to meet and maximize our potential and to belong is to be equally available to all of us with FASD and our birth, foster, and adoptive families. Because FASD is an equity issue and equity matters. 10 years ago, no one would have ever believed that those of us in, F in the ALC um, of FASD change makers could do what we are doing today, but we are. Because as Ida Wu Konianica said, we do not get to choose how we start out in life. We do not get to choose the day we are born or the family we are born into, what we are named at birth, what country we are born into, and we do not get to choose our ancestry. All these things are predetermined by a higher power. By the time you're old enough to start making decisions for yourself, a lot of things in your life are already in place. It is important, therefore, that you focus on the future as it is the only thing you can change. So we choose to change the future and so too can you. So this is our challenge to you because the future really is in your hands. And finally, we choose to write a new ending to our stories. Because FASD is only an origin story and is not a destination and it is not where our story ends. On behalf of the International Leadership Committee of FASD Changemakers and all the people with FASD, thank you for the privilege of speaking and for listening to my words. Thank you, CJ. I don't know if Mary Kate comes back on now for questions or or if we are moving to the next. Actually, we're we're gonna. I first want to thank both you, Kathleen and CJ, for such 
powerful words. And actually, all day long today, we've heard some powerful, powerful uh, information that's uh, new out there and uh, things that are help open my eyes to different things also. So we do thank you both and all every one of our presenters today for great sessions that you have provided to us. I am now going to go transition everyone over to uh, breakout sessions. They're going to start here pretty soon. And I do have, um, I'm going to paste into the chat box. Whoops. That's not the one I want. Don't, don't do that one. <laughs> I want this one here. I'm going to go ahead and open up breakout sessions right now. And what you're going to do is you're going to choose from uh, the 10 of these. And of course, you know, technology today, <laughs> being as it is, does not want to work for me. So let's try this again. And I'm going to go very slow. I'm going to paste this into a document is going into the chat. You can take that document and open that document up. There'll be a link to 10 different rooms. And I did open up the chat for everyone and I'm gonna keep pasting that document in there. Let me go ahead and put that in there again. There are there are folks already, uh, the rooms are open. So all you have to do is click on the one you want and then you'll be brought to that actual breakout session. You'll actually end up leaving here, this uh, session altogether. It's telling me to save it when I click on it. Yeah, it'll, you save it to your desktop. Okay. And then then you can open that document up and it should be able to bring those in for you. Or I'm going to paste them in half, half and half here. Okay, I just pasted in the links into the chat box there. So now all you have to do is select the one that you want. You click on the link next to it. Once you click on that link, make sure you leave this room and go into your breakout session. 